Recorded Books presents King of Thorns by Mark Lawrence Narrated by James Clamp Prologue I found these pages scattered, teased across the rocks by a fitful wind. Some were too charred to show their words. Others fell apart in my hands. I chased them, though, as if it were my story they told. And not hers. Catherine's story. Aunt Catherine, sister to my stepmother. Catherine, who I've wanted every moment of the past four years. Catherine, who picks strange paths through my dreams. A few dozen ragged pages weighing nothing in my hand. Snowflakes skittering across them, too cold to stick. I sat upon the smoke-wreathed ruins of my castle, careless of the heaped and stinking dead. The mountains rising on all sides made us tiny, made toys of the haunt and the siege engines strewn about it, their purpose spent, and with eyes stinging from the fires, with the wind's chill in me deep as bones, I read through her memories. From the Journal of Catherine Apscorin, October 3rd, Year 98 Interregnum, Ancrath, the Tall Castle, Fountain Room. The Fountain Room is as ugly as every other room in this ugly castle. There's no fountain, just a font that dribbles rather than sprays. My sister's ladies-in-waiting clutter the place, sewing, always sewing, and tutting at me for writing, as if quill ink is a stain that can't ever be washed off. My head aches, and worm root won't calm it. I found a sliver of pottery in the wound, even though Friar Glenn said he cleaned it. Dreadful little man. Mother gave me that vase when I came away with Sarath. My thoughts jump and my head aches, and this quill keeps trembling. The ladies sew with their quick, clever stitches. Line stitch, cross line, lay across. Sharp little needles, dull little minds. I hate them with their tutting and their busy fingers and the lazy Ancreth slurring of their words. I've looked back to see what I wrote yesterday. I don't remember writing it, but it tells how Jorg Ancrath tried to kill me after murdering Hannah, throttling her. I suppose that if he really had wanted to kill me, he could have done a better job of it, having broken Mother's vase over my skull. He's good at killing, if nothing else. Sarath told me what he said in court, about all those people in Galath burned to dust. It's all true. Merle Galathar's castle is gone. I met him when I was a child, such a sly, red-faced man. Looked as if he'd be happy to eat me up. I'm not sorry about him. But all those people, they can't all have been bad. I should have stabbed Jorg when I had the chance. If my hands would do what I told them more often, if they would stop trembling the quill, learn to sew properly, stab murdering nephews when instructed. Friar Glenn said the boy tore most of my dress off. Certainly it's a ruin now. "'beyond the rescue of even these empty ladies "'with their needles and thread. "'I'm being too mean. "'I blame the ache in my head. "'Sarath tells me be nice. "'Be nice. "'Mary Codden isn't all sewing and gossip, "'though she's sewing now and tutting with the rest of them. "'Mary's worth talking to on her own, I suppose. "'There, that's enough nice for one day. "'Sarath's always nice. "'And look where that got her. "'Married to an old man, and not a kind one, "'but a cold and scary one and her belly all fat with a child that will probably run as savage as Jorg Ancrath. I'm going to have them bury Hannah in the forest graveyard. Mary tells me she'll lie easy there. All the castle servants are buried there, unless their families claim them. Mary says she'll find me a new maidservant, but that seems so cold, to just replace Hannah as if she were torn lace or a broken vase. We'll go out by cart tomorrow. There's a man making a coffin now. My head feels as if he's hammering the nails into it instead. I should have left Jorg to die on the throne room floor, but it didn't feel right. Damn him! We'll bury Hannah tomorrow. She was old and always complaining of her aches, but that doesn't mean she was ready to go. I will miss her. She was a hard woman, cruel maybe, but never to me. I don't know if I'll cry when we put her in the ground. I should. But I don't know if I will. That's for tomorrow. Today we have a visitor. The Prince of Arrow is calling, with his brother Prince Egan and his retinue. I think Sarath would like to match me there. Or maybe it's the old man, King Olidan. Not many of Sarath's ideas are her own these days. We will see. I think I'll try to sleep now. 
Maybe my headache will be gone in the morning. And the strange dreams, too. Maybe Mother's vase knocked those dreams right out of me. Chapter 1 Wedding Day Open the box, Jorg. I watched it. A copper box. Thorn patterned. No lock or latch. Open the box, Jorg. A copper box. Not big enough to hold a head. A child's fist would fit. A goblet. The box. A knife. I watched the box and the dull reflections from the fire in the hearth. The warmth did not reach me. I let it burn down. The sun fell, and shadows stole the room. The embers held my gaze. Midnight filled the hall, and still I didn't move, as if I were carved from stone, as if motion were a sin. Tension knotted me. It tingled along my cheekbones, clenched in my jaw. I felt the table's grain beneath my fingertips. The moon rose and painted ghost light across the stone-flagged floor. The moonlight found my goblet, wine untouched, and made the silver glow. Clouds swallowed the sky, and in the darkness rain fell, soft with old memories. In the small hours, abandoned by fire, moon, and stars, I reached for my blade. I laid the keen edge, cold against my wrist. The child still lay in the corner, limbs at corpse angles, too broken for all the king's horses and all the king's men. Sometimes I feel I've seen more ghosts than people, but this boy, this child of four, haunts me. Open the box. The answer lay in the box. I knew that much. The boy wanted me to open it. More than half of me wanted it open too, wanted to let those memories flood out, however dark, however dangerous. It had a pull on it, like the cliff's edge, stronger by the moment, promising release. No! I turned my chair toward the window in the rain, shading to snow now. I carried the box out of a desert that could burn you without needing the sun. Four years I've kept it. I've no recollection of first laying hands upon it, no image of its owner. Few facts, save only that it holds a hell which nearly broke my mind. Campfires twinkled distant through the sleet. So many they revealed the shape of the land beneath them, the rise and fall of mountains. The Prince of Arrow's men took up three valleys. One alone wouldn't contain his army. Three valleys choked with knights and archers, foot soldiers, pikemen, men at axe and men at sword, carts and wagons, engines for siege, ladders, rope and pitch for burning. And out there, in a blue pavilion, Catherine Apscoran, with her four hundred, lost in the throng. At least she hated me. I'd rather die at the hands of somebody who wanted to kill me, to have it mean something to them. Within a day they would surround us, sealing the last of the valleys and mountain paths to the east. Then we would see. Four years I had held the haunt since I took it from my uncle. Four years as king of Renar. I wouldn't let it go easy. No. This would go hard. The child stood to my right now, bloodless and silent. There was no light in him, but I could always see him through the dark, even through eyelids. He watched me with eyes that looked like mine. I took the blade from my wrist and tapped the point to my teeth. Let them come, I said. It will be a relief. That was true. I stood and stretched. Stay or go, ghost. I'm going to get some sleep. And that was a lie. The servants came at first light, and I let them dress me. It seems a silly thing, but it turns out that kings have to do what kings do. Even copper-crowned kings with a single ugly castle, and lands that spend most of their time going either up or down at an unseemly angle, scattered with more goats than people. It turns out that men are more apt to die for a king who is dressed by pinch-fingered peasants every morning than for a king who knows how to dress himself. I broke fast with hot bread. I have my page wait at the doors to my chamber with it of a morning. Makin fell in behind me as I strode to the throne room, his heels clattering on the flagstones. Makin always had a talent for making a din. "'Good morning, your highness,' he says. 
Stow that shit. Crumbs everywhere. We've got problems. The same twenty thousand problems we had on our doorstep last night. Makin asked. Or new ones. I glimpsed the child in the doorway as we passed. Ghosts and daylight don't mix. But this one could show in any patch of shadow. New ones, I said. I'm getting married before noon, and I haven't got a thing to wear. Chapter Two, Wedding Day. Princess Miana's being attended by Father Gomst and the sisters of Our Lady. Codin reported. He still looked uncomfortable in Chamberlain's velvets. The watch commander's uniform had better suited him. There are checks to be carried out. Let's just be glad nobody has to check my purity. I eased back into the throne. Damn comfortable. Swan down and silk. Kinging it is pain in the ass enough without one of those gothic chairs. What does she look like? Codin shrugged. A messenger brought this yesterday. He held up a gold case about the size of a coin. So, what does she look like? He shrugged again, opened the case with his thumbnail, and squinted at the miniature. Small. Here. I caught hold of the locket and took a look for myself. The artists who take weeks to paint these things with a single hair are never going to spend that time making an ugly picture. Miana looked acceptable. She didn't have the hard look about her that Catherine does. The kind of look that lets you know the person is really alive, devouring every moment. But when it comes down to it, I find most women attractive. How many men are choosy at eighteen? And, Makin asked from beside the throne. Small, I said, and slipped the locket into my robe. Am I too young for wedlock? I wonder. Makin pursed his lips. I was married at twelve. You liar. Not once in all these years had Sir Makin of Trent mentioned a wife. He'd surprised me. Secrets are hard to keep on the road, among brothers, drinking ale around the campfire after a hard day's bloodletting. No lie, he said. But twelve's too young. Eighteen's a good age for marriage, Jorg. You've waited long enough. What happened to your wife? Died. There was a child too. He pressed his lips together. It's good to know that you don't know everything about a man. Good that there might always be more to come. So my queen to be is nearly ready, I said. Shall I go to the altar in this rag? I tugged at the heavy samite collar, all scratchy at my neck. I didn't care, of course, but a marriage is a show, for high and lowborn alike, a kind of spell, and it pays to do it right. Highness, Codin said. Pacing his irritation out before the days, this distraction is ill-timed. We have an army at our gates, and to be fair, Jorg, nobody knew she was coming until that rider pulled in. Makin said. I spread my hands. I didn't know she would arrive last night. I'm not magic, you know. I glimpsed the dead child slumped in a distant corner. I had hoped she would arrive before the summer ended. In any case, that army has a good three miles to march. If it wants to be at my gates, perhaps a delay is in order. Codin hated being Chamberlain with every fibre of his being. Probably that was why he was the only one I'd trust to do it. Until the conditions are less inclement, twenty thousand at our door, Codin, and a thousand inside our walls. Well, most of them outside, because my castle's too damn small to fit them in. I found myself smiling. I don't think conditions are going to improve. So we might as well give the army a queen as well as a king to die for, nay? And concerning the Prince of Arrow's army, Codin asked, "Is this going to be one of those times when you pretend not to have a plan until the last moment?" Makin asked, "And then turn out to really not have one." He looked grim despite his words. I thought perhaps he could still see his own dead child. He had faced death with me before, and done it with a smile. "You girl." I shouted to one of the serving girls lurking at the far end of the hall, "Go tell that woman to bring me a robe fit to get married in." Nothing with lace, mind. I stood and set a hand to the pommel of my sword. The night patrol should be back about now. We'll go down to the east yard and see what they have to say for themselves. I sent Red Kent and Little Rikey along with one of the watch patrols. Let's hear what they think about these men of Arrow. Makin led the way. Codin had grown twitchy about assassins. 
I knew what lurked in the shadow of my castle, and it wasn't assassins that I worried about. Makin turned the corner, and Codin held my shoulder to keep me back. The Prince of Arrow doesn't want me knifed by some black cloak, Codin. He doesn't want drop leaf mixed into my morning bread. He wants to roll over us with twenty thousand men and grind us into the dirt. He's already thinking of the Empire Throne. Thinks he has a toe past the Gilden Gate. He's building his legend now, and it's not going to be one of knives in the dark. Of course, if you had more soldiers, you might be worth stabbing. Makin turned his head and grinned. We found the patrol waiting, stamping in the cold. A few castle women fussed around the wounded, planting a stitch or two. I let the commander tell his tale to Codin, while I called Red Kent to my side. Reich loomed behind him uninvited. Four castle years had softened none of Reich's edges. Still close on seven foot of ugly temper, with a face to match the blunt, mean, and brutal soul that looked out from it. Little Reiki, I said. It had been a while since I'd spoken to the man. Years. And how's that lovely wife of yours? In truth, I'd never seen her, but she must have been a formidable woman. She broke, he shrugged. I turned away without comment. There's something about Reich makes me want to go on the attack. Something elemental, red in tooth and claw. Or perhaps it's just because he's so damn big. So, Kent, I said, tell me the good news. There's too many of them, he spat into the mud. I'm leaving. Well, now. I threw an arm around him. Kent don't look much, but he's solid. All muscle and bone. Quick as you like, too. What makes him, though, what sets him apart, is a killer's mind. Chaos, threat, bloody murder. None of that phases him. Every moment of a crisis, he'll be considering the angles, tracking weapons, looking for the opening, taking it. Well, now. I pulled him close, hand clapped to the back of his neck. He flinched. But to his credit, he didn't reach for a blade. That's all well and good. I steered him away from the patrol. But suppose that wasn't going to happen. Just for the sake of argument, suppose it was only you here and twenty of them out there. That's not so far from the odds you'd beaten when we found you on the lakeside down in Rutten, eh? For a moment he smiled at that. How would you win then, Red Kent? I called him Red to remind him of that day when he stood all a tremble with his wolf's grin. White in the scarlet of other men's blood, he bit his lip, staring past me into some other space. They're crowded in Jorg, in those valleys, crowded, one man against many. He's got to be fast, attacking, moving. Each man is your shield from the next. He shook his head, seeing me again. But you can't use an army like one man. Red Kent had a point. Codin had trained the army well, the units of Father's Forest Watch especially so, but in battle. Cohesion always slips away. Orders are lost, missed, go unheard or ignored, and sooner or later it's a bloody maul. Each man for himself, and the numbers start to tell. Highness, it was the woman from the royal wardrobe, some kind of robe in her hands. Mabel, I threw my arms wide and gave her my dangerous smile. Maud, sire, I had to admit the old biddy had some stones. Maud, it is, I said, and I'm to be wed in this, am I? If it pleases you, sire, she even curtsied a bit. I took it from her. Heavy, cats? I asked. Looks like it took a lot of them. Sable, she pursed her lips. Sable and gold thread. Count. She bit the words off. Count Renard married in it, did he? I asked. Well, if it was good enough for that bastard, it'll do for me. At least it looks warm. My uncle Renard owed me for the thorns. For a lost mother, a lost brother, I'd taken his life, his castle, and his crown, and still he owed me. A fur robe would not close our account. Best be quick about it, Highness," Codin said, eyes still roaming for assassins. "We've got to double check the defences, plan out supply for the Kenish archers, and also consider terms." To his credit, he looked straight at me for that last bit. I gave Maud back the robe and let her dress me with the patrol watching on. I made no reply to Codin. He looked pale. I'd always liked him from the moment he tried to arrest me, even past the moment he dared to mention surrender. Brave, sensible, capable, honest, the better man. Let's get this done, I said, and started toward the chapel. Is it needed this marriage? Codin again, doggedly playing the role I set him. Speak to me, I had said, 
never think I cannot be wrong. As your wife, things may go hard for her. Reich sniggered at that. As a guest, she would be ransomed back to the horse coast. Sensible, honest. I don't even know how to pretend those things. It is needed. We came to the chapel by a winding stair, past table knights in plate armor. Count Renard's mark still visible beneath mine on the breastplates, as if I'd ruled here four months rather than four years. The noble-born, too poor or stupid or loyal to have run yet, would be lined up within. In the courtyard outside, the peasantry waited. I could smell them. I paused before the doors, lifting a finger to stop the knight with his hands upon the bar. Terms? I saw the child again, beneath cross standards hanging on the wall. He'd grown with me. Years back he had been a baby, watching me with dead eyes. He looked about four now. I tapped my fingers against my forehead in a rapid tempo. Terms? I said it again. I'd only said it twice, but already the words sounded strange, losing meaning as they do when repeated over and again. I thought of the copper box in my room. It made me sweat. There will be no terms. Best have Father Gomps say his words swiftly, then, Codin said, and look to our defences. No, I said. There will be no defence. We're going to attack. I pushed the knight aside and threw the doors wide. Bodies crowded the chapel hall from one side to the other. It seemed my nobles were poorer than I'd thought. And to the left, a splash of blues and violet, ladies in waiting and knights in armour, decked in the colours of the house morrow, the colours of the horse coast. And there at the altar, head bowed beneath a garland of lilies, my bride... Oh, hell, I said. Small was right. She looked about twelve. In peace, Brother Kent reverts to type, a peasant plagued by kindness, seeking God in the stone houses with a pious lament. Battle strikes loose such chains. In war, Red Kent approaches the divine. Chapter 3 Wedding day. Marriage was ever the glue that held the hundred in some semblance of unity. The balm to induce scattered moments of peace. Pauses in the crimson progress of the hundred war. And this one had been hanging over me for close on four years. I walked along the chapel aisle between the high and mighty of Renar. None of them so high or so mighty, truth be told. I've checked the records, and half of them have goat herders for grandparents. It surprised me that they had stayed. If I were them, I would have acted on Red Kent's sentiment and been off across the Matarax with whatever I could carry on my back. Miana watched me, as fresh and perky as the lilies on her head. If the ruined left side of my face scared her, she didn't show it. The need to trace the scarred ridges on my cheek itched in my fingertips. For an instant, the heat of that fire ran in me, and the memory of pain tightened my jaw. I joined my bride-to-be at the altar and looked back and in a moment of clarity, I understood. These people expected me to save them. They still thought that with my handful of soldiers, I could hold this castle and win the day. I had half a mind to tell them, to just say what any who knew me knew. There is something brittle in me that will break before it bends. Perhaps if the Prince of Arrow had brought a smaller army, I might have had the sense to run, but he overdid it. Four musicians in full livery raised their bladder pipes, and sounded the fanfare. Best use the short version, Father Gomst, I said in a low voice. Lots to do today. He frowned at that, grey brows rubbing against each other. Princess Miana, I have the pleasure of introducing His Highness Honorous Jorg Ankrath, King of the Renar Highlands, heir to the lands of Ankrath, and the protectorates thereof. Charmed, I said, inclining my head. A child. She didn't reach much above my ribs. I can see why your miniature was in profile, she said, and sketched a curtsy. That made me grin. It might be destined to be a short marriage, but perhaps it wouldn't be dull. You're not scared of me then, Miana? She reached to take my hand by way of answer. I pulled it back. Best not. Father? I nodded the priest on. Dearly beloved, Gomp said, we are gathered together here in the sign of God. And so, with old words from an old man 
and lacking anyone here present with just reason, or at least with just reason and the balls to say so, little Georgie Ancreth became a married man. I led my bride from the chapel with the applause and hoorahs of the nobility ringing behind us. Almost, but not quite, drowning out those awful pipes. The bladder pipe, a local Highland speciality, is to music what warthogs are to mathematics. Largely unconnected. The main doors led onto a stairway where you can look down into the haunt's largest courtyard, the place where I cut down the previous owner. Several hundred packed the space from the curtain wall to the stairs. More thronging out beyond the gateway, swarming beneath the portcullis, a light snow sifting down on all of them. A cheer went up as we came into the light. I took Miana's hand then, despite the necromancy lurking in my fingers, and lifted it high to acknowledge the crowd. The loyalty of subject to lord still amazed me. I lived fat and rich off these people, year after year, while they squeezed a mean life out of the mountainsides. And here they were, ready to face pretty much certain death with me. I mean, even that blind faith in my ability to buck the odds had to allow a fairly big chunk of room for doubt. I got my first proper insight into it a couple of years back, a lesson that life on the road hadn't taught me or my brothers. The power of place. My royal presence was requested for a bit of justice-making in what they call in the Renar Highlands a village, though pretty much everywhere else people would call it three houses and a few sheds. The place lies way up in the peaks. They call it gutting. I heard that there's a little gutting slightly higher up the valley, though it can't be much more than a particularly roomy barrel. Anyhow, the dispute was over where one scabby peasant's rocks ended and another one started. I'd hauled myself and making up three thousand foot of mountain to show a bit of willing in the business of kinging it. According to reports, several men of the village had been killed already in the feud. Though on closer inspection, casualties were limited to a pig and the loss of a woman's left ear. Not so long ago, I would just have killed everyone and come down the mountain with their heads on a spear. But perhaps I just felt tired after the climb. In any event, I let the scabby peasants state their cases, and they did so with enthusiasm and at great length. It started to get dark, and the fleas were biting, so I cut it short. "'Gevin, is it?' I said to the plaintiff. He nodded. "'Basically, Gevin, you just hate the hell out of this fellow here, and I really can't see the reason for it. The thing is that I'm bored. I've got my breath back, and unless you tell me the reason you hate—' "'Boren,' Makin supplied. "'Yes, Boren. Tell me the real reason, and make it honest, or it's a death sentence for everyone, except this good woman with the one ear.' and will be leaving her in charge of the remaining pig. It took him a few moments to realize that I really meant what I said, and then another couple mumbling before he finally came out with it and admitted it was because the fellow was a ferner. Ferner turned out to mean foreigner, and old Boren was a foreigner, because he was born and lived on the east side of the valley. The men cheering Miana and me, waving their swords, bashing their shields, and hollering themselves hoarse, might have told anyone who asked how proud they were to fight for his highness and his new queen. The truth, however, is that at the bottom of it all, they simply didn't want the men of Arrow marching all over their rocks, eyeing up their goats, and maybe leering at their womenfolk. The Prince of Arrow has a much bigger army than you, Miana said. No, your highness, no, my lord. Yes, he does. I kept waving to the crowd, the big smile on my face. He's going to win, isn't he? She said. She looked twelve, but she didn't sound twelve. How old are you? I asked, a quick glance down at her, still waving. Twelve. Damn. They might win. If each of my men doesn't kill twenty of theirs, then there's a good chance, especially if he surrounds us. How far away are they? She asked. Their front lines are camped three miles off, I said. You should attack now, then, she said, before they surround us. I know. I was starting to like the girl. Even an experienced soldier like Codin, a good soldier, wanted to hunker down behind the haunt's walls and let the castle earn its keep, if you'll pardon the pun. The thing is, though, that no castle stands against odds like the ones we faced. Miana knew what Red Kent knew. Red Kent, who cut down a patrol of seventeen men-at-arms on a hot August morning. Killing takes space. You need to move, to advance, to withdraw— and sometimes to just plain run for it. One more wave, and I turned my back on the crowds and strode into the chapel. Makin, are the watch ready? They are, he nodded. My king. I drew my sword. 
The sudden appearance of four foot of razored builder steel in the house of God resulted in a pleasing gasp. Let's go. From the journal of Catherine Apsgoran, October 6th, year 98, Interregnum, Ancrath, the tall castle, chapel, midnight. The Ancrath's chapel is small and drafty, as if they hadn't much time for the place. The candles dance and the shadows are never still. When I leave, the friar's boy will snuff them. Jorg Ancrath has been gone close on a week. He took Sir Makin with him from the dungeons. I was glad for that. I liked Sir Makin, and I cannot truly blame him for what happened to Galen. That was Jorg again. A crossbow. He could never have bested Galen with a blade. There's no honour in the boy. Friar Glenn says Jorg near tore the dress off me after he hit me. I keep it at the back of the long closet in the bride chest Mother packed for me before we left Scorin Halt. I keep it where the maids don't look, and my hands lead me back there. I run the tatters through my fingers, blue satin. I touch it, and I try to remember. I see him standing there, arms wide, daring the knife in my hand, weaving as though he were too tired to stand, his skin dead white, and the black stain around his chest wound. He looks so young, a child almost, with those scars all across him where the thorns tore him. Sir Riley says they found him hanging, near bloodless, after a night in the thorns with the storm around him, and his mother lying dead. And then he hit me. I'm touching the spot now. It's still sore, lumpy with scab. I wonder if they can see it through my hair. And then I wonder why I care. I'm bruised down here, too. Bruised black, like that stain. I can almost see the lines of fingers on my thigh, the print of a thumb. He hit me, and then he used me, raped me. It would have been nothing to him, a mercenary from the road. It would have meant nothing to him, just something else to take. It would rank small amongst his crimes, maybe not the largest even against me, for I miss Hannah, and I did cry when we put her in the ground, and I miss Galen, for the fierceness of his smile, and the heat he put in me whenever he came near. He hit me, and then he used me, that sick boy, daring the knife, barely able to stand. October 11th Year 98, Interregnum, Ancrath, the tall castle, my chambers. I saw Friar Glen in the blue hall today. I've stopped going to his services, but I saw him in the hall. I watched his hands, his thick fingers, and his thick thumbs. I watched them, and I thought of those fading bruises, yellow now, and I came to the tall closet, and here I am, with the torn satin in my hands. Skin, bones, and mischief comprise Brother Gog. Monster-born and monster-bred, but there's little to mark him from Adam, save the stippled crimson on black of his hide, the dark wells of his eyes, ebony talons on hand and foot, and the thorny projections starting to grow along his spine. Watch him play and run and laugh, and he seems too at ease to be a crack in the world, through which all the fires of hell might pour. Watch him burn, though, and you will believe it. Chapter 4 Four Years Earlier I took my uncle's throne in my fourteenth year, and found it to my liking. I had a castle, and staff of serving maids, to explore. A court of nobles to suppress, or at least what counted as nobles in the highlands, and a treasury to ransack. For the first three months, I confined myself to these activities. I woke, soaked with sweat. I normally wake suddenly with a clear head but I felt as though I were drowning. Too hot! I rolled and fell from the bed, landing heavy. Smoke, shouting in the distance. I uncovered the bed lamp and turned up the wick. The smoke came from the doors, not seeping under or between, but lifting from every inch of the charred wood and rising like a rippled curtain. Shit! Burning to death has always been a worry of mine. Call it a personal foible. Some people are scared of spiders, I'm scared of immolation. Also spiders. Gog! I bellowed. He'd been out there in the antechamber when I retired. I moved toward the doors, coming at them from the side. An awful heat came off them. I could leave by the doorway, or try to fit myself through the bars on any of three windows before negotiating the ninety-foot drop. I took an axe from the wall display and stood with my back to the stone next to the doors. My lungs hurt, and I couldn't see straight. Swinging the axe felt like swinging a full-grown man. 
The blade bit, and the doors exploded. Orange-white fire roared into the room, furnace hot, in a thick tongue forking time and again. And almost as suddenly, it died away like a cough ending, leaving nothing but scorched floor and a burning bed. The antechamber felt hotter than my bedchamber, char black from floor to ceiling, with a huge glowing coal at its center. I staggered back toward my bed. The heat took the water from my eyes, and for a moment my vision cleared. The coal was gog, curled like a newborn, pulsing with flame. Something vast broke from the doorway leading to the guard's room beyond. Gorgoth. He scooped the boy up in one three-fingered hand and slapped him with the other. Gog woke with a sharp cry, and the fire went out of him in an instant, leaving nothing but a limp child, skin stippled red and black, and the stink of burned meat. Without words, I stumbled past them and let my guards help me away. They practically had to drag me to the throne room before I found my strength. Water! I managed, and when I'd drunk and used my knife to trim away the burned ends of my hair, I coughed out, Bring the monsters! Makin clattered into the hall, still pulling on a gauntlet. Again? he asked. Another fire! Bad this time, an inferno, I said. At least I won't have to look at my uncle's furniture anymore. You can't let him sleep in the castle! Makin said. I know that, I said. Now? Put a quick end to it, Jorg. Makin pulled the gauntlet off. We weren't under attack, after all. You can't let him go, Codin arrived, dark circles under his eyes. He's too dangerous. Someone will use him. And there it hung. Gog had to die. Three clashes on the main doors, and they swung open. Gorgoth entered the throne room with Gog, flanked by four of my table knights, who looked like children beside him. Seen in amongst men, the Lucrota looked every bit as monstrous as the day I found them under Mount Honus. Gorgoth's cat eyes slitted despite the gloom, blood-red hide almost black, as if infected with the night. What are you, Gog? Eight years now? And busy trying to burn down my castle? I felt Gorgoth's eyes upon me. The great spars of his ribcage flexed back and forth with each breath. The big one will fight. Codin murmured at my shoulder. He will be hard to put down. Eight years, Gog repeated. He didn't know, but he liked to agree with me. His voice had been high and sweet when we met beneath Mount Honus. Now it came raw and carried the crackle of flame behind it, as if he might start breathing the stuff out like a damned dragon. I will take him away, Gorgoth said, almost too deep to hear. Far. Play your pieces, Jorg. A silence stretched out. I wouldn't be sitting in this throne if Gorgoth hadn't held the gate, or sitting here if Gog hadn't burned the Count's men. The skin on my face still clung tight, my lungs still hurt, and the stink of burned hair still filled my nostrils. I'm sorry about your bed, Brother Jorg, Gog said. Gorgoth flicked his shoulder, one thick finger, enough to stagger him. King Jorg, Gog corrected. I wouldn't be sitting on the throne, but for a lot of people. A stack of chances, some improbable, some stolen. But for the sacrifice of many men, some better, some worse. A man cannot take on new burdens of debt at every turn, or he will buckle beneath the weight and be unable to move. You were ready to give this child to the necromancers, Gorgoth, I said. Him and his brother both. I didn't ask if he would die to protect Gog. That much was written in him. Things change, Gorgoth said. Better they find a quick death, you said. I stood. The changes will come too fast in these ones. Too fast to be born. The changes will turn them inside out, you said. Let him take his chance, Gorgoth said. I nearly died in my bed tonight. I stepped down from the dais. Makin at my shoulder now. The royal chambers are in ashes, and dying abed was never my plan, unless twere an emperor in my dotage beneath an over-energetic young concubine. It cannot be helped. Gorgoth's hands closed into massive fists. It's in his dinner. His dinner? My hand rested on the hilt of my sword. I remembered how Gog had fought to save his little brother, how pure that fury had been. I missed that purity in myself. Only yesterday every choice came easy. Black or white, stab Gempt in the neck or don't. And now? Shades of grey. 
a man can drown in shades of grey. His dinner, the story of every man, written at his core, what he is, what he will be, written in a coil in the core of us all. Gorgoth said. I'd never heard the monster say so many words in a row. I've opened up a lot of men, Gorgoth, and if anything is written there, then it's written red on red and smells bad. The center of a man isn't found by your geometry, Highness. He held me with those cat's eyes. He'd never called me Highness before either, probably the closest to begging he would ever come. I stared at Gog, crouched now, looking from me to Gorgoth and back. I liked the boy, plain and simple. Both of us with a dead brother that we couldn't save. Both of us with something burning in us, some elemental force of destruction wanting out every moment of every day. Sire, Codin said, knowing my mind for once, these matters need not occupy the king. Take my chambers, and we'll speak again in the morning. Leave and we'll do your dirty work for you. The message was clear enough, and Codin didn't want to do it. If he could read me, I surely could read him. He didn't want to slit his horse's throat when a loose rock lamed it. But he did. And he would now. The game of kings was never a clean game. Play your pieces. Can't be helped, Jorg. Makin set a hand to my shoulder, voice soft. He's too dangerous. There's no knowing what he'll become. Play your pieces. Win the game. Take the hardest line. Gog, I said. He stood slowly, eyes on mine. They're telling me you're too dangerous, that I can't keep you, or let you go that you're a chance that can't be taken, a weapon that can't be wielded. I turned, taking in the throne room, the high vaults, dark windows, and faced Codin, Makin, the knights of my table. I woke a builder's son beneath Geleth, and this child is too much for me. Those were desperate times, Jorg, Makin said, studying the floor. All times are desperate, I said. You think we're safe here, on our mountainside? This castle might look big from the inside, from a mile off, you can cover it with your thumb. I looked at Gorgoth. Maybe I need a new geometry. Maybe we need to find this denner and see if the story can't be rewritten. The child's power is out of control, Jorg, Codin said, a brave man to interject when I'm in full flow. The kind of man I needed. It will only grow more wild. I'm taking him to Heimrift, I said. Gog is a weapon, and I'll forge him there. Heimrift? Gorgoth relaxed his fists. Knuckles cracking with loud retorts. A place of demons and fire, Makin muttered. A volcano, I said. Four volcanoes, actually, and a fire mage. Or so my tutor told me. So let's put the benefits of a royal education to the test, shall we? At least Gog will like it there. Everything burns. Chapter 5 Four Years Earlier This is a bad idea, Jorg. It's a dangerous idea, Codin, but that doesn't have to mean it's bad. I laid my knife on the map to stop it rolling up again. Whatever the chances of success, you'll leave your kingdom without a king. He set a fingertip to the map, resting on the haunt, as if to show me my place. It's only been three months, Jorg. The people aren't sure of you yet. The nobles will start to plot the moment you leave. And how many men-at-arms will you take with you? With an empty throne, the Renar Highlands might look like an easy prize. Your royal father might even choose to call with the army of the gate. If it comes to defending this place, I don't know how many of your uncle's troops will rally to your cry. My father didn't send the gate when my mother and brother were murdered. My fingers closed around the knife hilt of their own accord. He's unlikely to move against the haunt now, especially when his armies are busy acquiring what's left of Galath. So how many soldiers will you take? Codin asked. The watch will not be enough. I'm not going to take any, I said. I could take the whole damn army, and it would just get me into a war on somebody else's lands. Codin made to protest. I cut him off. I'll take my brothers. They'll appreciate a spell on the road, and we managed to traipse to and fro happily enough not so many years ago, with nobody giving us much pause. Makin returned with several large map scrolls under his arm. In disguise, is it? he said, and grinned. Good. Truth be told, this place has given me itchy feet. You're staying, Brother Macon, I told him. I'll take Red Kent, Roe, Grumlow, Young Sim, and Michael. Why not? He may be a half-wit, but he's hard to kill. And of course, Little Reich. Not him, Codin said, 
face cold. There's no loyalty in that one. He'll leave you dead in a hedgerow. I need him, I said. Codin frowned. He might be handy in a fight, but there's no subtlety in him, no discipline. He's not clever. He... The way I'd put it, said Macon, is that Reich can't make an omelette without wading thigh deep in the blood of chickens and wearing their entrails as a necklace. He's a survivor, I said, and I need survivors. You need me, said Macon. You can't trust him. Codin rubbed his forehead, as he always did when the worry got in him. I need you here, Macon, I said. I want to have a kingdom to come back to, and I know I can't trust Reich, but four years on the road taught me that he's the right tool for the job. I lifted my knife, and the map sprung back into its roll. I've seen enough. Macon raised his eyes and tipped his maps unopened onto the table. Mark me out a decent route, will you, Codin, and have that scribe lad copy it down. I stood straight and stretched. I needed to find something to wear. One of the maids had burned my old rags, and velvet's no good for the road. It's like a magnet for dust. Father Gomps met Macon, Kent, and me on our way to the stables. He'd hurried from chapel, red in the face, the heaviest Bible under one arm, and the altar cross in his other hand. Jorg! He stopped to catch his breath. King Jorg! You're going to join us, Father Gomst? The way he paled made me smile. The blessing! He said, still short of wind. Ah, well, bless away. Kent went to his knees in an instant, as pious a killer as I ever knew. Macon followed, with unseemly haste, for a man who'd sacked a cathedral in his time. Since Gomst had walked out of Geleth by the light of a builder's son, without so much as a tan to show for it, the brothers seemed to think him touched by God. The fact we had all done the same with far less time at our disposal didn't register with them. For my own part, for all the evils of the Roma church, I could no longer bring myself to despise Gomst as I once had. His only true crime was to be a weak and impotent man, unable to deliver the promise of his Lord, the love of his Saviour, or even to put the yoke of Roma about the necks of his flock with any conviction. I bowed my head and listened to the prayer. It never hurts to cover your bases. In the west yard, my motley band were assembled, checking over their gear. Reich had the biggest horse I'd ever seen. I could run faster than this monster, Reich. I made a show of checking behind it. You didn't take the plough when you stole it, then? It'll do, he said. Big enough for loot. Michael's not bringing the head cart? I looked around. Where is he, anyway? Gone for the grey, Kent said. Idiot won't ride any other horse. Says he doesn't know how. Now that's loyalty for you. I shot Reich a look. So where's this new wife of yours, Brother Reiki? Not coming to see you off? Busy ploughing. He slapped his horse. Got a job of it now. Gorgoth came through the kitchen gate, looming behind Reich. It's unsettling to see something on two legs that's taller and wider than Reich. Gog popped out from behind him. He took my hand, and I let him lead me. There's not many that will take my hand, since the necromancy took root in me. There's a touch of death in my fingers, not just the coldness. Flowers wilt and die. Where are we going, Brother Jorg? Still a child's voice, despite the crackle in it. To find us a fire mage, put an end to this bed burning, I told him. Will it hurt? He watched me with big eyes, pools of black. I shrugged. Might do. Scared, he said clutching my hand tighter. I could feel heat rising from his fingers. Maybe it cancelled the cold from mine. Scared. Well then, I said, we're headed the right way. He frowned. You've got to hunt your fears, Gog. Beat them. They're your only true enemies. You're not scared of anything, Brother Jork, he said. King J— I'm scared of burning, I said, especially in my bed. I looked back to the brothers, stowing weapons and supplies. I had a cousin who liked to burn people up. Did I not, Brother Roe? Oh, ah, yeah, he nodded. My cousin Marklos, I said. Tell Gog what happened to him. Roe tested the point of an arrow with his thumb. Went up to him all on your own self, Jog, and killed him in the middle of a hundred of his soldiers. I looked down at Gog. I'm scared of spiders, too. It's the way that they move, and the way that they're still. It's that scurry. I mimicked it with my hand. I called back to Roe. How am I with spiders, Roe? Weird. Roe spat and secured his last arrow. 
You'll like this tale, Gog. What with being a godless monster and all? He spat again. Brother O liked to spit. Spent a week holed up in some grain barns one time, hiding. We didn't go hungry. Grain and rats make for a good stew. Only Jog here wasn't having any of that. Place was stuffed full of spiders, see? Big airy fellas. He spread his fingers until the knuckles cracked. For a whole week, Jog hunted them. Didn't eat nothing but spider for a week. And not cook, mind. Not even dead. And rat stew always tasted good after that week, I said. Gog frowned. Then his eyes caught the glitter on my wrist. What's this? He pointed. I pulled my sleeve back and held it up for all to see. Two things I found in my uncle's treasury that were worth more than the gold around them. Thought I'd bring them along in case of need. I made sure Wright caught sight of the silver on my wrist. No need to be going through my saddlebags at night now, little Reiki. The treasure's here, and if you think you can take it, try now. He sneered and tied off another strap. What's it? Gog stared, entranced. The builders made it, I said. It's a thousand years old. Roe and Red Kent came over to see. I'm told they call it a watch, I said. And you can see why. In truth, I'd been watching it a lot myself. It had a face on it behind crystal, with twelve hours marked and sixty minutes, and two black arms that moved, one slow, one slower still, to point out the time. Entranced, I had opened it up at the back with the point of my knife, and gazed into the guts of the thing. The hatch popped back on a minute hinge, as if the builders had known I would want to see inside. Wheels within wheels, tiny toothed and turning. How they made such things so small and so precise, I cannot guess. But to me, it is a wonder past any man-made sun or glow light. What else you got, Jorg? Reich asked. This. I took it from the deep pocket on my hip and set it down on the flagstones. A battered metal clown with traces of paint clinging to his jerkin, hair and nose. Kent took a step back. It looks evil. I knelt and released a catch behind the clown's head. With a jerk and a whir, he started to stamp his metal feet and bring his metal hands together, clashing the symbols he held. He jittered in a loose circle, stamping and clashing, going nowhere. Reich started to laugh, not that huh, huh, huh of his that sounds like another kind of anger, but a real laugh from the belly. It's like... it's like... He couldn't get the words out. The others couldn't hold back. Sim and Michael cracked first, Grumlow snorting through the drowned rat moustache he'd been working on, then Red Kent, and at last even Roe, laughing like children. Gog looked on astonished. Even Gorgoth couldn't help but grin, showing back teeth like tombstones. The clown fell over and kept on stamping the air. Wright collapsed with it, thumping the ground with his fist, gasping for breath. The clown slowed, then stopped. There's a blue steel spring inside that you wind tight with a key and when it's finished stamping and crashing, the spring is loose again. Burlow! Burlow should have seen this! Reich wiped the tears from his eyes. The first time I'd heard him mention any of the fallen. Yes, Brother Reich, I said. Yes, he should. I imagined Brother Burlow laughing with us, his belly shaking. We made our moment then, one of those waypoints by which a life is remembered. The Brotherhood remade and bound for the road. We made our moment, the last good one. Time to go, I said. Sometimes I wonder if we all don't have a blue steel spring inside us, like that denner of Gorgoth's, coiled tight at the core. I wonder if we don't all go stamping and crashing, crashing and stamping, in our own little circles going nowhere. And I wonder who it is that laughs at us. Chapter 6 Four Years Earlier Three months previously, I had entered the haunt alone, covered in blood that was not my own, and swinging a stolen sword. My brothers followed me in. Now I left the castle in the hands of another. I had wanted my uncle's blood. His crown I took, because other men said I could not have it. If the haunt reminds you of a skull, and it does me, then the scraps of town around the gates might be considered the dried vomit of its last heave. A tannery here, abattoir there, all the necessary but stinking evils of modern life, set out beyond the walls where the wind will scour them. We were barely clear of the last hovel before Makin caught us. Missing me already? The forest watch tell me we have company coming. 
Makin said, catching his breath. We really should rename the watch, I said. The best the Highlands could offer by way of forest was the occasional clump of trees huddled miserably in a deep valley, all twisted and hunched against the wind. Fifty knights, Makin said, carrying the banner of Arrow. Arrow? I frowned. They've come a ways. The province lay on the edge of the map we had so recently rolled up. They look fresh enough by all accounts. I think I'll meet them on the road, I said. We might get a more interesting story out of them as a band of road brothers. The truth was, I didn't want to change back into silks and ermine and go through the formalities. They would be heading for the castle. You don't send fifty men in plate armor for a stealth mission. I'll come with you, Makin said. He wasn't going to take no this time. You won't pass as a road brother, I said. You look like an actor who's raided the props chest for all the best night gear. Roll him in some shit, Reich said. He'll pass then. We happened to be right by Jerring's stables, and a heap of manure lay close at hand. I pointed to it. Not so different from life in court, Makin grimaced and threw his robe into the headcart. Michael had hitched it to the grey out of habit. When the captain of my guard looked more like a hedge knight at the very bottom of his luck, we moved on. Gog rode with me, clutching tight. Gorgoth jogged along, for no horse would take him, and not just because of his weight. Something in him scared them. Ever been to arrow making? I asked, easing my horse upwind. Never have, he said. Small enough principality. They breed them tough down here, though, by all accounts. Been giving their neighbors a headache for years now. We rode on without talk for a while, just the clatter of hooves and the creak of the headcart to break them out in silence. The road, or trail, if I'm honest, for the builders never worked their magic in the highlands. Wound its way down, snaking back and forth to tame the gradients. As we dropped, I started to realize that in the low valleys it would be spring already. Even here, a flash of green showed now and again, and set the horses nosing the air. We saw the knight's outrider an hour later, and the main column a mile farther on. Rose started to turn off the trail. I'll say when we turn aside and when we stand our ground, if it's all the same to you, brother Rowe. I gave him a look. The brothers had started to forget the old jog, been too long lazing around the haunt, left too long to their own wickedness. There's a lot of them, brother Jog," said young Sim, older than me, of course, but still with little use for a razor if you discounted the cutting of throats. When you're making for the king's castle, it's bad manners to cut down travellers on the way," I said. Even ones as disreputable as us, I rode on. A pause, and the others followed. The next rise showed them closer, two abreast, moving at a slow trot, a pair of narrow banners fluttering in the Renar wind. No rabble, these table knights from a high court, a harmony to their arms and armor that put my own guard to shame. This is a bad idea, Makin said. He stank of horseshit. If you ever stop saying that, I'll know it's time to start worrying, I said. The men of Arrow continued their advance. We could hear their hooves on the rock. I had an urge to rest in the middle of the trail and demand a toll. That would have made a tale, but perhaps too short a one. I settled for pulling to the side and watching as they drew closer. I cast an eye over our troop, an ugly lot, but the Lucrotas won the prize. See if you can't hide behind Reich's beast, Gorgoth, I said. I knew that plow horse would come in useful. I took the knife from my belt and started to work the dirt from under my fingernails. Gog's claws dug in beneath my breastplate as the first men reached us. The knights slowed their horses to a walk as they came near. A few turned their heads, but most passed without a glance, faces hidden behind visors. At the middle of the column were two men who caught the eye, or at least their armor did, polished to a brilliance, fluted in the Teuton style, and scintillating with rainbow hues where the oiled metal broke the light. A hound ran between their horses, short-haired, barrel-chested, long in the snout. The leftmost of the pair raised his hand, and the column stopped. Even the men in front of him, though there seemed no way they could have seen him. Well now, he said, both words precise and tightly wrapped. He took his helmet off, which seemed a foolish thing to do when he might be the target of hidden crossbows, and shook his head. Sweat kept his blond hair plastered to his brow. Good day, sir knight. I said, and nodded him a quarter of a bow. 
He looked me up and down with calm blue eyes. He reminded me of Catherine's champion, Sir Galen. How far to Renard's castle, boy? He asked. Something in me said that this man knew exactly how far it was, as crow flies and cripple crawls. King George's castle lies a good ten miles yonder. I waved my knife along the trail. About a mile of it up. A king, is it? He smiled, handsome like Galen too, in that square-jawed, blond manner that will turn a girl's head. Old Renard didn't count himself a king. I started to hate him, and not just for the pun. Count Renard held only the Highlands. King Jorg is heir to Ancreth and the lands of Galath. That's enough land to make a king, at least in these parts. I made show of peering at the fellow's breastplate. He had dragons there, etched and enamelled in red, each rampant, clutching a vertical arrow taller than itself. Nice work. Arrow, is it you're from, my lord? I asked. Not waiting for an answer, I turned to Macon. Do you know why that land is named Arrow, Macon? He shook his head and studied the pommel of his saddle. The need to say this is a bad idea twitched on his lips. They say it's called Arrow because you can shoot one from the north coast to the south. I said, from what I hear, they could have called it Sneeze. I wonder what they call the man who rules there. You know a lot about heraldry, boy. Eyes still calm. The man beside him moved his hand to his sword, gauntlet clicking against the hilt. They call the man who rules there the Prince of Arrow. He smiled. But you, may call me Prince Orin. It seemed rash to be riding into another's realm with fifty men, even fifty such as these, the very thing I had decided against for my own travels. You're not worried that King Jorg will take the opportunity to thin the field in this hundred war of ours? I asked. If I were his neighbour, maybe, the prince said. But killing me, or or even ransoming me to my enemies, would just make his own neighbours more secure and better able to harm him. And I hear the king has a good eye for his own chances. Besides, it would not be easy. I thought you came looking for a count, but now it seems you already know about King Jorg and his good eye. I said, he came prepared this one. The prince shrugged. He looked young when he did it, twenty maybe, not much more. That's a handsome sword, he said. Show it to me. I'd wrapped the hilt about with old leather and smeared that with dirt. The scabbard was older than me, and shiny with the ears. Whatever my uncle's sword had been, it wasn't handsome now. Not until I drew it and showed its metal. I considered throwing my dagger. Old Blondie might not see so clear with it jutting out of his eye socket. He might even have a brother at home who'd be pleased to be the new Prince of Arrow, and owe me a favour hereafter. I could see it in my mind's eye, the handsome prince with my dagger in his face, and us racing away across the slopes. I'm not given to should-haves, but I should have. Instead, I stowed the knife and drew my uncle's sword, an heirloom of his line, builder steel, the blade taking the light of the day and giving it back with an edge. Well, now, Prince Orin said again, an uncommon sword you have there, boy. From whom did you steal it? The mountain wind blew, finding every chink in my armor, and I shivered, despite the heat pulsing from Gog at my back. Why would the Prince of Arrow come all the way to the Renar Highlands with just fifty knights? I wonder. I dismounted. The prince's eyes widened at the sight of Gog left in the saddle, half naked, and striped like a tiger. I stood on one of the larger rocks by the roadside, on foot, to show I had no running in me. Perhaps such reasons are not for a bandit child by the roadside clutching a stolen sword, he said, still maddeningly calm. I couldn't argue with the stolen. So I took offence against the child. Fourteen is a man's age in these lands, and I wield this sword better than any who held it before me. The prince chuckled, gentle and unforced. If he had studied a book devoted to the art of infuriating me, he could have done no better job. Pride has ever been my weakness, and occasionally my strength. My apologies, then, young man. I could see his champion frown at that, even behind his visor. I travel to see the lands that I will rule as emperor, to know the people in the cities, and to speak with the nobles, the barons, counts, and even kings, who will serve me when I sit upon the empire throne. I would win their service with wisdom 
words and favour, rather than with sword and fire. A pompous enough speech, perhaps, but he had a way with words, this one. Oh, my brothers, the way he spoke them. A magic of a new kindness, more subtle than Sagus's gentle traps. Even that heathen witch with his dream-weaving would envy this kind of persuasion. I could see why the prince had taken off his helm. The enchantment didn't lie in the words alone, but in the look, in the honesty and trust of it all, as if every man who heard them was worthy of his friendship. A talent to be wary of, maybe more potent even than the power Corian used to set me scurrying across empire and to steer my uncle from behind his throne. The hound sat and licked the slobber from its chops. It looked big enough to swallow a small lamb. And why would they listen to you, Prince of Arrow? I asked. I heard a petulance in my voice and hated it. This hundred war must end, he said. It will end, but how many need drown in blood before the peace? Let the throne be claimed. The nobles can keep their castles, rule their lands, collect their gold. Nothing will be lost, nothing will end, but the war. And there it was again, the magic. I believed him. Even without him saying so, I knew that he truly sought peace, that he would rule with a fair and even hand, that he cared about the people. He would let the farmers farm, the merchants trade, the scholars seek their secrets. If you were offered the Empire throne, he said, looking only at me, would you take it? Yes, though I would rather take it without it being offered. Why? he asked. Why do you want it? He shone a light into my dark corners, this storybook prince with his calm eyes. I wanted to win. The throne was just the token to demonstrate that victory, and I wanted to win because other men had said that I may not. I wanted to fight because fighting ran through me. I gave less for the people than for the dung heap we rolled making in. It's mine, all the answer I could find. Is it? he asked. Is it yours, steward? And in one flourish he showed his hand, and showed my shame. You should know that the men who fight the Hundred War, and they are all men, save for the Queen of Red, fall from two sides of a great tree. The line of stewards, as our enemies call us, trace the clearest path to the throne. But it is to the great steward, Honorus, who served for fifty years when the seed of empire failed. And Honorus sat before the throne rather than on it. Still, a strong claim to be heir to the man who served as emperor in all but name is a better case for taking that throne than a weak claim to be heir to the last emperor. At least that's how we stewards see it. In any case, I would cut myself a path to the throne even if some bastard-born herder had fathered me on a gutter hall. Genealogy can work for me or I can cut down the family tree and make a battering ram. Either way is good. Many of the line of stewards are cast in my mould, lean, tall, dark of hair and eye, quick of mind. Even our foes call us cunning. The line of the emperor is muddied, lost in burning libraries, tainted by madness and excess, and many of the line, or who claim it, are built like Prince Orin, fair, thick of arm, sometimes giants big as Reich, though pleasing on the eye. Steward, is it now? I rolled my wrist and my sword danced. His hound stood up sharp without a growl. Put it away, Jorg, he said. I know you. You have the look of the Ancraths about you. As dark a branch of the steward tree as ever grew. You're all still killing each other, so I hear. That's King Jorg to you, I said, knowing I sounded like a spoiled child and unable to help it. Something in Orin's calm humour, in the light of him, cast a shadow over me. King? Ah, yes, because of Ancreth and Geleth, he said. But I'm told your father has named young Prince Degren his heir. So perhaps... He spread his hands and smiled. The smile felt like a slap in the face. So father had named the new son he'd made with his scor and whore, and gifted him my birthright. And you're thinking to give him the Highlands, too? I asked, keeping the savage grin on my face, however much it wanted to slide away. You should know that there are a hundred of my watch hidden in the rocks ready to slot arrows through the gaps in that fancy armor, Prince. It might even be true. I knew that at least some of the watch would be tracking the knights. I'd say it was closer to twenty, Prince Orin said. I don't think they're mountain men, are they? Did you bring them out of Ancreth, Jorg, when you ran? 
They're skilled enough, but proper mountain men would be harder to spot. He knew too much, this prince. It was seriously starting to annoy. And as you know, being angry makes me angry. In any case, he carried on, as if I weren't about to explode, as if I weren't about to ram my sword entirely through his body. I won't kill you for the same reason you won't kill me. It would replace two weak kingdoms with a stronger one. When the road to the Empire throne, to my throne, leads me here, I would rather find you and your colorful friends terrorizing the peasants and getting drunk than find your father or Baron Kennick keeping order. And I hope that by the time I arrive, you will have grown wiser as well as taller and open your lands to me as Emperor. I jumped from my rock, and the hound stood in my path quicker than quick, still no growl, but way too many teeth on display, all gleaming with slobber. I fixed its eyes, which is a good way to get your face bitten off, but I meant to threaten the beast. Holding my sword by hilt and blade, flat side forward, I took another step, a snarl rising in me. I had a hound once, a good one that I loved, before such soft words were taken from me, and I had no wish to kill this one, but I would. Back! More growl than word. My eyes on his, and with ears flat to its head, the beast whimpered, and skulked back between the horse's legs. I think it sensed the death in me. A bitter meal, that necromancer's heart. Another step away from the world. It sometimes seems I stand three steps outside the lives of other men. One for the heart, one for the thornbush, and perhaps the first for that dog I remember in dreams. I call him mine, but the hound belonged to my brother William and me. A wolfhound of some kind. Huger than the two of us. A charger fit for two young knights. He could take William on his back, Will being just four, but if I leapt on two, he would shake us both off and nip my leg. We called him Justice. Impressive, said Prince Orin, looking anything but impressed. If you're finished with my dog, then we'll be on our way. I plan to cross through to Orlanth via High Pass, or Blue Moon Pass if it's clear, and pay a call on Earl Samsar. You'll be on your way when I say so, I told him still aching for something. Fear, maybe. Perhaps just a measure of respect would do it. And by whatever route I allow, I didn't like the way he seemed to know the lie of my land better than I did. He raised an eyebrow at that, keeping a smile at bay, and irking me more than smiling would have. And what, then, is your judgment in this matter, King Jorg? Every fibre of me ached to hurt him. In any other man, his words would sound smug, arrogant— but here on this cold mountain slope they sounded honest and sincere. I hated him for being so openly the better man. I caught his eye, and in that instant I knew. He pitied me. "'Cross swords with me, Brother Oren,' I said. "'You're right to think of peace. Why should my goat herders or your pig farmers suffer in a war to see which of our backsides polishes the Empire throne? Cross swords with me, and if I yield, then on the day you come to claim the Empire I won't stand against you.' Come, draw your blade, or have your champion try his luck if you must. I nodded to the man beside him. Ah, Orin said. You wouldn't want to fight him. That's my brother Egan. God made him to stand behind a sword. Scares me sometimes. And besides, the two of you are too alike. Egan thinks all this talk is a waste. He would set our farmers on your herders and drown the world in blood. Would you not, Egan? I have a dream for the Empire. For my empire, a bright dream. But I fear all Egan's dreams are red. Egan grunted, as if bored. The prince dismounted. Clear the path, and let no man interfere. This is... I know, Makin. I cut across him. It's a bad idea. Makin climbed off his horse and stood beside me as Orin's men pulled away. He could be good, he said. Good is fine, I said. I'm great. I won't argue that you're world-class at killing, Jorg, Makin hissed, but this is swordplay, and only swordplay. Then I shall have to play the game, I said. The prince hadn't asked what I would demand of him when I won. That left a bitter taste. We stepped together then. Two of the hundred, the lines of emperor and steward, met for battle. We could do this the clever way, Jorg, Orin said. He had enough of my measure, not to say the easy way. Support me. The new emperor will need a new steward. I spat in the grit. You don't know what it is you want. 
or why you want it, Jorg," he said. "You see nothing of the empire you want to own. Have you been east, chasing the sun to the wall of Utter itself? Have you seen the shores of Dark Afric, spoken with the jarls who sail from their northern fastness when the ice allows? If you had been spawned in the Aral wastes, then all the miles you covered in those roaming years of yours would have shown you nothing but grassland. By ship, Jorg, by ship. That's the way to see the empire. Have you even seen the sea? The grey let out a long, complacent fart, saving me from an answer. I always loved that horse. We circled, like much in life, a sword fight, especially a long sword fight, is about choosing your moment. A swing is a commitment, often a lifetime commitment. You wait for the best odds, then bet your life on the chance offered. Against a man in plate armor, you have to put muscle into it, all your strength, to put enough hurt through that metal so he won't be taking advantage as you draw back for the next attack. A lunge can be more tentative, needs to be precise, to find and pierce that chink in the armor before he finds and pierces yours. I swung, not to hit him, but just to let our blades meet. His sword held a smoky look, something darker alloyed to the builder steel. The clash rang out harsh across the slopes. Somehow he rolled his blade in the instant they met, and almost took mine from my hands. I didn't like that at all. I pressed him, short swings to keep him busy, to numb his hands and stop them being so tricksy. It felt like hacking at a stone pillar, and left my palms aching, pain stabbing up my wrists. "You're better than I expected," he said. He came at me then, lunge, half swing, lunge. Combinations too fast to think about. We train so that our muscles learn, so that our eyes talk to our arms and hands, skipping the brain and the need to bother with decision and judgment. It's like learning the notes for a piece on the harp. First you think it through A C C D, and in time your fingers know it, and you've forgotten the notes. My sword arm made its moves without consulting me. Really, not bad at all, he said. But when you try to play the piece faster. And then faster still, and quicker again. At some point, your fingers falter. What comes next? They want to know. What's next? A heavy metal bar to the side of the head is what's next, apparently. At least that's what the flat of his blade felt like. I said something that was half curse, half groan, and all blood. Then fell over as if he'd cut all my strings. Yield. It sounded as if he was calling from the far end of a long tunnel. Fuck that. More blood. Possibly some bits of tooth. Last chance, Jorg," he said. The edge of his sword lay cold against my neck. He yields, making at the far end of the same tunnel. He yields, like hell I do. The difference between sky and ground had started to reassert itself. I focused on a dark blob that could well be Orin. Yield," he said again. Warmth down my neck, where blood trickled from his shallow cut. I managed to laugh. You've already said you won't kill me, Prince of Arrow. It's not in your interest. So why would I yield? I spat again. If you ever get to my borders with an army, I'll decide what to do then. He turned away with a look of disgust. The High Pass, I said. I'll give you free passage to the High Pass, and you can bother the Earl with your moralizing. You earned that much. I tried to stand and failed. Macon helped me to my feet. We watched them ride on. The brother, Prince Egan. Gave me an evil stare as he passed. Orin didn't even turn his head. We watched until the last horse vanished over the rise. We're going to need a bigger army, I said. Sir Makin is almost the handsome knight of legend. Dark locks curling, tall, a swordsman's build, darkest eyes, his armor always polished, blade keen. Only the thickness of his lips and the sharpness of his nose leave him shy of a maiden's dream. His mouth too expressive. His look too hawkish. In other matters too, Sir Makin is almost, almost honourable, almost honest. About his friendship, though, there is no almost. Chapter Eight. Four years earlier, I woke in a darkened room. A fly buzzed. Someone somewhere was being sick. Light filtered in where the daub cracked from the wattle. More light through the shutters, warped in their frame. A peasant hut. The retching stopped, replaced by muted sobs. A child. 
I sat up. A thin blanket slipped from me. Straw prickled. The ache in my head had gone. My tooth hurt like a bastard, but it was nothing compared to how my head had been. I felt around for my sword and couldn't find it. There's something magical about a departed headache. It's a shame the joy fades and you can't appreciate not having one every moment of your life. That hadn't been a regular headache, of course. Old Georgie got himself a bruised brain. I'd seen it before. When Brother Gaines fell off his horse one time and hit his head, he went crazier than Michael for the best part of two days. Did I fall off my horse? He must have asked that a thousand times in a row, crying one moment, laughing the next. We're brittle things, us men. I found my feet still a little shaky. The door opened, and the light came dazzling around the dark shape of a woman. I brought you soap, she said. I took it and sat again. Smells good, it did. My stomach growled. Your friend, Makin, he brought a couple of rabbits for the pot, she said. We hadn't had meat since the pigs got took. I raised the bowl to my lips. No spoons here. She left as I started slurping, burning my mouth, not caring too much. For a long time I just sipped and watched the dust dance where fingers of light reached in through the shutters. I munched on lumps of rabbit, chewed on the gristle, swallowed the fat. It's good to eat with an empty mind. At last I got to my feet again, steadier now. I patted myself down. My old dagger was on my hip, and there was a lump in my belt pouch, which turned out to be Macon's clove spice. One more glance around for my sword, and I went to the door. The day seemed a little too bright, the wind chill and sharp, with the stink of old burning. I stretched and blinked. Apart from the hut I'd come from, a stall for animals by the look of it, the place lay in ruins. Two houses with tumbled walls and blackened spars, some broken fences, animal pens that looked to have been ridden through with heavy horse. I saw the woman crouched in the shell of the closer house, her back to me. The sudden need for a piss bit hard. I went against the hut, a long, hot acid flow never seeming to end. Jesu! Have I slept for a week? A wise man once said, Don't shit where you eat. Aristotle, perhaps. On the road, that's a rule to live by. Find your relief where you will. Move on each day and leave the shit, all manner of shit, behind you. In the castle, I have a guard robe, which, let's face it, is a hole in the wall to crap through. In a castle, you shit where you eat, and you have to think a bit harder about what kind of shit is worth stirring up. That's what I've learned in three months of being king. Finished at last. Had to be a week's worth. I felt better. Good. A yawn cracked my face. The land lay flat to the north, the Matarax a jagged line to the south. We'd left the highlands, or near as damn it. I stretched and ambled over to the woman. Did my men do this? I frowned and glanced around again. Where in hell are they, anyhow? She turned, face worn, haunted around the eyes. Soldiers from Ancraft did it. A child hung in her arms, limp and grey. A girl, six years, maybe seven. Ancrath? I arched a brow. My eyes kept returning to the girl. We're close to the border? Five miles, she said. They told us we couldn't live here. The land was annexed. They started to fire the buildings. Annexed? That rang a small bell at the back of my mind. Some dispute about the border. The oldest maps had it that Lord Nosser's estate reached out this far. I could smell the vomit now, sour on the morning air. The girl had a blood-black smear of it in her hair. They killed your man? I asked. I surprised myself. I don't care enough about such things to waste words on them. I blamed the bang on the head. They killed our boy, she said, staring past the black timbers, past me, past the sky. Davy came out screaming and choking, blind with the smoke, got too close to a soldier, just a quick swing, like he was cutting down bindweed, and my boy was open. His guts, she blinked and looked down at the girl. He kept screaming. He wouldn't stop. Another soldier put an arrow through his neck. And your man? I hadn't asked about her boy. I hadn't wanted that story. And the girl kept watching me, without interest, without hope. I don't know. She had a grey voice. 
the way it goes when emotions have burned out. He didn't go to Davy, didn't hold him. Too scared the soldiers would cut him down too. The girl coughed, a wet sound. Now he cries all the time, or stares at the ground. And the child? I cursed my empty head. I had only to think a question today, and it came spilling out of me. Sick, she said. In her stomach. But I think it's in her blood too. I think it's the waste. She pulled the girl to her. Does it hurt, Janie? Yes. A dry whisper. A little or a lot? A lot. Still a whisper. Why ask such questions if there's nothing to be done? He did right, I said. Your man. Sometimes you need to hold back. Bide your time. The thorns had held me back when it mattered. Made the decision for me. He did right. The words that rang so true before I fell off my horse seemed empty beside the shell of their home. A blow to the skull can knock a deal of sense out of a man. I saw horsemen across the meadow. Two men, three horses. Makin and Reich rode up, keeping an easy pace. Good to have you on your feet, Jorg. Makin gave me his grin. Reich just scowled. Mistress Sarah and Master Martin have been looking after you, I see. And that was Makin for you. Always with the making friends, remembering names, jollying along. Sarah, is it? I said. I suppose these were my people after all. And little Janie. For a moment I saw a different Jane, crushed and broken under rocks, the light dying out of her. That Jane once told me I needed better reasons. Better reasons if I wanted to win. But maybe just better reasons for everything. Take her inside, I said. It's too cold here. A vague guilt crept over me. For pissing on one of the only four walls they had left, Sarah stood and carried the girl indoors. So you left me for dead then, Makin? I asked. Where are the others? Camped a mile down a road. He nodded north, watching for any more raiding parties. Odd to think of jolly old Nossa standing behind the raids. It put a sour edge on sweet memories. I remembered him in his feasting hall, with the faded map stretched out across the table. How he pored over them. Nosser in his oak chair in the Fort of Elm, grey beard and warm eyes. We played in that hall, Will and I, when we were no bigger than the child Sarah carried past me. Nosser and his lines on the map. Gruff talk of his boys giving Renard's boys a hiding. You ready to ride? Makin asked. Soon. I went to my horse. Brath, the stable master called him, and I'd not seen fit to change the name. Sturdy enough, but not a patch on Garrett, who fell under that mountain I pushed over in Galath. I fished a few necessaries from my saddlebags and followed Sarah. The light had blinded me on the way out. The gloom left me blind on the way in. The stall stank. I hadn't noticed it when I woke, but it hit me now. Old vomit, sweat, animal dung. I believed the Prince of Arrow when he said he would protect the people, give them peace. I believed Jane when she said I needed better reasons for the things I made fate give me. I believed it all. Everything, except that it meant anything to me. I crouched by the woman. Already I had to reach for her name. The new king didn't protect you then. There's a king? She said without interest, wanting me gone. Hello, Janie, I said, turning the charm onto the girl instead. Did you see I brought the biggest, ugliest man in the world to show you? Half a smile twitched on her lips. So what do you want, little Janie? I asked. I didn't know what I was doing here, crouched in the stink with the peasants. Maybe I just wanted to beat the Prince of Arrow at something. Or maybe it was just the echoes of that knock on the head. Perhaps Michael was knocked on the head as a baby, and that knock had been echoing through his whole life. I want Davy. She kept unnaturally still. Only her mouth moved. And her eyes. What do you want to be? To do? I thought of my childhood. I wanted to be death on wings. I wanted to break the world open until it gave me what was mine. A princess, Janie said. She paused. Or a mermaid. I tell her stories, sir, the mother said, half fearful even now, ruined and on the edge of despair. I wondered what she thought I might take from her. My grandmother read, she said, and my family keeps the tales. She stroked Janie's hair. I speak them when she's hurting to keep her mind from it, fill her head with nonsense. She don't rightly know what a mermaid is, even. I bit my tongue, then. Three impossible requests in as many moments. I'd followed them, 
in thinking to be the king, thinking of my crown and throne, my armies, gold and walls. She wants her brother, she wants to be a princess, she wants to be a mermaid, and the waste will take her, screaming from her mother's arms, to a cold slot in the ground. And all the king's horses and all the king's men can't do a thing about it. I touched her then, Janie, just a light touch on the forehead. She had enough death in her already, and didn't need me adding to it. But I touched her with my fingers, just to feel it pulsing under the skin, eating at the marrow of her bones. The sickness in her called out to the necromancy lying in me, making a link. I could feel her heartbeat flutter under mine. Ready to ride, Jorg? Yes. I swung up into Brath's saddle. We set off at slow walk. Any of that spice left, Brother Jorg? Makin asked. I must have swallowed it all for the pain, I said, patting my belt pouch. Makin rolled his eyes. He glanced back at the ruined farmstead. Christ bleeding. There was enough. The faint sound of cymbals cut him off. The clash of cymbals, the whir of cogs, stamping, and a child laughing. Leave anything else behind, Jorg? he asked. Red Kent was right, I said. It was cursed, evil. Better the hurt fall on the peasants, nay? On the plains, the winds can make your eyes sting. Reich pulled on his reins and started back. Don't, I said. And he didn't. Sleep came hard that night. Perhaps soft months in the haunt had left me wanting the comfort of a bed. Sleep came hard, and the dreams came harder, dragging me under. I lay in a dark room, a dark room sour with the stink of vomit and animals, and saw nothing but the glitter of her eyes, child's eyes, heard only the tick, tick, tick of the watch on my wrist, and the rasp, rasp, rasp of her breath, hot and dry and quick. I lay for the longest time with the tick and the rasp and the glitter of her eyes. We lay, and a warm river carried us, thick with the scent of cloves. Tick, breath, tick. Breath, tick, breath, and then I woke, sudden and with a gasp. What? Someone murmured, perhaps Kent in his blankets. Nothing, I said. The dream still tangled me. I thought my watch stopped, but it wasn't the watch. In the grey dawn, Makin rose beside me, cracking his face with a yawn, spitting and rubbing his back. Jesu, but I'm sore. He cast a bleary glance my way. Nothing a pinch of clove spice wouldn't fix. The child died last night, I told him. Easy, rather than hard. Makin pursed those thick lips of his, and said no more about it. Perhaps thinking of his own child, lost back among the years. He didn't even ask how I knew. The years never seem to weigh on Brother Michael, as if his inability to count their passing protects him from their passage. He watches the world through calm grey eyes, broad-chested, thick-limbed. Brother Grumlow cuts Michael's hair close, with a tail at the rear, and shaves his beard, leaving him clean-cheeked and sharp. And if no one told you that his thoughts rattle in an empty head, you might think Brother Michael as capable a rogue as rides among the brothers. In battle, though, his hands grow clever, and you'd think him whole, until the din fades, the dying fall, and Michael wanders the field weeping. Chapter 9. Four Years Earlier The Highlands has lowland, though precious little of it, and what there is lies stony, and grows yet more stones when farmed. In my three months as king I had stuck to the mountains. Only now, when the road led me north to Heimrift, did I discover the fringes of my kingdom where it brushed against Ancreth and the Ken Marshes. We rode from the ruined farm, from the peasants, Martin and Sarah whose names had stayed with me this once, and from their dead girl, Janie, whose breath stopped one night on the edge of spring before we'd gone twenty miles down the trail. We kept to the borderlands where road brothers are wont to travel and opportunity abounds. The father into a kingdom, a bandit troop can venture without serious resistance is a measure of that kingdom's softness. Thurton was always soft around the edges, the Ken Marshes softer still. Ancrath, we would say, was hard, hard enough to break your teeth on. Why have we stopped? Makin wanted to know. The road forked, an unmarked junction, 
A dirt road scored through dreary hills where Ancrath met the marshes, met the highlands. The wind rippled through the long grass. Any place three nations touch will grow well given half a chance. Blood makes for rich soil. There's two choices. Take the one that's not Ancrath, he said. I closed my eyes. Do you hear that, Makin? What? Listen, I said. To what? He cocked his head. Birds? Harder. Mosquitoes? Makin asked, a frown on him now. Gog hears it, I said. Don't you, lad? I felt him move behind me. A bell? The bell at Jessup, where the marsh tide brings the dead. It's got a voice so deep it just crawls over the bogs, mile after mile, I said. That bell had called me back home once before. That bell had let me know I had a new brother lurking in a stranger's belly, being put together piece by piece by piece beneath dresses fit for a queen, under silk and lace, and now it reminded me of the Prince of Arrows' words, words his sword nearly not clean out of my head, that my little brother had come out to play, and the cradle toys my father first gave him were the rights to my inheritance. We'll go this way, I said, and turned along the harder path. The Heimrift is that way, Makin said. He pointed to be clear. I'm not arguing. I just don't want anyone saying I didn't mention it, you know, when we're all lying on the ground, bleeding to death. He was arguing as it happened, but he had a case, and I didn't stop him. We rode for an hour or so, leaving the sourness of the boglands behind us. Spring races through Ancrath before it starts to struggle up the slopes into the highlands. We came to woodlands, with leaves unfurling on every branch as if one blow of spring's green hammer had set them exploding from the bud. I took the brothers from the road, and we followed trails into the woods. If you don't want to meet anyone, take the forest path, especially in Ancrath, since I stole father's forest watch from him. Spring warmth, the luminous green of new leaves, the song of thrush and lark, the richness of the forest breathed in and slowly out. Ancrath has charms unknown in the Renar highlands but I'd started to appreciate the wildness in my new kingdom, the raw rock, unobtainable peaks, even the endless wind scouring east to west. Grumlow leaned over and snagged something from young Sim's hair. Wood tick. He cracked it between his nails. Even Eden had a snake problem. The head cart started to snag on bushes, and deadfall as the trails grew narrow. Reich's cursing came more frequent and more dire prompted by repeated slaps in the face from branch after branch. "'Shouldn't ride so high, little Reiki,' I told him. Makin came up, behind him Kent and Roe, chuckling over some joke he'd left them with. "'We'll be walking soon, then,' he ducked under low-hanging greenery. I pulled up at a stream, crossed by a small clapper bridge that must have been old when Christ first learned to walk. I remembered the bridge, possibly the farthest I'd ever ventured alone before I left the tall castle for good. "'We'll leave the horses here,' I said. You can watch them, Grumlow, you being the man with the sharp eyes today. And that wasn't all that was sharp about Grumlow. That moustache might make him look stupid, but he had a clever way with daggers, and a clever number of them stashed about his person. I thought about leaving Gog and Gorgoth, especially Gorgoth, for he wasn't one to be taken places unobserved. When I first brought him into the haunt, after sitting my ass on the throne for a day or two, he caused quite a stir. Even lame, from the arrows he'd taken for me holding open the gate, he looked like a monster to reckon with. I had Codin bring him up through the west yard on a market day. You'd have thought someone dropped a hornet's nest for all the commotion. One old biddy screamed, clutched her chest, and fell over. That made me laugh, and when they told me she never did get back up, well, that seemed funny too at the time. Maybe I'm getting too old, for it doesn't strike me quite so merrily any more. Let truth be told, though, she did fall funny. In the end, I took them both. Gorgoth is the kind you need in a tough spot, and Gog, well, he makes lighting the campfire less of a chore. Making your way through the greenwood without people seeing you isn't too hard if you know your way, and don't count charcoal burners as people. They're a lonely breed, and not want to gossip. So Reich didn't have to kill them, and so we sliced into Ancrath easily enough, tramping along the deer paths. Even hard kingdoms have their fault lines. It shouldn't be this easy. Makin said. It wasn't in my day. Damned if Codin and his fellows would have let bandits wander so carelessly. He shook his head. 
though it seemed an odd thing to complain about. Your father's army has grown weak? Gorgoth asked, demolishing the undergrowth as he walked. I shrugged. Half his forces are out in the marsh, or barracked in the bog towns. Dead things keep hauling themselves out of the muck these days. There's others having similar problems. I had a merchant at court telling me the drowned isles have fallen to the dead king, all of them, given over to corpsemen, marsh ghouls, necromancers, lichkin. Makin just crossed his chest and picked up the pace. We travelled light, locating good shelter in the woods, and good eating. Young Sim had a way with the finding of rabbits, and I could knock the odd squirrel or wood pigeon off its branch with a handy stone. Animals in spring are easy, too full of the new warmth, too taken with new possibilities, and not enough of watching for rocks winging their way out of the shadows. Ancrath casts the spell on you, and nowhere more so than in the greenwood, where the day trickles like honey and the sun falls golden amid pools of shade. We walked in single file with the song of the thrush and sparrow, and the scent of may and wild onions. The day set me dreaming as I walked, and my nose led me back through the years to memories of William. There was a night when my brother lay sick, when my mother wept, and the table knights would not turn their stern faces to me. I remembered the prayers I had whispered in the dark chapel when all the holy men were in their beds, the promises I made. No threats back then. I barely even bargained with the Almighty in those days. And when I crept back to our chambers, I climbed in beside William and held his head. The friar had given him bitter potions and cut his leg to release the bad blood. My mother had set an ointment of honey and onions on his chest. That at least seemed to ease his breathing a little. We lay with the night sounds, William's dry wheeze, our hound Justice snoring by the doors, the click of the maid's needles in the hall, and the cry of bats, almost too high for hearing, as they swung around the tall castle in the moonless dark. A penny for him. Makin said. I snapped my head up with a start, almost tripping. My thoughts are worth less than that today. I had been a foolish child. Sometimes I wished I could cut away old memories and let the wind take them. If a sharp knife could pare away the weakness of those days, I would slice until nothing but the hard lessons remained. We made our way without problem until we ran out of forest. The land around the tall castle is clear of trees and set to farming. To feed the king and so that he may see his enemies advance. I leaned against the trunk of a massive copper beech, one of the last great trees before the woods gave over to a two-acre field of ploughed earth, peeping with green, that might have been anything from carrots to kale for all I knew. More fields to the left and right, more beyond. A lone scarecrow watched us. I'll go on alone, I said. I started to unbuckle my breastplate. Go where? Makin asked. You can't get in there, Jorg. Nobody could. And what for? What are you possibly going to achieve? A man's got a right to call in on his family now and again, Brother Makin, I said. I stripped the van braces from my forearms, my breastplate, and finally the gorget. I like to have iron around my neck. Kept it from a slitting once or twice, but armor wouldn't save me where I was aimed. I took the scabbard off my belt. Kent, look after this for me. His eyes widened, almost as if he didn't know. That's how a leader binds his men, with trust. A sword like this? Sir Makin, I gave it to you. I cut him off. You need a sword, Jorg, Michael said, confusion in his eyes. Behind him, Sim watched me without comment, unwrapping his harp. He at least knew enough to settle down for a wait. I magicked my old knife into my hand, a trick I learned off Grumlow. This'll do for what I have in mind, Brother Michael. Give me two days, I said. If I'm not back by then, send Reich to take the castle by storm. And with a bow, I left them to watch the carrots grow, or the kale. I made my way along the margins of the forest towards the Roma Road. They say you can put foot on that road and never leave it till you reach the Pope's front door. I plan to walk the other way. There's a cemetery near the Roma Road, mostly eaten by the forest, mostly forgotten. I hunted through it as a child, crumbled mausoleums choked with ivy. "'smothered with moss, cracked by trees. "'The cemetery covers acre upon hidden acre, "'a lost necropolis. "'Pear shares, they call it in dusty books. "'The legends mean nothing to me. "'Beloved, 1845. "'Dearly departed, 1710. "'My heart lies here, 1908. 
barely legible. So long ago, even their calendar loses meaning. The stones are set with a clear resin, harder than glass, which wards them in a skin no thicker than a hair. It took years before I noticed it. The weathering they'd suffered happened in the distant long ago. Now, not even a hammer blow will mar them. The builders held these old markers precious, and kept them from the centuries. I found my way through toppled gravestones close to the road, where some of it's kept clear. Much has been robbed out. There's a peasant's cottage a little to the west, entirely built from headstones, weathered granite markers with time-blurred legends remembering the dead for illiterate fieldmen. A house built of stories to shelter a man who cannot read. I found her by the road's edge, hair pink with fallen blossom. The cycle of seasons has worn the definition from her features. But the beauty remains, the sharpness of her cheekbones, the grace in long limbs, the gentle swell of a child's breast, a freckling of lichen. She needs no deep carved runes to spell out her life. Here, I buried my child, a message for which reading is not required. She died in the winter of a lost year, the daughter of a wealthy man who would have given all his wealth and more to buy her into spring. I saw her first in autumn, long ago, when the leaves fell so thick they hid the stone dog she chases. Whilst I watched, her other travellers hurried past on the road, clenched against the sharp-fingered wind. Some paused to wonder what she chased, hugging themselves, squinting into the rain. They moved on. I stayed. Maybe they wondered what they were chasing. She's after a dog, a little terrier, remembered in stone, lost that autumn in a drift of wet ochre. A centuries-old chase that has seen the death of everyone who cared, the end of every soul that knew the terrier's name. A chase that saw the stilling of each hand to touch this child, the loss of every life that shared her world. I came again with the snows on the first day of winter, to see my statue girl. My first love, maybe. I watched, and the snow fell, tiny crystals, the kind so perfect they almost chime against the ground. The light failed early, and a wildness infected the wind, swirling the snow into rivulets of milk across the Roma road, ice hissing over stone. A frost came, and etched silver tracery across her dress, with only me to see. The seasons turn, and here I am again, and still she waits for spring. They buried high lords and high ladies here, Poets and bards. Now it's a place for servant corpses, close enough to the tall castle for sentimental ladies to visit their wet nurses, far enough away to be seemly. They bury old servants, sometimes even faithful dogs, around my girl who waits for spring. Soft-hearted ladies from court come with their perfumed toys that have ceased to yap. And one time a boy of six, soaked and half-frozen, dragging something that might once have been a wolf. Hello, Jorg. I turned, and between the old graves walked Catherine, the sun making magic of her hair. Chapter 10 Four Years Earlier Hello, Jorg. Was that all she said to me? Catherine, there in the Renat Forest, among the gravestones. Hello, Jorg. I'm trying to wake up from something. Maybe I've always been trying. I'm drowning in confusion. Somewhere high above me, light dances on the surface, and past that, the air is waiting, waiting for me to draw breath. I hardly know Catherine, but I want her, with unreasonable ferocity, like a sickness, like the need for water, like Paris for Helen. I'm laid low by irresistible longing. In memory, I study the light on her face, beneath the glow bulbs of the tall castle, beneath the cemetery trees. I envy those patches of sunlight sliding over her hair, moving unopposed the length of her body, across her cheekbones. I remember everything. I recall the pattern of her breath. In the heat of Drain's kitchen, I remember a single bead of sweat and the slow roll of it down her neck, along the tendon, across her throat. I've killed men and forgotten them, mislaid the act of taking the life. But that drop of sweat is a diamond in my mind's eye. Hello, Jorg, and my clever words desert me. She makes me feel my fourteen summers, more boy than man. I want her beyond reason. I need to own, consume, worship, devour. What I've made of her in my mind cannot live in flesh. 
She's just a person, just a girl, but she stands at the door to an old world, and although I can't go back, she can come through, and maybe bring with her a scent of it, a taste of that lost warmth. These feelings are too fierce to last; they can only burn, making us ash and char. I see her in dreams. I see her against the mountains, high, snow cold, snow pure, unobtainable. I climb, and on the empty peak, I speak her name to the wind, but the wind takes my words, takes me too, tumbling through void. Hello, Jorg. My flesh prickles. I rub at my cheek, and my fingers come away bloody, sliced open. Every part of me burns with pins and needles, real pins. Real needles, I scream, and like buds on the branch, each prickle erupts. A hundred thorns sliding from my skin, growing from the bone. There are animals impaled, stabbed through like exhibits on a gamekeeper's board. Rat, stoat, ferret, fox, dog, baby, limp and watching. I scream again and rotate into darkness. A night with only a whisper to give it form. A whispered chant, growing louder. Topology, tautology, torsion, torture, taunt, taut, tight, taken, taking, taking, take. What's he trying to take? Somebody fumbling at my arm, fingers too stupid for the clever catch on the watch. A quick move, and I had his wrist, impossibly thick, strong. I dug my thumb into the necessary pressure point. Lundis showed it to me in a book. Ah! Reich's voice. Pax. I sat up sharp, breaking the surface, drawing that long-awaited breath, and shaking the darkness from my mind. Topology, tautology, torsion, meaningless webs of words falling from me. Reich crouched over me, blocking the too bright sun. He sneered and sat back. Pax, Pax, road speak, peace. It's in my nature, an excuse for any crime you're caught in the middle of. Sometimes I think I should wear the word on my forehead. Where in the hell are we? I asked. An empty feeling ran through me, welling from my stomach and behind my eyes. Hell's the word. Red Kent walked over. I lifted my hand. Sand all over. Sand everywhere, in fact. A desert. Two of the fingernails on my right hand were torn away. Gone. It started to hurt. My other nails were torn and split. I had bruises all over. Gog came out from behind a lone thorn bush, slow, as if he thought I might bite. I, I pressed my hand to the side of my head, sand gritty on the skin. I was with Catherine. And then what? Makin's voice from behind. I, nothing, and then nothing, as if little Georgie had been too full of the spring's warmth and possibilities. And then a stone looped out of the shadows, and took him off the bough. I remembered the thorns, the itch and sting of them stayed with me. I lifted my arms, no wounds, but the skin lay red and scabbed. In fact, Kent had it too, red as his name suggests. I turned to find Makin, also scabby, leading his horse. The beast looked worse than him, ropes of mucus around its muzzle, blisters on its tongue. This is not a good place to be. I'm thinking. I reached for my knife and found it gone. What are we doing here? We came to see a man named Luntar, Makin said. An alchemist from the Utter East. He lives here, and here is Thar. I knew the name on the map scroll. The word had sat along the edge of the Thurton grasslands. There had been a burn mark on the map, obscuring whatever the name labelled. But perhaps the scorch mark hadn't been an accident. Poison land, Makin said. Some call them promised. A builder's son had burned here many centuries ago. The promise was that one day the land would be safe again. I thrust my fingers back into the sand, not the ones missing fingernails. I could touch the death there. I could roll it between my fingertip and thumb. Hot, death and fire together. He lives here, I asked. Doesn't he burn? Makin shuddered. Yes, he said. He does. It takes a lot to make Makin shudder. The empty feeling gnawed at me, eating away at the questions I most wanted to ask. And what, I said, did we want from this East Mage? Makin held out what he had been holding all along. This, a box, a copper box, thorn patterned, no lock or latch, a copper box. 
not big enough to hold a head. A child's fist would fit. What's in the box? I didn't want to know. Makin shook his head. There was a madness in you, Jorg. When you came back, what's in it? Lunta put a madness in there. Makin thrust the box back into his saddlebag. It was killing you. He put my memory in that box. I asked, incredulous. You let him take my memory. You begged him to do it, Jorg. Makin wouldn't look at me. Reich, on the other hand, couldn't stop. Give it to me. I would have reached for it, but my hand didn't want to. He told me not to. Makin said, unhappy. He told me to make you wait for a day. If you still wanted it after that, you could take it. Makin bit his lip. He chewed on it too much. Trust me in this, Jorg. You don't want to go back to how you were. I shrugged. Tomorrow then, because trust is how a leader binds his men, and because my hands didn't want that box, they'd rather burn. Now where's my fucking dagger? Makin would only look at the horizon. Best forgotten. We moved on, leading the horses. All of us reunited. We headed east, and when the wind blew, the sand stung like nettles. Only Gog and Gorgoth seemed unaffected. Gog hung back as if he didn't want to be near me. Is it all like this? I asked him, just to make him look at me. Even where Luntar lives, he shook his head. The sand turns the glass around his hut, black glass. It cuts your feet. We walked on. Reich marched beside me, sparing the occasional glance. Something had changed in the way he looked at me, as if we were equals now. I kept my head down and tried to remember. I teased at the hole in my mind. Hello, Jorg. She had said, "Memory is all we are. Moments and feelings captured in amber, strung on filaments of reason. Take a man's memories, and you take all of him. Chip away a memory at a time, and you destroy him as surely as if you hammered nail after nail through his skull. I would have back what was mine. I would open the box. Hello, Jorg," she had said. "We were by the statue of the girl and her dog, by her grave, where sentimental ladies and foolish children." Bury their animals. Nothing. I learned a time ago that if you can't get what you want by going in the front door, find a back way. I know a back way to that cemetery, not by a path I wanted to tread, but I would take it even so. When I was very young, six maybe, a duke called on my father, a man from the north with white blonde hair and a beard down his chest, Alaric of Maladon. The duke brought a gift for my mother, a wonder of the old world. Something bright and moving, swirling within glass, first lost in the hugeness of the duke's hand, and then in the folds of mother's dress. I wanted that thing, half seen, and not understood. But such gifts were not for tiny princes. My father took it and set it in the treasury to gather dust. I learned this much from quiet listening. The treasury in the tall castle lies behind an iron door, triple locked, not a builder-made door, but a work of the Turkman. Black iron set with a hundred studs. When you're six, most locked doors present a problem. This one presented several. Of all memories, the first I have is of leaning from a high parapet into the teeth of a gale, with the rain lashing and me laughing. The next is of hands pulling me back. If you're determined, if you set your mind, there are never enough hands to pull you back. By the time I reached six, I knew the outside of the tall castle. As well as I knew the inside, the builders left little for a climber to use, but centuries of tinkering by the Ancrests and the House of Awe before us had provided plenty of footholds, at least plenty of ones deep enough for a child. There's a single high window in the royal treasury, set in a plain wall a hundred feet above the ground, too narrow for a man, and blocked by a forest of bars set so close as to give a snake quite a wriggle of it. On the far side of the castle, close to the throne room, is a hole that leads to a gargoyle's head on the outer wall. If the treasury door opens, then the movement of air through the castle makes the gargoyle speak. On a still day, he moans, and when the wind is up, he howls. He will also speak if the wind is hard in the east, and a particular window in the kitchen stores is left unshuttered. When that happens, there's a fuss, and somebody gets whipped with rope and wire. Without the treasury's high window, the gargoyle would not speak, and the king would never know when the door to his treasures stood open. I left my bed one moonless night, 
William lay sleeping in his little bed. No one saw me leave. Only our great hound, Justice. He gave a whine of reproach, then tried to follow. I cursed him to silence and closed the door on him. Those bars look strong, but like so much we depend upon in life, they're rotten to the core. Rust has eaten them. Even those with steel left at the center will bend given sufficient leverage. One night, when my nurse lay sleeping, and three guards on wall duty argued over the ownership of a silver coin found on the steps at Changeover, I climbed down a knotted rope and set foot amidst my father's wealth. I brushed the rust from my tunic, shook great flakes of it from my hair, and set my lantern, now unhooded, upon the floor. The Ancrath loot, robbed from almost every corner of empire, lay on stone shelves, belched from coffers, stood stacked in careless piles. Armor, swords, gold coin in wooden tubs, mechanisms that looked like parts of insects, gleaming in the lantern light, and tainting the air with alien scents, almost citrus, almost metal. I found my prize beside a helmet full of cogs and ash. The Duke's gift didn't disappoint. Beneath a glass dome that wasn't glass, sealed by an ivory disc that wasn't ivory, lay a tiny scene, a church in miniature set around with tiny houses, and there a person and another. And as I held it to the light, and turned its surprising weight this way and that to see the detail, a snowstorm grew, swirling up from the ground until whirling flakes obliterated the view, leaving nothing but a blizzard in a half-globe. I set the snow-globe back, worried for a moment that I had somehow broken it. And miracle of miracles, the snow began to settle. There's no magic to it now. I know that the right collection of artisans could make something similar in just a few weeks. They would use glass and ivory, and I don't know what the snow would be, but as ancient wonders go, there's little wonder in such things if you're much past six. But at the time, it was magic, of the best kind, stolen magic. I shook the snow globe again, and once more the all-encompassing blizzard rose, chaos, followed by calm, by settling snows, and a return to the world before. I shook it again. It seemed wrong, all that storm and fury signifying nothing. The whole world upheaved, and for what? The same man trudged toward the same church. The same woman waited at the same cottage door. I held a world in my hand, and however I shook it, however the pieces fell, in whatever new patterns, nothing changed. The man would never reach the church. Even at six, I knew the hundred war. I marched wooden soldiers across father's maps. I saw the troops return through the tall gate, bloody and fewer, and the women weeping in the shadows as others threw themselves at their men. I read the tales of battle, of advance and retreat, of victory and defeat. In books I would not have been allowed to open if my father knew me. I understood all this, and I knew that I held my whole world in my right hand. Not some playland, some toy church and tiny men crafted by ancients. My whole world. And no amount of shaking would change it. We would swirl against each other, battle, kill, and fall, and settle, and as the haze cleared, the war would still be there, unchanged, waiting, for me, for my brother, for my mother. When a game cannot be won, change the game. I read that in the Book of Kirk. Without thought, I brought the snow globe overhead and smashed it on the ground. From the wet fragments I picked out the man, barely a weak grain between my thumb and finger. You're free now, I said, then flicked him into a corner to find his own way home. Because I didn't have all the answers, not then and not now. I left the treasury, taking nothing, almost defeated by the rope climb even so. I felt tired but content. What I had done seemed so right that I somehow thought others would see it too, and that my crime would not follow me. With aching arms, and covered with rust and scratches, I hauled myself back over the parapet. What's this now? A big hand took me by the neck and lifted me off my feet. It seemed that the wall guards had been less argumentative over my coin than I had hoped. It didn't take long before I stood in my father's throne room with a sleepy page lighting torches. No whale oil in silver lamps for this night's business, just pitch torches crackling, painting more smoke on the black ceiling. Sir Riley held my shoulder, his gauntlet too heavy and digging in. We waited in the empty room and watched the shadows dance. The page left. I'm sorry, 
I said, though I wasn't. Sir Riley looked grim. I'm sorry too, Jorg. I won't do it again, I said, though I would. I know, Sir Riley said, almost tender. But now we must wait for your father, and he's not a gentle man. It seemed that we waited half the night, and when the doors boomed open, I jumped, despite the promises I made myself. My father, in his purple robe and iron crown, with not a trace of sleep in him, strode alone to the throne. He sat and spread his hands across the arms of his chair. "'I want justice,' he said, loud enough for a whole court, though Riley and I were his only audience. Again, "'I want justice!' Eyes on the great doors. "'I'm sorry,' and this time I meant it. "'I can pay. "'Justice!' He didn't even glance at me. The doors opened again, and on a cart, such as they used to bring prisoners up from the dungeon, came my great hound, mine and Will's, chained at each leg, and pushed by a mild-faced servant named Inch, a broad-armed man who had once slipped me a sugar twist on a fate day. I started forward, but Riley's hand kept me where I was. Justice trembled on the cart, eyes wide, shivering so bad he could barely stand, though he had four legs to my two. He looked wet, and as Inch pushed him nearer, I caught the stink of rock oil, the kind they burn in servants' lamps. Inch reached into the cart and lifted an ugly lump hammer, a big one used for breaking coal into smaller pieces for the fire. Go! Father said. The look in Inch's mild eyes said he would prefer to stay, but he set the hammer on the floor and left without protest. There are lessons to be learned today, Father said. Have you ever burned yourself, Jorg? Father asked. I had. I once picked up a poker that had been left with one end in the fire. The pain had taken my breath. I couldn't scream. Not until the blisters started to rise could I make any sound above hissing. And when I could, I howled so loud my mother came running from her tower, arriving as the maids and nurse burst from the next room. My hand had burned for a week, weeping and oozing sending bursts of horrific pain along my arm at the slightest wiggle of fingers. The skin fell away and the flesh beneath lay raw and wet, hurt by even a breath of air. "'You took from me, Jorg,' father said. "'You stole what was mine. I knew enough not to say that it was mother's. "'I've noticed that you love this dog,' father said. I wondered at that, even in my fear. I thought it more likely that he had been told. "'That's a weakness, Jorg,' father said. Loving anything is a weakness. Loving a hound is stupidity. I said nothing. Shall I burn the dog? Father reached for the nearest torch. No! It burst from me, a horrified scream. He sat back. See how weak this dog has made you? He glanced at Sir Riley. How will he rule Ancreth if he cannot rule himself? Don't burn him! My voice trembled, pleading, but somehow it was a threat too even if none of us recognized it. Perhaps there is another way, father said. A middle ground. He looked at the hammer. I didn't understand. I didn't want to. Break the dog's leg, he said. One quick blow, and justice will be served. No, I swallowed, almost choking. I can't, father shrugged and leaned from his throne, reaching for the torch again. I remembered the pain that poker had seared into me. Horror reached for me, and I knew I could let it take me down into hysteria, crying, raging, and I could stay there until the deed was done. I could run and hide in tears and leave justice to burn. I picked up the hammer before Father's hand closed on the torch. It took effort just to lift it, heavy in too many ways. Justice just trembled and watched me, whining, his tail hooked between his legs, no understanding in him, only fear. Swing hard! father said. Well, you'll just have to swing again. I looked at Justice's leg, his long, quick leg, the fur plastered down with oil over bone and tendon, the iron shackle, some kind of vice from the question chamber, biting into his ankle, blood on the metal. I'm sorry, father. I won't ever steal again. And I meant it. Don't try my patience, boy. I saw the coldness in his eyes and wondered if he had always hated me. I lifted the hammer, my arms almost too weak, shaking almost as much as the dog. I raised it slowly, waiting, waiting for father to say it, to say, Enough! You've proved yourself! The words never came. Break or burn! 
he said, and with a scream I let the hammer swing. Just as his leg broke with a loud snap. For a heartbeat there was no other sound. The limb looked wrong, upper and lower parts at sick-making angles, white bone in the slather of red blood and black fur. Then came the howling, the snarling fury, the straining at his bonds, as he looked for something to fight, some battle to keep away the pain. One more, Jorg, father said. He spoke softly, but I heard him above the howls. For the longest moment his words made no sense to me. I said no, but I didn't make him reach for the torch. If I made him reach again, he wouldn't draw back. I knew that much. This time, Justice understood the raising of the hammer. He whimpered, whined, begged as only dogs can beg. I swung hard and missed, blinded with tears. The cart rattled, and Justice jumped and howled, bleeding from all his shackles now, the broken leg stretching with tendons exposed. I hit him on my second stroke and shattered his other foreleg. Vomit took me by surprise, hot, sour, spurting from my mouth. I crawled in it, gagging and gasping, almost not hearing father's, One more. With his third leg smashed, Justice couldn't stand. He flopped, broken in the cart, stinking in his own mess. Strangely, he didn't snarl or whine now. Instead, as I lay racked with sobs, heaving in the air in gulps, he nuzzled me as he used to nuzzle William when he cried with a grazed knee or thwarted ambition. That's how stupid dogs are, my brothers, and that's how stupid I was at six, letting weakness take hold of me, giving the world a lever with which to bend whatever iron lies in my soul. One more, father said. He has a leg left to stand on, does he not, Sir Riley? And for once, Sir Riley would not answer his king. One more, Jorg. I looked at Justice, broken, and licking the tears and snot from my hand. No! And with that, Father took the torch and tossed it into the cart. I rolled back from the sudden bloom of flame. Whatever my heart told me to do, my body remembered the lesson of the poker and would not let me stay. The howling from the cart made all that had gone before seem as nothing. I call it howling, but it was screaming. Man, dog, horse, with enough hurt, we all sound the same. In that moment, rolling clear, even though I was six and my hands were unclever, I took the hammer that had seemed so heavy and threw it without effort, hard and straight. If my father had moved but a little more slowly, I might be king of two lands now. Instead, it touched his crown, just enough to turn it a quarter circle, then hit the wall behind his chair and fell to the ground, leaving a shallow scar on the builder stone. Father was right, of course. There were lessons to be learned that night. The dog was a weakness, and the hundred war cannot be won by a man with such weaknesses. Nor can it be won by a man who yields to the lesser evil. Give an inch, give any single man any single inch, and the next thing you hear will be, One more, Jorg, one more. And in the end, what you love will burn. Father's lesson was a true one, but knowing that can't make me forgive the means by which he taught it. For a time there on the road, I followed Father's teaching, strength in all things, no quarter. On the road, I had known with the utter conviction of a child that the Empire throne would be mine, only if I kept true to the hard lessons of justice and the thorns. Weakness is a contagion. One breath of it can corrupt a man whole and entire. Now, though, even with all the evil in me, I don't know if I could teach such lessons to a son of mine. William never needed such teaching. He had iron in him from the start, always the more clever, the more sure, the fiercest of us, despite my two extra years. He said I should have thrown the hammer as soon as I lifted it, and should not have missed. I would be king then, and we would still have our dog. Two days later I stole away from both nurse and guard, and found my way to the rubbish pits behind the table night's stable. A north wind carried the last of winter, laced with rain that was almost ice. I found my dog's remains, a reeking mess, black, dripping, limp but heavy. I had to drag him, but I had told William I would bury him, not leave him to rot on the pile. I dragged him two miles in the freezing rain along the Roma Road, empty save for a merchant with his wagon lashed close and his head down. I took justice to the girl with the dog, and I buried him there beside her, in the mud, my hands numb, and the rest of me wishing I were numb. Hello, Jorg, Catherine said, and then nothing. Nothing? 
If I could remember all that, if I could remember that dark path to the cemetery of Père Chaise, and live with it these many years, what in hell lay in that box, and how could I ever want it back? Many men do not look their part. Wisdom may wait behind a foolish smile. Bravery can gaze from eyes that cry fright. Brother Reich, however, is that rarest of creatures, a man whose face tells the whole story, blunt features beneath a heavy brow, the ugly puckering of old scar tissue, small black eyes that watch the world with impersonal malice, dark hair, short and thick with dirt, bristling across the thickest of skulls. And had God given him a smaller frame, in place of a giant's, packed with unreasonable helpings of muscle, weakness in place of an ox team stamina, still Reich would be the meanest dwarf in Christendom. Chapter 11 Wedding Day Mountains are a great leveler. They don't care who you are or how many. Some have it that the builders made the Matarax, drinking the red blood of the earth to steal its power, and that the peaks were thrown up when the rocks themselves revolted and shrugged the builders off. Gomps tells it that the Lord God set the mountains here, ripples in the wet clay as he formed the world with both hands. Whoever it was that did the work, they have my thanks. It's the Matarax that put the high into the Renar Highlands. They march on east to west, wrinkling the map through other kingdoms. But it's in the Highlands that they do their best work. Here, it's the Matarax that say where you can and can't go. It's been said once or twice that I have a stubborn streak. In any case, I have never subscribed to the idea that a king can be told where he can't go in his own kingdom. And so in the years since arriving as a callow youth, in between learning the sword song, mastering the art of shaving, and dispensing justice with a sharp edge, I took to mountain climbing. Climbing, it turned out, was as new to the people of the highlands as it was to me. They knew all about getting up to places they needed to be. High pastures for the wool goats, the summer passes for trade, the eiger cliff for hunting opals. But about getting to places they didn't need to go, well... Who has time for that, when their belly grumbles, or there's money to be made? What in hell are you doing, Jorg? Codin asked me once, when I came back bloody, with my wrist grinding bone at every move. You should come out with me, I told him, just to see him wince. I climb alone. In truth, there's never room for two on a mountain top. I'll rephrase, said Codin. I could see the grey starting in his hair, threads of it as his temples. Why are you doing it? I pursed my lips at that, then grinned at the answer. The mountains told me I couldn't. "'You're familiar with King Canute?' he asked. "'It's not a path I advise for you, since you pay me for advising these days.' "'Heh. Huh. I wondered if Catherine would climb mountains. I thought she would, given half a chance. "'I've seen the sea, Codin. The sea can eat mountains whole. I might have the occasional difference of opinion with the odd mountain or two, but if you catch me challenging the ocean—' You have my permission to drop an ox on me. I told Codin that stubbornness led me to climb, and perhaps it did, but there's more to it. Mountains have no memory, no judgments to offer. There's a purity in the struggle to reach a peak. You leave your world behind and take only what you need. For a creature like me, there's nothing closer to redemption. Attack, Miana had said, and surely a man shouldn't refuse his wife on their wedding day. Of course it helped that I had planned to attack all along. I led the way myself, for the sally ports and the tunnels that lead to them are known to few. Or rather many know of them, but, like an honest priest, few would be able to show you one. We walked four abreast, the tallest men hunched to save scraping their heads on rough-hewn stone. Every tenth man held a pitch torch, and at the back of our column they almost choked on the smoke. My own torch showed little more than the ten yards of tunnel ahead twisting to take advantage of natural voids and fissures. The tramp, tramp of many feet, at first hypnotic, faded to background noise. Unnoticed until without warning, it stopped. I turned, and flames showed nothing but my swinging shadow. Not a man of my command, not a whisper of them. What is it that you think you're doing here, Jorg? The dream which his words flowed around me, a river of soft cadence, carrying only hints of his Saracen heritage. I watch you from one moment to the next. Your plans are known 
before you so much as unfold them. Then you'll know what it is I think I'm doing here, Sages. I cast about for a sign of him. You know we joke about you, Jorg, Sages asked. The pawn who thinks he's playing his own game. Even Ferrakind laughs about it behind the fire. And Kellum, still preserved in his salt mines. Lady Blue has you on her sapphire board. Skilfar sees your future patterned on the ice. At the Mathema, they factor you into their equations. A small term approximated to nothing. In the shadows behind thrones, you count for little, Jorg. They laugh at how you serve me, and know it not. The silent sister only smiles when your name is spoken. I'm pleased to be of some service, then. To my left, the shadows on the wall moved with reluctance, slow to respond to the swing of my torch. I stepped forward and thrust the flames into the darkest spot, scraping embers over the stone. This is your last day, Jorg. Sages hissed as flame ate shadow and darkness peeled from stone like layers of skin. It pleased me no end to hear his pain. I'll watch you die. And he was gone. Makin nearly walked into me from behind. Problem? I shook off the daydream's tatters and picked up my pace. No problems. Sages liked to pull the string so gently that a man would never suspect himself steered. To make Sages angry, to make him hate, only eroded the subtle powers he used. My first victory of the day, and if he felt the need to taunt me, then I must have worried him somehow. He must have thought I had some kind of chance, which made him a hell of a lot more optimistic than I was. No problems. In fact, the morning is just starting to look up. Another fifty yards, and a stair took us onto the slopes, via a crawl space beneath a vast rock known as Old Bill. When you leave the haunt, you're immediately among mountains. They dwarf you in a way that high walls and tall towers cannot. In the midst of the heave and thrust of the Matarax, all of us, the haunt itself, even the Prince of Arrows' twenty thousands, were as nothing. Ants fighting on the carcass of an elephant. Out on the slopes in the coldness of the wind, with the mountains high and silent on all sides, it felt good to be alive. And if it had to be, it was a good day to die. Have Martin take his troops and hold the runyard for me, I said. The runyard? Makin said, wrapping his cloak tight against the wind. You want our best captain to secure a dead-end valley? We need those men, Jorg, Codin said, straightening from his crawl. We can't spare ten soldiers, let alone a hundred of our best. Even as he argued, he beckoned a man to carry my orders. You don't think he can hold it? I asked. And that set Makin running in a new direction. Hold it! He'd hold the gates of heaven for you, that man. Or oh, hell, Lord knows why. I shrugged. Martin would hold because I'd given him what he called salvation. A second chance to stand, to protect his family. For four years he'd studied nothing but war, from arrow to army. The four years since he came to the castle with Sarah at his side. In the end, he would hold, because years ago in the ruins of his farm, I had given his little girl a wind-up clown and Makin's clove spice. A builder toy to make her smile, and the clove spice to take her pain. And her life. The drug stole her away, rather than the waste, and she died smiling at sweet dreams, instead of choking on her own blood. Why the runyard? Codin wanted to know. Codin couldn't be put off the scent so easily. The Prince of Arrow doesn't have assassins in my castle, Codin, but he has spies. I tell you what you need to know, what will make a difference to your actions. The rest, the long shots, the hunches, it's safe to keep locked away. I tapped the side of my head. For a moment, though, the copper box burned against my hip, and its thorn pattern filled my vision. I'd be happier on a horse, Makin said. I'd be happier on a giant mountain goat, I said. One that shat diamonds. Until we find some. We're walking. Three hundred men walked behind us. Armies are wont to march, but marching in the highlands is a short trip to a broken ankle. Three hundred men of the watch in mountain grey, exiting the sally port amid the boulder field west of the haunt where the tunnel rose through the bedrock. No crimson tabards here, or gold braiding, no rampant lions or displayed dragons, or crowned fecking frogs. Just tatter robes in rock shades. I hadn't come out for a uniform competition. I came out to win. Behind us, rockets took flight. 
lacing the dull morning with trails of sparks, and leaving a loose pall of sulphurous smoke above the castle. Wedding celebrations to amuse the Highlanders, but also a convenient draw for the eyes to the north of us, the uninvited guests. The Prince's army had started to move, units massed in their attack formations. Normandy pikemen to the fore, rank upon rank of archers on the far side, men of Belpan, with their longbows near tall as them, crossbow units out of Ken, beards braided, brown pennants fluttering above the drummers, each man with a shield boy hurrying before him. The archers stood ready to peel off and find their places on the ridges to our east, the useless Orlanth cavalry at the rear. Their day would come later, after wintering in the ruins of my home, after the high passes cleared, and the prince moved on to increase his tally of fallen kingdoms. The Thurtons next, no doubt, and on to Germania and the dozen Teuton realms. We came down the slopes west of the haunt in a grey wave. Swords, daggers, short bows. I'd spent most of dear uncle's gold on those bows. The men of the forest watch knew the short bow, and the highland recruits learned it fast enough. Three hundred recurved composite short bows. Scythian made. Ten gold apiece. I could have sat every man on a half-decent nag for that. The prince's scouts saw us. They had never been in doubt. A sharp-eyed observer on their front lines might have seen us across the mile or so that remained. But why would they be looking? They had scouts. I picked up the pace. There's nothing like mountains for making you fit to run. At first, when you come to the mountains, everything is hard. Even the air feels too thin to breathe. Years pass, and your muscles become iron. Especially if you climb. We moved quickly. Speed on the slopes is an art. The Prince of Arrow wasn't stupid. The commanders he had picked had chosen officers who had selected scouts who knew mountains. They moved fast. But the few men that fell didn't get up again before we caught them. It's always nice to surprise someone. The Prince of Arrow hadn't expected me to charge his tens of thousands with my three hundred. That's probably why we were able to arrive only seconds behind the first word of our advance, and long before that word could be acted on. Three hundred is a magic number. King Leonidas held back a Persian ocean at the hot gates with just three hundred. I would have liked to meet the Spartans. That story has outlived empires by the score. King Leonidas held back an ocean, and Canute did not. I could feel the burn in my legs, the cool breath hauled in and the hot breath out. Sweat inside my armor, a river of it under the breastplate. Hard leathers, these, cured and boiled in oil padded linen underneath, no plate or chain today. Today we needed to move. When I gave the shout, we stopped on the rock field, scattered on the slope, two hundred yards from their lines no more, close enough to smell them. On this flank, far from the archers bound for the ridge, men of arrow formed the largest contingent, units of spearmen in light ring mail, swordsmen in heavier chain, among them the landed knights who had levied the soldiers from farm and village, or emptied their castle guard in service of their prince. And all of them, at least the ones we could see before the roll of the mountains hid the vast expanse of their advance, marched without haste, confident, some joking, watching the sparks and smoke above the haunt. The great siege engines creaked amongst them, drawn by many mules. I didn't need to tell the watch. They started to lose their shafts immediately. The first screams carried the message of our attack far more effectively than scouts still hunting for their breath, aiming at the thickest knots of men made it hard not to find flesh. We managed a second volley before the first of the enemy started to charge. The prince's archers, massed on the far side of the army column, a quarter mile off and more, could make no reply. Know thyself, Pythagoras said, but he was a man of numbers, and you can't count on those. Sun Tzu tells us, Know thy enemies. I had lost men I could ill afford patrolling these slopes, but I knew my enemy, and I knew the disposition of his forces. The prince's archers would have found us hard targets in any case, loose amongst the rocks and the long morning shadows. Another volley, and another. Hundreds killed or wounded with each flight. Wounded is good. Sometimes wounded is better than dead. The wounded cause trouble, if you let them. The foot soldiers came at us in ones and twos, then handfuls, and behind that a flood, like a wave breaking and racing across sand. Pick your targets, I shouted. Another volley. A single man amongst the forerunners fell, skewered through his thigh. Damn it! Pick your targets! Another volley, and none of the runners fell. The dying happened back in the masses, still milling in confusion, caught in the press of bodies. 
one of mine for every twenty of theirs. Stiff odds. If we'd managed ten volleys before they reached us, we might have slain three thousand men. We managed six. Chapter 12 Wedding Day Be ready to run! I shouted. That's your plan, Jorg? Macon's face could take surprise to a whole new level. Something in the eyebrows did it. Be ready, I repeated. In truth, if I had a plan, I held no more than a thread of it, teasing it out inch by inch. And the thread I held told me, be ready to run. Soon Tsu instructs, if in all respects your foe exceeds you, be ready to elude him. If that were the fucking plan, said Macon, shouldering his bow, we should have started two weeks ago. The first of Arrow's soldiers reached me, purple-faced from the race up the mountain. Catherine Apscoran fills my nights. More than is healthy, and all of those dreams are dark. Chella walks in some of them, stepping direct from the necromancer's halls beneath Mount Honus, wicked and delicious. Her smile says she knows me to my rotten core, and Catherine's face will writhe across hers as firm flesh turns to corrupt undulation. The dead child will wander in and out of many dreams, holding the thorn-patterned box in crimson hands. He takes different names, William most often, though he's not the brother I knew, but he follows Catherine whenever I call her to my bed, fresh killed in some, the blood still running, and in others, grey with rot. The telling of dreams is a dull business, but experiencing a stranger's dream at first hand may be another matter. Crafting nightmares as weapons or shackles, and setting them loose to hunt your victims, could very well be entertaining. It seems to keep a certain dream witch busy. My father thought Sages to be his creature. Perhaps he thinks he sent the witch away after I broke his power in the tall castle. And maybe the Prince of Arrow now thinks he owns Sages' services. Like Corian, though, and the Silent Sister, and others scattered across the Empire, Sages sees himself as a player behind the thrones, pushing kings and counts, earls and princes across the board. I have never liked to be pushed. The Prince of Arrow also struck me as a man who would prove hard for the Dream Witch to move. But we will see. Sages learned twice over not to send his creatures out to snare me in my sleep. I think each failure takes something vital from him. Certainly, he did not persist. The child is not his creation. I would know if it were. The heathen watches, though. He stands on the edge of my dreaming, silent, hoping not to be seen. I've chased him to the edge of waking, and fallen from my bed choking the pillow. Once my sleeping hand found a dagger, feathers everywhere. He seeks to steer me with the most gentle of prods. Even a soft touch, if it's made sufficiently far ahead of the crucial event, can have a great impact. Sager seeks to steer me, to steer us all, his fingers swift and light as spiders, pulling delicate threads, until the power he wants is delivered into his lap, as if by accident. Tutor Lundist said Sun Tsu should be my guide in war. My father may have executed Lundist a week after I fled the tall castle, but what the tutor taught will stay with me longer than any lesson Oladan Ankrath inflicted on his son. All war is deception. Sun Tzu tells me on pages yellow as jaundice, dry as sand. All war is deception, but where are my chances to deceive? I have spies in my halls, watchers in my dreams. The graves are fine and private place, they say, but I suspect even there secrets can be hard to hold in these broken days. And so I use what I have a copper box that holds memories, one that stores a memory so terrible I couldn't keep it in me. I have the box and I use it. Long ago I learned that pressed to the forehead, hard enough to leave its thorn print marked upon the skin, it'll steal a memory, a thought, a plan, whatever is foremost in your thinking. The plan is lost, but safe from Sagus' kind, and all that remains is the recollection that you had a good idea, and the memory of where to find it again when needed. Hold the box tight in your hand, and you can feel the dark edges of horror inside, cutting, burning. The pain leaks out, robbed of its context, raw and cold, and with it, if you're clever, if the fingers of your mind are deft, you can draw the thread of a previously stored stratagem from a place beyond all spies. And if you can surprise your enemy, then surprising yourself is a small price to pay. Chapter 13 Wedding Day The first man I killed in my eighteenth year had done most of the job for me. 
running two hundred yards up a steep and rocky slope in chain armor, is hard work. The soldier looked about ready to keel over, like the old woman in the market who never got up after seeing Gorgoth for the first and last time. I let him run onto my sword, and that was the end of it. The next man went pretty much the same way, only I had to be a little faster and thrust at him rather than just let him impale himself. In battle, the thrust is a much cleaner death than the cut. Unless, of course, it's the guts where you get it, and then you're going to have a long, hard time of it before the rot sets in and carries you off screaming days later. The third man, tall and bearded, took the two bodies at my feet as a hint, and slowed down to face me. He should have waited for his friends behind him on the slope, but instead he came in swinging his broadsword, still huffing and puffing from his run. I stepped back to avoid the sweep of his blade, then swung my own and took his throat. He turned. Spraying arterial blood over the friends he should have waited for, then tripped and fell amongst the rocks. Until you've seen it, you won't believe how far blood will spurt from the right cut. It's a wonder we don't feel that pressure inside us all the time. A wonder that we don't just explode sometimes. I should have turned and run at that point. It was the plan after all, my plan, and the men of the watch were already in full retreat behind me. Instead, I advanced, moving quickly between the two blood-spattered soldiers. Who leapt out of Beardy's way as he fell? I made a figure eight cut, lashing out from one side to the other, and both of them fell. Their mail torn, a shattered collarbone on the right, sliced chest muscle on the left. It shouldn't have taken them both down, but it did, and I felt that four years' hard practice with the blade hadn't been entirely wasted. Both men were flopping on the ground, calling out about their wounds as I cut the sixth down. Another staggerer, exhausted from his charge. That done. I turned and fled, outpacing the pursuit and working hard to catch the watch. The men of Arrow were never going to outrun us, but they could hardly stop the chase and let us come back to practice our archery again. So they kept at it. The captains driving them were making the right choices, given what they had to work with. What they should have done, however, was to withdraw to the main force and rely on their commander's battle sense to deploy his archers as a defence against us. Though perhaps the Prince of Arrow was happy enough sending a few thousand soldiers up the mountain to contain the threat and to keep his army focused on the Horned, I caught Makin up a few minutes later, threading my path past Watchmen with less go in their legs than I had that day. Watchmaster Hobbs ran with him, his captains beside him, Harold, Stodd, and Old Capen, who'd made the wise choice and refused to jump for a previous Watchmaster back at Rulo Falls years ago. I say the Watchmaster ran. But at that point, brisk walk would cover it. Set four squads on those ridges, I said. Let's shoot a few more arrows. And when the enemy reaches them, Hobbs asked. Time to run again, I said. At least they'll get a rest, Keppen said, and spat a wad of phlegm on the rock. You'll get one too, old man, I grinned. It's your squads I'm thinking should stay. I should have jumped, he muttered. He shook his head and raised his short bow high. Its red marker ribbon snapping in the wind, his men started to converge behind him as he jogged off toward the ridges. Running's all very well, Hobbs said, striding on, but we'll run out of mountain in the end, or be chased out of the highlands entirely. Which sounds like, Makin heaved in a breath, the best option when all's said and done. Of all of them, he looked the worst off. Too many years letting a horse do the running. He clambered up a large boulder and stood on top, looking back down the valley. Must be three thousand of the bastards after us, maybe four. Likes to keep the odds in his favour, does the prince? Hobbs said. He scratched his head, where the grey grew thickest and the hair thinned. I hope you've got a hell of a plan, King Jorg. I hope so too. If not for Norwood and Gelleth, these watchmen would have fled an age ago. How quickly fact turns into fiction, and strangely, when fact becomes legend, folk seem more ready to believe it. And maybe they were right to have faith, for I did reduce the Lord of Gelleth, his mighty castle, and his armies all to dust. Maybe they were right, and I was wrong, but I found it hard to believe in whatever tricks I might have stowed in my small copper box. Believe it or not, the box was all I had, so I pressed it to my forehead hard, as if I could push the memory I needed through the bone. The feeling is like that misremembered name appearing without preamble on your tongue, ready to be spoken. After so long dancing beyond reach on its tip, except that instead of one word, there are many images with them and touches and tastes. A piece of your life returned to you. The memory flooded me, 
taking me from the cold slopes, back across years. Gone the crowded watchmen, gone the shouting and the screams. I lunged for the next hold, throwing my body after my arm and hand, loosing the last hold before my fingers had found a grip on the next, before I lost momentum. Climbing is a form of faith. There's no holding back, no reserve. My fingers jammed into the crack, the sharp edge biting, toes scrambling on rough rock, the soft leather finding traction as I started to slip. There's a spire of stone in the matarax that points at the sky, as though it were God's own index finger. How it came to be, who carved it from the fastness of the mountains, I can't say. One book I own speaks of wind and rivers and ice sculpting the world in the misty long ago. But that sounds like a story for children, and a dull one at that. Better to talk to wind demons, river gods, and ice giants out of Jotunheim. It's a more interesting tale, and just as likely. Arm aching, leg straining, curved in an awkward pose across the fractured stone, I gasped for air, stealing a cold lungful from the wind. They say don't look down, but I like to. I like to see the loose pieces fall away and become lost in the distance. My muscles burned, the heat stolen by the wind. It felt as though I were trapped between ice and fire. The spire stands clear of a vast spur, where one of the mountain's roots divides two deep valleys. From the scree slopes at the spire's base to the flat top of it, where a small cottage might squeeze, there are four hundred feet of shattered rock, vertical in the main, in places leaning out. A hundred feet below, I could see the ledge where I had met the goat. The heights a mountain goat will scale for the possibility of a green mouthful never cease to amaze me. They must use their own kind of magic to climb, without the cleverness of fingers or toes. I'd pulled myself up and come eyeball to eyeball with the beast, its long face framed by two curling horns. There's something alien in a goat's eye, something not seen in dog or horse or bird. It's the rectangular pupil, as if they've climbed out of hell or fallen from the moon. We sat together in mutual distrust while I caught my breath and waited for life to find its way back into limbs and extremities. I found the rock pillar in my first year as King of Renar, and in all my time on the throne it was perhaps that spare needle of mountain that came closest to killing me. I failed to climb it seven times, and I'm not a man who gives up any attempt easily. Codin once asked me why I climb, and I spun him some pretty lies. The truth, at least for today, is that back when I hadn't many years on me, my mother would play for William and me on an instrument from the vaults of the tall castle. A piano. A thing of magic, and many keys in black and white. We were trouble, Will and I, it has to be said. Fighting, scheming, digging out mischief of any kind that might be had. But when she played, we fell silent and just listened. I remember every moment, her long fingers moving on the keys so fast they blurred together. The sway of her body, her hair hanging in a single long plate between her shoulders. The light falling across the wooden body of the instrument. But I can't hear it. She plays behind glass walled behind too many years, lost when I walked away from it all, from her, from that damned carriage and the thorns. I see, but I can't hear. When I climb, and only then, on the very edge of everything, I catch stray notes, like words robbed of meaning on the cusp of hearing. The music almost reaches me, and for that I would dare any height. I made an eighth assault on the spire at the start of the summer, in which the Prince of Arrow crossed my borders with his armies new laden with loot from conquests in Normandy and Orlanth. Loot, and it must be said, recruits, for the lords of those lands were not well loved, and the prince won the people's hearts almost before their dead were boxed and buried. Climbing is about commitment. On the spire there are places so sheer that one hold must be wholly relinquished before the next can be obtained. And sometimes then only by hurling yourself up on an open expanse of rock that offers no purchase. In such moments you're falling, albeit upwards, and if the next hold escapes you, then that fall will carry you to the ground. There are no half measures in such a sense. You place everything you are or will be on each decision. Lives can be lived in this manner, but I do not recommend it. In the end, though, everybody dies, but not everybody lives. The climber, though he may die young, will have lived. There comes a point on a long climb when you know you have to surrender or die. There's no quarter given. I hung to cold stone fifty feet beneath the summit, weak as a child, aching with hunger, blistered hands and feet, arms screaming. 
The art of survival in the mountains is knowing when to give up. The art of reaching the top is knowing when not to. If I die here, I whispered to the stone, if I fall and die, I will count it a life lived. Maybe not well, but fully. No book will know my end, but I will have died in battle nonetheless. And summoning my strength, I started to climb again. Like the Scots king and his famous spider, my eighth attempt proved the charm. Retching, slobbering on the rock, I crawled over the final corner, horizontal at long last. I lay trembling, gasping, half sobbing, as close to the end of my endurance as I had ever come. When you're climbing, you take nothing with you that you do not absolutely need. That's a good discipline to acquire, and the mountains teach it to you for free. They say that time is a great teacher, but unfortunately it kills all its pupils. The mountains are also great teachers, and better still, they let the occasional star pupil live. The mountains teach you to be prepared for change. Amongst the peaks, the weather can shift from fair to foul, quick as blinking. One moment you might be clambering up a forgiving slope, and the next you could be clinging to it as though it were your mother, whilst an east wind tries to carry your frozen corpse off with it. Climbing God's finger, I learned a lot about holding on by my fingertips. By the time I finally hauled myself weak and trembling onto the very top of the spire, I'd come to realize that I'd been holding on by my fingertips my entire life. I flopped to my back. I lay there on the rock with nothing to see between me and a relentless blue sky. I had climbed light, taking nothing unneeded with me. No room on that narrow peak for anyone else, ghosts or otherwise. No Catherine, no William, my mother and father four hundred feet below. Too far away to hear. Not even the shadow of a child on the rock or the glimmer of a copper box in memory. It isn't the danger or the challenge that keeps me climbing. It's the purity and focus. When you're a five-second drop from being a smear of guts and pulverized bone, when your whole weight is on eight fingers, then seven, then five, your choices are black and white, made on instinct, without baggage. When you climb hard and reach an impossible peak or ledge, you gain a new perspective. You see the world differently. It's not just the angle you're looking from that changes. You change, too. They say you can't go back, and I learned that when I returned to the tall castle after four years on the road. I walked the same halls, saw the same people, but I hadn't gone back. I'd come to a new castle, seen with new eyes. The same is true if you climb high enough. Only with climbing, you don't need to stay away for years. Climb a mountain, see the world from its highest point, and a new man will climb down to a world of subtle differences the next day. Metaphysics aside, there's plenty to be seen from a high point in the mountains. If you sit with your legs dangling over the biggest drop in the world, with the wind streaming your hair behind you, and your shadow falling so far it might never hit the ground, you notice new things. On the road, we have our sayings. Pax, we say, if we're caught with our hands in another man's saddlebags. Visiting the locals, we say, when a brother is off about dark business after a battle. Where's Brother Reich? Visiting the locals. In the Renar Highlands, there's a saying that I didn't hear until I struggled up to the village of Gutting, with Sir Macon in tow. E was taking a rock for a walk, your worship. At the time, I paid it no attention. A bit of local colour, a streak of green in the manure. I heard the expression a few more times in the years that followed, generally when somebody was off on mysterious business. Taking a rock for a walk. Once you've noticed a phrase or word, it starts to crop up everywhere. Lost his flock was another one. I'd hear these things on the parade ground in Maine, from the local recruits. That John of Bryn had my bowstrings while I was on wall watch. What are you going to do about that? Don't you worry none, already happened. Lost his flock, he did. Up in a high place, especially one hard reached, you gain a fresh perspective. Looking out over the peaks and cliffs and slopes, I'd come to know, I noticed something new. The shadows gave it away, leading the eye here and there to places where the land didn't lie quite right. It took a time of empty watching, of idle legs dangling, and thought stuff swirling behind my eyes. Before, like the snow in the globe, everything settled, and I saw clear. The same scene, but with new detail. High on the sides of almost every valley, of all but the highest gorges, the loose rocks gathered too thickly, perched too precariously. At first the eye buys into the deception. It has to be natural. To move that much stone would take a thousand lifetimes. And to what end? Taking a rock for a walk turns out to be a genuine national pastime in the highlands, so deep-grained, so known, that nobody seems to feel the need to say more. 
For generations, the men going up to tend their goats have filled any idle moment with the business of carrying loose stones from one part of the slope to another higher part, slowly building up the same piles that their father and grandfather built upon. If a Renal man takes the ultimate liberty and decides to graze his goats on another man's land, chances are that there'll be a sudden rock slide, and the man will have lost his flock. If it weren't a Renal man, then he might lose even more than that. It's hard to tease out a thread when you're running, especially when that thread is a plan and you're teasing it from a memory box, and you're running uphill with thousands of soldiers in pursuit. But even our enemies call the Ancraths cunning, and I call us clever. So I pulled a little more, and all of a sudden, I saw the slopes we were running up with a whole new perspective, or rather, an older one that I had forgotten. From the Journal of Catherine Apscoran, October 25th, Year 98, Interregnum, Ancrath, the Tall Castle, in my rooms again. I'm always in my rooms. I had that dream again, the one with Jorg. I have the knife as always, twelve inches and thin as a finger. He's standing there with his arms open, and he's laughing at me, laughing. I'm standing there in my torn dress with the knife, and him laughing, and I thrust it into him like he thrust. And I stab it into him, and old Hannah watches and she smiles. But her smile isn't right, and when Jog falls, there are bruises on him too, on his neck, long dark bruises, and I can almost see the fingers and the thumbprint. I'm running this torn satin through my fingers, and it's me that feels torn. My memories fight my dreams every single day, and I don't know who's winning and who's losing. I don't remember. November seventh, year ninety-eight, Interregnum, Ancrath, the tall castle, bell tower, keep top. I found a place to be alone, the tallest point on the tall castle, just me and the crows and the wind. The tower holds only one bell, huge and made of iron. They never ring it. At least now it's serving a purpose by sheltering me from the wind. I find myself wanting to be alone. All the ladies grate on me, even the ones that mean well. There's no peace in the castle. Only the feeling that something is wrong, something I can't name or touch. I found initials up here, H J A. You can see them out on the far side of the tower, where it leans over the outer wall of the keep. I can see no way to reach the spot. It says something about Honorus Jorg Ancreth that even his name is out of reach. Sages came to my chamber today, just to the door. The Prince of Arrow has come again. The Prince and his brother Orin and Egan. Sarath said they would come back. She said they would come back to sniff around me again. That's just how she said it, as if they were dogs and I was a bitch in heat. I don't think I am, in heat that is. I can be a bitch. I can be a bitch every day. I made Mary Codin cry today, and I hardly meant to. Even so, there's something about Orin and something else about Egan. Grandmother would say they both burn too bright, too bright for regular folks, she'd say. But I've never counted myself regular, and if they do burn bright. They do put heat in me, or me in heat. What of it? I fancy I put some heat in them. Or why would they both be back at the tall castle a moon after their first visit? I don't think it's for the pleasure of King Oliden's company. I don't think Orin's charm or Egan's threat had much impact on that scary old man. I don't think the devil would make Oliden pause. I don't think he'd bow his head even if God Himself sent an angel to his doors. Sarah says both the arrows are pointed my way. She has a dirty mouth. She says they'll both ask for my hand, even though I'm not Scorin's first daughter and father promised alliance and land to Oliden already. She says they'll both ask for my hand, but it's not my hand they're interested in, or my dowry. She said more, but her mouth is dirtier than my quill, black with ink though it is. And if they did ask, what would I say? It hardly seems that they can be brothers. One as bright and good as my Sir Galen, the other as dark and tempting as Jorg who killed him. I dreamed again last night. I woke up speaking the words of that dream, and now I can't even remember the shape of it. I can remember a knife, a long knife. I know I need to use it. I remember Jorg hurt me. I should go back and read my journal, but somehow my hands don't want to turn the pages back, only forward. I had a dream about that too. Sages is at the door again. The princes are waiting. I don't like that man's eyes. Gorgoth is like no other. There's no mould for the Lucrotta. Twisted by the builders' poisons, they fall broken from the womb and follow strange paths as they grow. 
The ribs that pierce his flesh and reach from each side are black and thick, his hide more red than blood, and the muscle beneath surges as he moves. And though he's shaped for war and for horror, there are few men in Adam's image whose approval would mean as much to me, and most of them lie dead. Chapter 14 Four Years Earlier A day after we left the sands of Thar and started to ride through the Thurton grasslands, I took the box from Macon. I felt the sharp edges of the lost memory through the copper walls, and sensed the poison held there. Makin once told me that a man who's got no fear is missing a friend. With the thorn-patterned copper clutched uneasy in my fist, I thought perhaps I had found that friend at last. I turned it one way, then the other. It held nothing good, only me. And a man should be a little scared of himself, surely. Of what he might do. To know thyself must be terribly dull. I put the box at the bottom of my saddlebag and left it unopened. I didn't ask after Catherine. I took a new knife from Grumlow and rode toward our business in Heimrift. We rode north across wide acres, where the wind whipped the spring grass into a thrashing sea, and green ripples raced one after the other. A land made for horse, for galloping, for chasing between the dark borders of one forest and the next. I let Brath have his head, and exhausted both of us, as if all hell were at our heels. The brothers kept pace as best they could, all of us wanting to leave Thar many miles behind. Old fires still burned there, unseen. In a thousand years, Mount Honus, the place where I lit a builder's son, might be like Thar, a promised land that would return to man in time, but for the now, loved us not. That night, as we settled to sleep, I saw the baby for the first time, lying dead in the long grass by our camp. I threw off my blanket and walked across to it, watched by Gorgoth and by Gog, who slept beside him now. The spot where the child had lain was empty. I caught a whiff of perfume, white musk maybe. With a shrug, I returned to my bed. Some things are best forgotten. We travelled the next day, and the next, along the banks of the river Rhyme, that flows between Thurton and its neighbours to the east. The Rhyme lands were once the Empire's garden, farmed with exquisite care. Push a nation's borders back and forth, across a garden a dozen times, and all that's left is mud and ruin. At one point we rode through a field of old stones, hundreds upon hundreds in marching lines, single blocks a little taller than a man, a little wider, all set on end, lichen-covered, knee-deep grass swaying around them. Ancient before the builders came, ancient before the Greeks, Lundis told me. An uncomfortable power throbbed between the monoliths and I led the brothers faster than was prudent to clear the field. On the fourth day, a soft rain wrapped us and fell without pause from dawn till dusk. I rode for a while beside Michael, rolling gently in the grey saddle. He always rode as if he were at sea, did Michael, slumping forward, rolling back, not an ounce of grace in him. "'Do you like dogs, Michael?' I asked him. "'Beef's better,' he said. "'Oh, mutton!' I set a grin on my face. "'Well, that's a new perspective.' I thought you might like them on account of their stupidity. Why I was baiting Michael, I had no idea. Part of me even liked Michael. Almost. I remembered a time when I came back to camp, having scouted out the town of Maberton, down on the soft edge of the Ken Marshes. I'd come up from the bog path, with Jared picking his way through the tufts and cotton grass. At first, I thought the shrieking was a village girl foolish enough to get snagged by the brothers. But it turned out just to be two of the lads bent over a tied dog poking it with something sharp to get a song out of it. I had slipped off Jared and grabbed them by the hair, one black handful, one red, and hauled back, throwing my weight into the motion. Both took to shouting, and one even reached for me in his anger. I sliced his palm open for him, nice and quick. "'You shouldn't have done that, Brother Jorg,' Gemp said, cradling his cut hand with the blood dripping free and fast. "'You shouldn't a—' Uh... "'No,' I had asked as the brothers started to gather around us. And where have I been, Brother Gempt? Whilst you hone your battle skills on this useless mutt. Job stood beside Gempt, rubbing at the spot I'd yanked his hair from. I looked pointedly at the dog, and he knelt to cut it free. You've been watching on that town, Gempt said, his face a hot red now. I've been scouting that town, Maberton, yes, I said so we could come at it with what your idiot brother has been known to call the Elephant of Surprise. And all I told you lot to do was lie low. 
Gempt had spat and used his left hand to hold close the cut on his right. Lie low, I said. Not wake the whole fecking marsh from tadpole to toad with a howling fecking dog. Besides, I said, making a slow turn to see the whole of my little band, everyone knows that tormenting a dumb dog is bad luck. You'd all know that if you weren't too damn stupid to read. Makin had been one of the first to join the show, and a big grin he had on him. I know my letters, he said, surprising not a few of the brothers. So which book is it that says that then, Brother Jorg? The big book of Go Fuck Yourself, I told him. So hurting dogs is bad luck now, is it? Still with that grin on him. It is near me, I had said. Blinking now, I found the rain still rolling down my face on a long trek beside the rhyme. I shook off the memory. Do you recall that dog your brother found before we hit Mabberton, Brother Michael? I asked. He wouldn't, of course. Michael recalled very little about anything. He looked at me, lips pursed, spitting out the rain. Putting the hurt on dogs is bad luck, he said. It was for your brother, I said. Had himself an accident the next day. Michael frowned, confused, and made a slow nod. Everyone knows not to put the hurt on your food, he said. It sours the meat. Another new perspective, Brother Michael, I sighed. I knew I kept you around for a reason. That dog came back the next morning, just before we hit Maverton, as if I was its friend or something. Wouldn't leave until I gave it a good kicking, a free lesson in how the world works, if you like. Michael just offered a vacant smile and kept on riding. Heimrift lies in the dukedom of Maladon, a land where the hungry seas washed up what little of the Danelands they couldn't swallow. From the Renar Highlands, it's a fair old trek by any standards, and given the tortuous routes we had to take, it would be a journey of weeks. On the road, you fall into routine. Mine involved a hard hour at sword with Sir Makin every evening before the light failed. I took to the art with new interest. A fresh challenge is often the way to keep from brooding on the past. I had seen the sword as a means of carrying death through a crowd. With the brothers, I often found myself amongst an unskilled foe, one more interested in running than fighting, and I used my blade for slaughter. I had met more skillful opponents, of course, soldiers sent to stop us, well-trained mercenaries set to guard merchants' wagons, and other bandits with their own brothers on the road, wanting what we had. When I saw Catherine's champion fight Sir Makin, and later when I set myself against the Prince of Arrow, I understood the difference between the workman and the artist. Of course, there's time to be an artist when you're not having to worry about a farmer sneaking up behind you and sticking a pitchfork through your neck whilst you're showing off your feints and parries. So I worked with Macon, day after day, building up the right kind of muscle, learning to feel the subtle differences through the blade, even when it's being pounded so hard, all you want to do is let go. And every time I got a bit better, he turned on the skill a little more. I started to hate him. Just a piece. When you swing a sword enough, put yourself through enough fights, there's a kind of rhythm you start to detect. Not the rhythm of your opponent, but a kind of necessary beat to the business of cut and thrust, as if your eyes read the very first hints of each action, and lay it out as music to dance to. I heard just whispers of the refrain, but every time I caught them, it made Makin pay sudden attention and start to sweat to hold me back. I heard only murmured phrases of the song, but just knowing it was there at all was enough to keep me striving. If you keep heading north and east from the Renar Highlands, then eventually you have to cross the River Rhyme. Given that the river is at least four hundred yards across, at all of the points where one might reach it without an invading army, the exercise of crossing it is one that normally requires a ferryman. There is one alternative, a bridge at the free town of Remagen. How any bridge could span such an expanse of water is a wonder, and one that I decided to see for myself rather than dicker with the owner of some rickety barge farther upstream. We closed on Remagen through the Kentro Hills, winding through endless narrow valleys, rock-choked gullies in the main, of the kind where horses are apt to go lame. The boredom of the trail never bothered me when we used to range mile after mile in search of mischief or loot, or hopefully both. Since far, though, I found the long silences a trial. My mind wandered along dark paths. I don't know how many ways there are to put Catherine together with a missing knife and a dead baby, but I think I must have considered most of them and at length. I knew where the answer lay, and kept finding that I didn't want to know it, at least not badly enough to open that box. 
Brother Michael's wisdom lies in knowing he's not clever and letting himself be led. The foolishness of mankind is that we do not do the same. Chapter 15 Four Years Earlier Gog had a bad dream in the dry canyons of the Kentro Hills. So bad a dream that it chased us out of there, tripping over our smoldering blankets as the fire gutted and spat around us. While we hunted the horses in the dark, stumbling over every rock and bush, the far end of the canyon glowed with a fierce red heat. "'Going to find us a crispy little monster when we go back up there?' Reich said, the fire picking out the raw bones of his face in demonic tones. "'Never burned himself before,' Grumlow said, tiny beside Reich. Ahead of us, closer than we wanted to get to the heat, closer than we could get to it, Gorgoth waited to return. His silhouette against the glow had a disturbingly arachnid shape to it, the splayed ribs like legs reaching from his sides. Young Sim came back, leading Brath and his own nag. "'Be more use on a winter trip!' He nodded toward the flames, shrugged, and led the horses off. Sim had a way with horses. He'd been a stable lad for some lord once upon a time. Spent time in a brothel, too, as a child. Earning, rather than spending. We made a new camp and waited to see what was left of our old one. When I went back with Gorgoth, the sky had started shading into pearl. The rocks creaked as they cooled, and I could feel the heat through the soles of my boots. Michael came with us. He seemed to like the Lucrotta. We found Gog sleeping peacefully in a blackened area that resembled a burned-out campfire. I shone the only lantern we had left on the boy and he screwed his eyes tighter before rolling over. "'Sorry to disturb,' I snorted, and sat down, standing up again sharpish with a scorched ass. "'He's changing,' Gorgoth said. I'd noticed it, too. The stippled red and black of his skin had taken on fiercer scarlet on grey tones, and a more flame-like form, as if the fire had somehow frozen into his hide. We slept, then, us back at the new camp, and Gorgoth with Gog in the ruins of the old. In the morning, they joined us, and Gog ran to the breakfast fire, as though it were a new thing he'd not seen before. The flames flushed scarlet as he approached, and the water in Rose Pot started to boil, even though it was fresh in from the stream. "'Can't you see them?' he asked, as Gorgoth pulled him back. "'No,' I said, following them away from the camp. "'And best you don't see them, either. We'll be meeting with a man who knows all about these things soon enough. Until then, just keep... cool.' I sat with them farther down the canyon. We played throw stones and cross sticks. It seems that when you're eight, you can shake anything off, at least for the short term. Gog laughed when he won, and smiled when he lost. I can't remember a time when I didn't play to win, but I didn't grate on him for his easy ways. When ambition gets its teeth into you, it's hard to know how to just enjoy what's in front of you. Good boy! Michael passed Gog the cross sticks he'd gathered back up, a small bundle in his calloused hand. Bad dreams. I frowned at that. Gorgoth rumbled. We were all slow to wake, I said. Could have ended badly. I remembered feeling the heat, the smell of char, and the slow struggle free of my own nightmares. Gorgoth and I found the answer in the same moment, but he spoke first. Sages! I nodded. Slow as the realization of just how stupid I'd been crept over me. Codin had been right. Many hands would seek to wield a weapon like Gog. Twice now, the dream which had turned that power against me. He might not be able to kill me with my own dreams, but he'd had a good try with Gog's. All the more reason to press on, I might have said. Third time's the charm. But there's no point tempting the fates, unless you've got a big enough sword to kill them too. After breaking fast, we rode on, closing now on Remagen. There's a small fort on a ridge not far from the river, as you come out of the Kentro Hills. It commands a view of the road approaching the town. We could see the rhyme as a bright ribbon behind the fort, and a hint of the bridge towers. Kent and Michael flanked me at the front of our band, and we approached the fort at a trot. Gog clutching my back, Gorgoth jogging close by. Makin and Reich rode behind, chuckling. Makin could even get a laugh out of Reich when he put his mind to it. Then Grumlow, then Sim, and Ro. I guess it could have been Gorgoth that spooked the fortman, though at that distance they couldn't have had a clear view of him. Either way... One moment I had Kent to my right and Michael to my left, and the next moment the grey had an empty saddle. I pulled breath in a tight circle and jumped down quicksmart even as the others rode past in confusion. 
It had to be a lucky shot. At the range between us and the fort walls, a good archer would be hard-pressed to hit a house using a longbow. But there it was, one feathered end hard against his neck, the sharp end red and dripping, and jutting a foot from the other side. Michael looked at me with unusual focus as I dropped to one knee beside him. Time to die, Brother Michael. I didn't want to lie to him. I took his hand. He watched me, holding my eyes, as the others wheeled their horses and started to shout. King Jorg, he said, only without sound, blood running from the corners of his mouth. He looked strange with his helmet off to one side, and a light in him, as if what had been broken all his life was fixed by a simple fall off his horse. He'd never called me King before, as if brother was all he could get hold of. Brother Michael, I said. I lost a lot of brothers, but not many, while I watched their eyes. The strength went from his hand. He coughed blood and went his way. What in hell? Makin jumped down from his horse. The glistening arrowhead kept my attention. A bead of blood hung from the point, a baby's reflection distorting across its curve. I saw a red knife and Catherine walking amongst the graves. Hello, Jorg, she had said. He dead? Kent joined me on his knees beside Michael. How? The arrow was plain enough but it didn't seem to answer the question. I stood and walked past Makin's horse, pulling the shield from over his saddlebags. I kept walking. A coldness crawled through me, tingling on my cheeks. I took the Nuban's bow from its place on Brath's back, checked its double load. Jorg! Kent clambered to his feet. I'm going in, I said. Nobody gets out alive. Is that understood? Any man follows me, I'll kill them. Without waiting for answer, I moved on. I walked a hundred yards before another arrow fell, sailing far to the left. The shot that killed Michael had to have been a freak, loosed with no real hope of hitting its target. I slung the Nuban's crossbow of my shoulder. Thin ties held the bolts in their channels. I could see four men on the battlements now, fifty yards on, and they loosed a volley. I raised the shield. One arrow hit it, the point just visible on my side. The others clattered on the rocks. It wasn't a big fort, more of a watch point. Thirty men would have filled it elbow to elbow, and it looked to have been many years since it was fully garrisoned. By the time I stood properly in range, the men on the walls had found their courage. A single warrior approached them at a steady walk, and he didn't look much above sixteen. Three more joined them behind the battlements, not soldiers, no uniform, just a ragtag bunch, more of them looking out through the portcullis. "'You're not going to let me in, then?' I called to them. "'How's your friend?' A fat one called from the wall. The others laughed. He's fine, I said. Something spooked his horse and he fell. He'll be up and about as soon as he gets his breath. I peered over my shield and pulled the arrow from it. Somebody want this back? I felt utterly calm, serene, and yet at the same time, with the sense of something rushing toward me like a squall racing across the grasslands beneath a darkening sky. Surely! One of the half-dozen behind the gate snorted, and started to turn the wheel, raising the portcullis notch by notch, while the chain ratcheted through its housings. The thick muscle on his arms gleamed white through the dirt as he strained. I saw two of those on the wall exchange glances. I don't think the arrow was all they planned to take from me. I started forward so that I would reach the gate just as it drew high enough for me to pass below without bending. The stink of the place after so many nights in the open made my eyes sting. The storm that had been racing toward me across some hidden wasteland in my mind hit as I entered the fort. I offered the arrow to the closest man, a thin fellow with, of all things, a headman's axe in hand. He reached for it, and I stuck it through his eye. There's a still moment when something like that happens, when an arrow juts from a gleaming eyeball, and the owner has yet to scream. The men who act in such still moments tend to live longer. Of the crowd behind the gate, only one moved before the man's scream and I moved quicker. I caught his wrist as he reached for me, and drove Makin's shield across his elbow joint. With his arm held straight, I pivoted him, so his body struck another man before his head hit the wall. The quick men tend to live longer, but sometimes they just get themselves first in the queue. I stepped back, almost to the portcullis that had started to fall, and shrugged the Nuban's bow from my shoulder, letting its weight swing it under my arm. Bringing it up, I pulled both triggers without bothering to aim. Both bolts hit the same man, 
which was a bit of a waste, but of all of them, he had the most armor on, and the Nuban's crossbow put two big holes in it. The portcullis slammed down behind me. The wind of it tickled on my neck as it sliced past. Four left in view. The big man at the gate wheel, hunting for his sword, another unhurt on the floor, climbing to his feet. Two who could be brothers, both wide with straggly hair and rotting teeth, reaching for me. They made the right choice. When the numbers are on your side, grapple your foe before he gets his steel clear. I pushed off the gate, using it to accelerate my charge. The pair before me both had the weight advantage, but if you hurl yourself hard behind a shield, especially if you ensure the iron edge of it hits somewhere useful, like the throat, you can get yourself a little advantage of your own, whatever you weigh. I had no fear in me, just the need to kill, just something crawling on me, in me, that might be washed away with enough blood. One of the two uglies went down beneath me, blood, spit, and teeth spattering my face. The other loomed above us as I pulled Grumlow's knife from my boot. Knife work is a red business, brothers. With the knife, you slice meat up close, lay it to the bone, and swim in what gushes out. The screams are in your ear, the hurting trembles through your short blade. I could say I remember all of it, but I don't. A fury took me, painting the world in scarlet, and I howled as I killed. I have a vision of the moment I left the gate yard, drawing my sword for the first time as the remainder of the garrison hurried down two sets of narrow stairs to the right and left. The men coming into view first tried to back off, with the others crowding behind, pushing. It wasn't for Michael that I killed those men, or for the joy of slaughter, or the proud legend of King Jorg. Like Gog, I have my own fires banked and burning, and on some days the right spark can set them blazing beyond my control. Perhaps that was the true reason I had come traipsing over half a dozen realms to find this fire mage for my pet monster. Perhaps I wanted to know that such fires could be contained, that they didn't have to kill us both. I survived my foolishness, though fourteen men did not, and I walked, half drunk with exhaustion, from the gate once more. The brothers left their posts on their perimeter around the fort, and followed me back toward the horses. Jorg, Makin said. I turned, and they stopped. Red Jorg, said Red Kent, and he clapped his hand across his chest. Red Jorg, Wright grunted. He stamped. Gorgoth stamped his great foot. Makin drew sword and clashed it against his breastplate. The others took up the chant. I looked down and saw that no part of me was without gore. I dripped with the blood of others, as red as Kent on the day we found him, and I knew then why he wouldn't speak of it. I went to Michael and took his head axe from the grey's harness. We'll make him a can, I said, and put the heads of the fortmen around to watch over it. I threw the axe to Reich. He caught it and set off for the fort without complaint. For once, I believe the taking of loot was not at the front of his thinking. We built the can. Gorgoth brought rocks that no single man would be able to roll away. I don't know that Michael would have wanted the heads, or cared, or have held any opinion on the matter, but we set them as his honor guard, in any case. I don't know what Michael would have wanted. I never really met him, until those last seconds when he lay dying. It surprised me that I cared, but I found that I did. Chapter 16 Four Years Earlier You can cut seven shades from a man, scarlet arterial blood, purple from the veins, bile like fresh-cut grass, browns from the gut, but it all dries to somewhere between rust and tar. Time for Red Jorg to take himself to a stream and clean off the fortmen. I watched the dirt swirl away, pinkish in the water. So what was that about? Makin asked, striding up behind. They shot my idiot, I said. A pause. It seemed that Makin always had that pause with me, as if I were a puzzle to him. We told you he was dead back in Norwood, and you didn't spare him a moment, Makin said. So why now? The truth, Jorg. What is truth? I asked, washing the last of the blood from my hands. Pilot said that, you know. What is truth? Fine, don't tell me then, Makin said. But we have to cross that bridge in a hurry now, before this gets out. I stood, shaking water from my hair. I'm ready. Let's go. With the brothers saddled, and on the road, I took a moment to revisit the can, 
Necromancy pulsed in my chest as I approached. An echo of the pain when father's knife cut in. An echo of all the flavors of pain that filled me in that moment. Stabbed, betrayed, the strength running from me, hot and red. Ravens fluttered away from their heads as I drew close. I stood mute before the mound of dry rocks. Mind empty, not knowing what I felt. My eye took in the spatters of yellow lichen, a quartz vein through a large boulder, the black trickles of blood on stone. It seemed that the heads watched me, as if their raven-pecked eyes were turned toward me. And then there was no seamed about it. As I made a slow circle of the cairn, each head in turn swiveled its gaze to follow me. I had killed the first man with an arrow in the eye. It twitched as he tried to turn that eye my way. I held the gaze of the single eye he could watch me with. Jorg. His lips formed my name. Chella? I asked. Who else could it be? I thought I buried you deep enough. For a moment, I saw her toppling into that shaft, dragging the Nuban, after I'd shot them both with his bow. The same smile twisted each man's lips. I'll find you, bitch. I spoke low. She had enough ears to hear me. The heads broadened their smiles to show teeth. Lips moved. It looked like dead king that they mouthed. I shrugged. Enjoy the ravens. And I left them. Whatever power worked here, I doubted it would trouble Michael under such a weight of stone. We moved on, resupplied from the fort, with replacements for what Gog had burned in the night. Remagen huddled around both shores of the Rhyme, a modest walled town, smoke rising from scores of chimneys lined along well-ordered streets. The bridge held my attention, though. I'd not thought of bridges as graceful before, but this one hung glittering between two silver towers, taller than the haunt, suspended on what looked like gleaming wire, but must have been cables thick as a man. Within half an hour we were lined at the town gates, waiting our turn behind peddlers, merchants with their wagons, farmers leading cows, or carting ducks and hens. We stowed our weapons out of sight on the horses, but we still looked a rough crowd. Gorgoth drew looks aplenty, but none of the normal screaming and the running. "'You'll be with the circus, then,' said the farmer with the ducks in wicker cages. He nodded, as if agreeing with his statement. "'So we are,' I said, before Wright could grumble. "'I juggle,' I added, and gave him my smile. The men at the gates were of the same ragtag crowd that we found at the fort. The free town had no soldiers, according to Roe, just a loose militia drawn from the population, at the service of the mayor for a month or two, then free to go back to their livelihoods. Well met. I clapped my hands to the shoulders of what should have been the gate captain in any decent town. I grinned as if we'd been best friends all our lives. Jorg the Red and his travelling players, catching up with our colleagues at the circus, I juggle. Would you like to see? No, he said trying to shake free. A good answer in the main, since I don't juggle. You're sure? I asked, finally letting him go. My friend here does knife tricks, and little Reiki is famously ugly. Move on, he said, and turned to the tinker behind us. I passed between the guardsmen. Care to see some juggling? No? And through the gates. The bridge is that way, Makin said, pointing again as he did at the crossroads, as if it weren't two hundred feet tall and glittering in the morning sunshine. Indeed, I said. But we're with the circus. And I led off to the right, not pointing at the multicoloured pavilion rising above the rooftops. I juggle. We had to start with the elbows to make a path before we got within clear sight of the pavilion. The people of Remagen were out in their hundreds, packing the streets around the circus, spilling from the taverns and crowding the smaller tents and stalls around the main attraction. Must be Sunday, Sim said, grinning like a boy which I suppose he was by most accountings. Wright moved to the front, pushing his way toward the big top. Like Sim, he had an eager look on him, the kind of light that toy clown put in him back at the haunt. I wasn't the only one who remembered. It's taproot, Makin asked, frowning. I nodded. Got to be. Excellent, said Kent. He'd swiped himself three sugar sticks from somewhere and was trying to get all of them in his mouth at once. We got to the pavilion entrance, laced up all the way down and staked, with the smaller entrance to the side also tagged down. A man and a boy sat in the dust before the door, 
bent over a wooden board with black and white markers, arrayed across it in various depressions. "'Show's not until sundown,' the man said, as my shadow fell across the board. He didn't look up. "'You've got Mancala in three if you play from the end pit, then the eye pit,' I said. He looked up sharp enough at that, lifting his bald head on the thickest of necks. "'By Christ, jeez you! It's little Jorg!' He stood and took me under the arms, throwing me a yard in the air before executing a neat catch. "'Run!' I said. "'You used to be strong!' "'Be fair!' he grinned. "'You've doubled in height!' I shrugged. "'The armor weighs a bit, too. Save my ribs, though.' I waved the others forward. "'You remember little Reiki?' "'Of course! Makin! Good to see you, Grumlow!' Ron caught sight of Gorgoth. "'And who's the big fella?' "'Show him the thing!' said Reich, bubbling like a child. "'Show him the thing!' "'Later!' Ron smiled. "'The weights are all stored now. Besides, looks like your friend could put me out of business!' Ron, or to do him justice, the amazing Ronaldo, did the circus strongman act. He earned Reich's undying respect by the simple act of lifting a heavier weight than Reich could. It's true that nature treated Ron to an unreasonable helping of muscle, but I think that little Reich might be the stronger even so. Certainly, I'd bet on Reich before Ron in a tavern brawl. But with the lifting of weights, there's grip and timing and commitment. And Reich faltered, where Ron pressed on. So, where might we find the good Dr. Taproot? I asked. Ronaldo led us through the side flap, leaving the boy, who turned out to be a midget old enough to be going grey, to watch our horses. I took the Nuban's bow. I didn't trust the midget to be able to run down any thieves, and besides, I might want to shoot a circus clown or two, just for laughs. We skirted around the center ring, kicking sawdust, and watching three acrobats practice their tumbles out where the sun struck down through the high opening. Toward the back of the big top, canvas division spaced out several rooms. Here, the heavy stink from the animal cages reached in, and you could hear a growl or two above the thumps and shouts of the tumblers. Taproot had his back to me as I followed Ron in. Two of the dancer girls stood before him in slack poses, bored and rolling their eyes. "'Watch me!' Taproot said. "'Hips and tits! That sells seats! And look as if you're enjoying it, for God's sake! Watch me!' He talked with his hands, did Taproot, long-fingered hands, always flying about his head. "'I am watching you,' I said. They say Taproot got that habit from his days at the three-cup game. "'Watch me!' and the boy will dip your pockets. He turned at that, hands plucking at the air. And who have you brought to see me, Ronaldo? A handsome young fellow indeed, with friends outside. Taproot knew me. Taproot never forgot a face, or a fact, or a weakness. Jog the red, I said. I juggle. Do you now? He drew fingers down his jaw, to the point of his chin. And what do you juggle, Jog the red? I grinned. What have you got? Watch me! He fished a dark bottle from the depths of his cloak of many faded colours. Come take a seat. Bring your brothers in if they'll fit. He dismissed the dancers with a flutter of hands. Taproot retreated behind a desk in the corner, finding glasses from its drawer. I took the only other chair as the others filed in behind Makin. I'm guessing you still juggle lives, Jorg, Taproot said, though in more salubrious surroundings these days. He poured a green measure into five glasses, all of emotion, without a drop lost. You've heard about my change in circumstances. I took the glass. Its contents looked like urine, a little greener. Absinthe, ambrosia of the gods, Taproot said. Watch me, and he knocked his back with a slight grimace. Absinthe? Isn't that Greek for undrinkable? I sniffed it. Two gold a bottle, he said. Has to be good at that price, no? I sipped. It had the kind of bitterness that takes layers off your tongue. I coughed despite myself. You should have told me you were a prince, Jorg. I always knew there was something about you. He pointed two fingers to his eyes. Watch me. More brothers followed on in. Gorgoth ducked in under the flap. Gog scurrying in front. Taproot took his gaze from me and rocked back in his chair. Now, these two fellows I could employ, he said. Even if they don't juggle, he waved to the three spare glasses. Help yourselves, gentlemen. There's a pecking order on the road, and it helps to know how it runs. On the surface, Taproot's business might be sawdust and somersaults, dancing girls and dancing bears, 
but he dealt in more than entertainment. Dr. Taproot liked to know things. A beat passed. Most would miss it, but not Taproot. The beat let the brothers know that Makin wasn't interested. Reich took the first glass. Red Kent the next. Another beat. Then Rowe snatched the last. Rowe threw his down and smacked his lips. Rowe could drink acid without complaint. Ron, why don't you take Reich and Gorgoth and show them the thing with the barrel? I asked. Reich gulped his drink, made a sour face, and followed Ron out. The Lucrotas next, Gog tagging behind. The rest of you can lose yourselves too. See if you can't learn some new tricks in the ring. I sipped again. It'd be foul at twenty gold a bottle. Makin, perhaps you could be finding out about that rather fine bridge for us, I said. And they filed out, leaving me and Taproot watching each other across the desk in the dim glow of the sun through canvas. A prince, Jorg. Watch me. Taproot smiled, a crescent of teeth in his thin face. And now a king? I would have cut myself a throne whatever woman I fell from, I said. Had I been a carpenter's son, stable-born, I'd have cut one. I don't doubt it. Again the smile, that mix of warmth and calculation. Remember the times we had, Jorg? I did. Happy days are rare on the road. The days we had ridden with the circus troop had been golden for a wild boy of twelve. Tell me about the Prince of Arrow, I said. A great man by all accounts, Taproot said. He made a steeple of his fingers, pressed to his lips. And by your account, I asked, don't tell me you've not met the man. I've met everyone, Jorg, he said. You know that. Watch me. I never knew if I liked Taproot. I've even met your father, he said. I'm rarely uncertain in such matters, but Taproot, with his watch me and his talking hands, with his whole life of performance and his secret ways, it's hard to know a man who knows too much. The Prince of Arrow, I said. He's a good man, Taproot said at last. He means what he says, and what he says is good. The world eats good men for breakfast, I said. Perhaps, Taproot shrugged. But the prince is a thinker, a planner, and he has funds. The Florentine banking clans love him well. Peace is good business. He's setting his pieces. The Fenelons fell to him before winter set in. He'll add more thrones to his tally soon enough. Watch me. He'll be at your gates in a few years, if nobody stops him. And at your father's gates. Let him call on Ancrath first, I said. I wondered what my father would make of this good man. His brother, said Taproot. Egan? Taproot knew. He just wanted to know if I knew. I just watched him. He kept telling me to, after all. His brother is a killer. A swordsman like the legends talk of, and vicious with it. A year younger than Orin, and always will be. Thank the Lord. More absinthe. And how much support is there for the good prince among the hundred? I waved the bottle away. You needed a clear head with Taproot. Well, they'd all murder him for half a florin, Taproot said. Of course, but he's merciful, and that can be a powerful thing. Taproot stroked his chest, as though he imagined a little of that mercy for himself. There's not a lord out there who doesn't know that if he opened his gates to Arrow, he'd get to keep his head and most of what was behind his gates, too. By the next congression, his friends could vote him to the Empire throne. And if he keeps going the way he is, he could vote himself to the throne at the congression after next. It's a clever ploy, I said. Mercy is a weapon. More than that. Watch me. Taproot sipped and ran his tongue over his teeth. It's who he is. And he won't need too many more victories before more gates are open to him than stand closed. He looked at me then, dark and shrewd. How will your gate stand, Jog of Ancrath? We'll have to see, won't we? I ran a wet finger around the rim of my glass and made it sing. I'm a little young to be giving up on ambition, though, nay? Besides, sometimes an open gate just means you'd rather they did the walking. What about the others? I asked. Others? Taproot's innocent look was a work of art, perfected over years. I watched him. Taproot kept his frozen innocence a moment longer. I scratched my ear and watched him. Oh, the others. He offered a quick smile. There's support for Orin of Arrow there. He's foretold, the Prince of Arrow. Prophecy aplenty. 
too much for the wise to ignore. The silent sister is, of course. Silent? I asked. Even so. But others are interested. Sages, the blue lady, Luntar of Thar, even Skilfar. He studied me as he spoke each name, knowing in a moment if I knew them. I put little enough on my face at such times, but a man like Taproot needs less than little to know your mind. Skilfar? He already knew I didn't know. I switch, Taproot said. Plays the jarls off against each other. There are plenty of eyes on this Prince of Arrow Jorg. His star is not yet risen, but be sure it's in ascendance. Who knows how high and how bright it might be, come congression. If anyone knew, it would be the circus master before me. I turned Taproot's words over in my head. The next congression stood two years away, four more again before the one after that. As Lord of Renar, I had my place booked, a single vote in hand, and the Gilden Guard would escort me to Vienne. I couldn't see the hundred electing an emperor to sit over them, though, not even Orin of Arrow. If I went, if I let the Gilden Guard drag me five hundred miles to throw my vote into the pot, I'd vote for me. I'm sorry about Kashta, Taproot said. He filled his glass and raised it. Who? Taproot dropped his gaze to the bow beside me. The Nuban. Oh! Taproot knew stuff. Kashta. I let him fill my glass again, and we drank to the Nuban. Another good man, Taproot said. I liked him. You like everyone, Taproot, I said. I licked my lips. But he was a good man. I'm taking the monsters to Heimrift. Tell me about the mage there. Fairer kind, Taproot said. A dangerous man. Watch me. I've had pyromancers that trained with them. Not magicians. Not much more than fire eaters. Flame blowers. You could do as much with this stuff on a candle. He raised his glass again. Smoke and spark, men. I don't think he lets the good ones go. But all the ones I had were terrified of the man. You could end any argument with them just by saying his name. He's the real thing. Flame sworn. Flame sworn? I asked. The fire is in him. In the end it'll take him. He used to be a player. You know what I speak of? A player of men and thrones. But the fire took too much from him, and we no longer interest him. I want his help, I said. And this is your offer? Taproot tapped his wrist. I hadn't seen him so much as glance at my watch. But it seemed he knew all about it. Perhaps. What else might interest him? I asked. Taproot pursed his lips. He likes rubies. But I think he'll prefer your fire patterned child. He may want to keep him, Jork. I may want to keep him myself, I said. Going soft in your old age, Jork? Taproot asked. Watch me. I knew a twelve-year-old hard as nails and twice as sharp. Perhaps you should leave the monsters with me. There's a good enough living to be made in the freak tent. I stood. I hefted up the Nuban's bow. Cashed her, hey? Even so, Taproot said. I must be on my way, Doctor, I said. I have a bridge to cross. Stay, he said. Learn to juggle. I'll look around once more for old times, I said. Taproot raised his hands. A king knows his mind. And I left. Good hunting, he said it to my back. I wondered if he'd taken enough from me to sell at profit. I wondered at what some men can fit between their ears. I walked past the dancers. They hadn't gone far. Remember me, Jorg? Cherry smiled. The other struck a pose. They both followed Taproot's advice. Hips and tits. Of course I do. I sketched a bow. But sadly, ladies, I'm not here to dance. Cherry, I remembered, lithe and pert, hair lightened with lemon, and curled around hot tongs every morning, a snub nose and wicked eyes. They both closed on me, half playful, half serious, hands straying, warm breath, and that gyration in the pelvis that speaks of want. Her friend, dark-haired, pale-skinned, and sculpted from fantasy, I did not recall, but wished I did. Come and play, the friend murmured. She smelled money. Sometimes, though, Reasons don't matter. It's hard to pass up an offer like that when you're young and full of juice. But fourteen heads around a rock can were telling me to get a move on, and I'd taken what I needed here. Almost. I left them and slipped through an exit to the rear of the tent. In a clearing to the left, I could see Thomas swallowing a sword, watched by a scatter of circus urchins. He hardly needed the practice, 
but that was Thomas, a crowd pleaser. An odd breed, the gypsies and the talent, needing to live in the torturing, only alive in grease paint. I swear, some of them would fade and die, given a week without applause. Rumbles from the cages drew me, a stack of them on the east side of the camp, where the wind would take some of the stink away. They still had the two bears I remembered, pacing their madness in tight circles, dull shaggy fur, the bronze nose rings big enough to fit an arm. The huge turtle, Taproot claimed it to be two hundred years old, statue still, and as interesting as a big stone, not caged, but tethered to a stake. The two-headed goat was a new addition, a sickly-looking thing, but then again, it should have been a stillbirth so it was more healthy than anyone had a right to expect. Every now and then, the heads would sight each other and startle as if surprised. See anything you like? A soft voice behind me. I do now. I turned to face her. She looked good. Jorg, Sarah said. My sweet Jorg. A king, no less. I shrugged. I never did know when to stop. She smiled. No. Dark and delicious. I saw Thomas back there, putting on a show, I said. Sarah pouted at the mention of her husband. It never stops amazing me how people want to watch that. That's why the circus keeps on moving, I said. Everything gets old quick enough. The swallowing of swords, the blowing of fire. They're wonders for an evening or two. And did I get old quick enough? She asked. King Jorg of the Highlands? Never, I said. If the sins of the flesh ever got old... I didn't ever want enough years on me to know it. I've not found a girl to compare. Girl may have been pushing it, but she was a good ten years younger than Thomas, and who better than a circus contortionist to deliver a boy's first lessons in carnality? Sarah stepped closer, shawl tight around her shoulders against the chill of the breeze. She moved in that fluid way that reminds every watcher she can cross her ankles behind her head. Even so, on her cheeks, here and there, the white powder cracked and around her eyes the unkind morning light found tiny wrinkles. She wore her hair still in ribbons and bunches, but now it looked wrong on her, and a thread or two of silver laced the blackness of it. How many rooms does your palace have, Jorg? A husk in her voice, a hint of something desperate at the back of her smile. Lots, I said, most of them cold, stony and damp. I didn't want her to go begging and dirty up my golden memories. I didn't know what I'd come looking for around the circus camp. Taproot stories, for sure. But not now. Not here in the messy reality, behind the show ring mask. I didn't know what I'd come for, but not this. Not Sarah, showing her years and her need. A moment's silence, then a growl came, too deep and throaty for a bear. Like a giant rasp drawn across timber. What the? Lion, Sarah said. She twirled, brightening, and took my hand. See? And around the corner, at the bottom of the cage stack, Dr. Taproot did indeed have himself a lion. I hefted the Nuban's bow to see the ironwork around the trigger guard. The beast in the cage might be a bit threadbare, showing too many ribs. But his dirty mane remembered the one framing the snarling face on the Nuban's bow. Well, there's a thing, I said. The Nuban had told me, in his youth, he walked scorched grasslands, where lions hunted in packs. And even though the Nuba never lied, I only half believed him. There's a thing. Words failed me for once. He's called Macedon, Sarah said, leaning into me. The crowds love him. What else has Taproot got caged? I expect a griffin next, then a unicorn and a dragon. A full heraldic set. Silly, she hussed. Old or not, that magic of hers had started to work on me. Dragons aren't real the twitch of a smile in her painted lips, her small and kissable mouth. I shook it off. The circus was too full of distractions. Distractions I wanted to make a full and thorough examination of. But I had ghosts at my heels, and Gog about to burst into flame at any moment. He looks hungry, I said. The circus can't feed its main attraction. He won't eat, Sarah said. Taproot's tearing his hair about it. Doesn't know how long he'll last. The lion watched us, sat sphinx-like, with his massive paws spread in the straw before him. I met his huge amber eyes and wondered what he saw. Probably a hunk of meat on two legs, not meant for running. He wants to hunt, I said. We give him meat, Sarah said. Ron cuts him big hunks of cow, still bleeding. 
He barely sniffs it. He needs to take it, I said, not be given it. That's silly. Her fingers ran along mine, starting fires. It's in his nature. I looked away. I didn't think I could win a staring competition with Macedon, even if I had time to try. You should let him go, I said. Sarah laughed, a note too shrill for comfort. And what would he hunt? We should let him eat children? A distant scream saved me answering. A distant scream and a tongue of flame reaching up above the tent tops. A dead cook fire close by suddenly lit. The flame flared, sucked in like a drawn breath, and became a little man made all of fire. A homunculus, no taller than a chicken. It glanced around for a heartbeat, then tore off in the direction of the scream, leaving the fire pit black and smoking, and a line of charred footprints behind it. Sarah opened her mouth, ready to scream or shout, decided on neither, and took off after the flame man. My gaze returned to the lion, who seemed wholly unmoved by the excitement. Do you think Taproot will still want Gog in his freak show now? I asked. The lion gave no answer, just watched me with those amber eyes. The lions the Nuban had told me of were magnificent beasts, lords of the plains. He understood why men who had never seen one might fight beneath their likeness on a banner. When he spoke of lions on cold nights camped along the roadside, I had sworn to walk those same sun-scarred plains and see them for myself. I hadn't imagined them caged, mangy, hopping with fleas beside a two-headed goat. A single nail pinned the cage door, secured with a twist of wire. I had pulled a single pin to set the Nuban free years ago, worlds ago. I pulled a pin, and he took two lives in as many moments. That Jorg would have pulled this pin too. That Jorg would have pulled this pin and not given a moment's thought to children clustered around a sword swallower. To the livelihoods of dancers and tumblers. To townsfolk or to Taproot's revenge. But I'm not him. I'm not him because we die a little every day, and by degrees we're reborn into different men, older men in the same clothes, with the same scars. I didn't forget the children or the dancers or the tumblers, but I pulled the pin, because it's in my nature. For Kashta, I said. I swung the door open and walked away. The lion would stay or leave, hunt or die, it didn't matter. But at least he had a choice. As for me, I had a bridge to cross. I set off after Sarah to see what damage Gog had done. Brother Sim looks pleasing enough. A touch pretty, a touch delicate, but sharp with it. Under the dyes, his hair is a blonde that takes the sun. Under the drugs, his eyes are blue. Under the sky... I know no one more private in their ways, more secret in their opinions, more deadly in a quiet moment. Chapter 17 Four Years Earlier When you journey north, past the River Rhyme, you start into the Danelands, those regions still unclaimed by the sea, where the Vikings of old came ashore to conquer and then settle among the peoples who bowed before the axe. There are few Danes who will not claim Viking blood. But it's not until the sea bars your path that such claims take on weight, and you start to feel yourself truly among the men of the wild and frozen north. We cross the bridge at Remagen, leading our horses, for in places the metal weave of the deck had holes punched up through it, some the width of a spear, some wide enough to swallow a man. Nowhere did rust have a hold on the silver metal and what had made the holes, no one could say. I remembered the peasant in his house of gravestones backed by Pauches, unable to read a single legend from them. I shouldn't have sneered. We live in a world made from the builders' graves, and can read almost none of the messages they carry, and understand fewer still. We left Remagen without trouble, and rode hard along the north way, so that trouble wouldn't catch us up if it followed. Farms, forests, villages, untouched by war. Good land to ride through with the sun on your back. It set me in mind of Ancrath, cottages golden with thatch, orchards in bloom, all so fragile, so easy to erase. Thank you for not burning up too much of the circus, Gog, I said. I'm sorry for the fire, Jorg, Gog said behind me. No great harm done, I said. Besides, the stories they tell about it will bring more people to the show. Did you see the little men? Gog asked. The midgets, I asked. His claws dug in. My little men, from the fire. I saw them, I said. It looked like they were trying to pull you in. 
Gorgos stopped them, Gog said. I couldn't tell if he was happy or sad about that. You shouldn't go, I said. You need to learn more, to know how to be safe, to know that you can come back. That's why we're going to Farrakind. He can teach you these things. I think I've seen him, Gog said. At first I didn't think I'd heard right above the thud and clatter of hooves. I can look into one fire and see out of another, Gog said. All sorts of things. He giggled at that, and for a moment he sounded like William, laughing on the morning we climbed into that carriage. Did he see you? I asked. I felt him nod against my back. We'd best go on then, I said. There's no hiding from him now. Best find out what he has to say. We rode on and the rain started to fall, the kind of rain that comes and goes in the spring, cold and sudden and leaving the world fresh. Heimrift lies in the Danelaw, a hard ride from the Rhinelands. We made good speed and paced the season, caught in an unending wave of wakening, as if we carried the May with us. Gorgoth ran beside me as often as not, tireless, pounding the road with great feet that seemed almost hooves. He spoke so seldom that it made you want him to, as if by storing each word he made it precious. I found him to be a deep thinker, though he had never read a book or been taught by anyone. Why do you ask so much? he asked once, his arms punching in and out like the great engine at York as he ran. The unexamined life is not worth living, I said. Socrates? How in hell do you know that? I asked. Jane, he said. I grunted. She could have reached out from the dark halls of the Lucrotas, that child, even without taking a step from the entrance caves. I had walked some of the paths she took, and the paths of the mine can take you anywhere. Who was she to you, anyhow? I asked. My elder sister, he said. Only two of us lived from my mother's line. The rest, he glanced at Gog. Too strong. She was fire-sworn, too? I remember the ghost fire dancing across her. Fire-sworn, light-sworn, mine-sworn. Gorgoth's eyes narrowed to slits as he watched me. Jane died because of my actions, because of me, because I hadn't cared if she lived or not. Mount Honus had fallen on Jane, and the necromancer both. The wrong one survived. I still owed Chella for the Nuban, and other brothers besides. But even my thirst for vengeance wouldn't see me digging in the burning wastes of Galath for her any time soon. Damnation! It suddenly struck me that I should have asked Taproot about the dead king. The excitement of the circus had somehow put him out of my mind. Given that a dozen and more severed heads had mouthed the dead king's name at me, it's a tribute to the power of sawdust and grease paint that they could push it out. Gorgoth turned his head, but didn't ask. Who's the dead king? I asked him. Gorgoth had enough dealings with the necromancers, and who better than necromancers to know about someone who speaks through corpses? Who he is, I can't say. Gorgoth spoke in the rhythm of his running. I can tell you something of what he is. Yes? A new power, risen in the dry places beyond the Vale, in the Deadlands. He speaks to those that draw their strength there. He spoke to Chella? I asked. To all the necromancers, a nod. They did not want to listen, but he made them. How? Chella struck me as a hard person to coerce. Fear. I sat back in the saddle and chewed that one over. Gorgoth ran in silence, matching Brath's trot, and for the longest time I thought he wouldn't speak again. But then he said, The dead king talks to all who reach past death. So what should I do when he talks to me? Run. Gorgoth's sister had once given me the same advice. I resolved to take it this time. We made good time, and each evening I fought Makin, learning at every turn and occasionally teaching him a new trick. I taught him a new trick the very first day I met him, training squires in the tall castle. Since then, though, the process had seen a slow reversal. Somewhere along the line, Makin turned from my rescuer, sent out by father to recover me, into a follower, and ever since he decided to follow my lead, the man had been teaching me. Not with books and charts like Tutor Lundist, but in that sneaky, indirect way the Nuban had, the kind of way that gets under your skin and turns you slowly by example. Four days out from Remagen, a storm found us on the plains, a fierce, cold squall, 
carrying all the cruelty that spring can muster. Lashed by rain, we found our way to the town of Endless, by tracks turned to swollen streams. Some lordling undoubtedly calls Endless his own, but whatever men he set to watch over it had found better things to watch that night. We clattered unopposed along the cobbled main street, and found a stable by the glow of a single lantern hung behind the torrent spilling from its eaves. The stable-keep allowed that Gog and Gorgoth could stay with the horses. Taking the pair among the good folk of Endless would be an invitation to carnage. "'We'll be out of here at dawn,' I told the stable-keep, a lean fellow, pockmarked, but along one side only, as if the pox had found no foothold on his right half. "'Let me return to find Gorkas here staring at my monsters, and I'll have the big one twist your legs off. Understand?' He understood. We shed our sodden cloaks in some nameless tavern, and sat steaming before a cold hearth, while a serving girl fetched our ales. The place was packed with wet and sweating bodies, lumbermen in the main, some stinking drunk, others just stinking. We drew looks, not a few of them hostile, but none that lasted long when offered back. Sim had his harp with him, a battered thing, but quality, stolen from a very rich home once upon a time. He'd pulled it from his saddlebag and unwrapped it with the kind of care he usually reserved for weapons. As our drinks arrived, he started to pluck a tune from it. He had quick fingers, did Sim, quick and clever, and the notes rolled out fast enough to make a river. By the time I left for my bed, in the inn across the road, the storm had passed. Sim and Makin had half the locals bawling out ten kings, and Sim's voice, high and clear, followed me out of the door, rising over the deeper refrain and Makin's enthusiastic baritone. Strains of The Shallow Lady reached up through the window as I poked my way in under crawling blankets and let the bugs set to. At least it was dry. I fell asleep to the faint sounds of the nonsense doggerel, American Pie. I woke much later in the calm dead hours of the night, still tangled in the song, though all lay quiet save for the brothers snoring. Chevy Levy was dry. Moonlight reached across the room and offered me two figures in the doorway one supporting the other. Makin stopped to close the door behind him. Sim hobbled on, something broken about his walking. Trouble? I sat up, the ale still spinning in me. My, my, Miss American Pie. Why two drunk brothers staggering in should spell trouble, I couldn't have said. But I knew trouble was what we had. Makin turned, pulling aside the hood on the lantern he'd brought up with him. I found him in the street, he said. Left him an hour ago with five locals, the last in the tavern. Sim looked up. They'd given him a hell of a beating, lips split and swollen, half a tooth gone, one eye full of blood. From the way he moved, I guess he'd be pissing pink for a week. In fact, something in the way he moved suggested other kinds of hurt had been done to him. They took my heart, brother. He turned out his empty hands. It had been a time and a half since Sim had called me brother. I wondered what else had been taken. I kicked Reich in the head. Up! Kent and Grumlow were already rising from the floor. Get up! I said again. Trouble? Kent asked, echoing my own question. He sat still in the dark, moonlight making black pits of his eyes. Always ready for trouble was Red Kent, though he never sought it out. Grumlow found his feet quick enough and took Sim's arm. The boy flinched off, but Grumlow took firmer hold and led him to the window. Bring the lantern, Makin. Some stitches needed here. Five of them? I asked. Sim nodded as he passed me. I can't let this stand, I said. Makin let the lantern drop an inch or two at that. Jog! They took the harp, I said. That's an insult to the Brotherhood. I let the pride of the Brotherhood take the slur. It would shame Sim to have this be for him. Makin shrugged. Sim cut at least one of them. There's a trail of blood in the street. Were they armed? I asked. No, thy enemy. Makin shook his head. Knives! Probably have their wood axes to hand by now. Oh, and a short one. He had a bow. Likes to do a bit of hunting, he said. My, my. I threw the bundle of my blankets at Reich and made for the door. Let's be about it, then. You too, Brother Sim. You'll want to see this. I let Reich go first into the street and followed. Watching the dark windows, the lines of the rooftops, Makin found the trail of blood drops again, black in the cold light of the moon, and we followed past the church, past the well, along the alley between tannery and stables, the dull rumble of Gorgoth's snore from within, deeper than the snort of horses, past a warehouse, a low wall, and out into the rough pasture between town and forest. 
we gathered with our backs to a barn, the last building before the woods took over. No one had to be told. Your enemy has a bow, you keep a building at your back, and don't let the light silhouette you. They're in the forest, Grumlow said. They won't be far in. Makin set the lantern to one side, its light hidden. Why not? Grumlow asked, eyes on the black line of the trees. The moon won't reach in there, not a place to walk blind. I lifted my voice loud enough for the men in the woods. Why don't you come out? We only want to talk. An arrow hammered into the barn wall, yards above my head. Laughter followed. Send your girlfriend in after us if she wants some more. Grumlow took a step forward at that, but he wasn't dumb enough to take another. Reich, on the other hand, took two, and would have taken more if I hadn't barked his name. It was Reich's true brother Price who took young Sim from that bell-pen brothel in the long ago. Why he picked one child to save, and made red slaughter of the rest, along with the grown whores and their master, none of the brothers could ever tell me. But it seemed to matter to Reich that he had. And there it is, proof if proof were needed, that though God may mould the clay and fashion some of us hail, some strong, some beautiful, inside we make ourselves, from foolish things, breakable, fragile things, the thorns, that dog, the hope that Catherine might make me better than I am. Even Reich's blunt wants were born of losses he probably remembered only in dreams. All of us fractured, awkward colleges of experience wrapped tight to present a defensible face to the world. And what makes us human is that sometimes we snap, and in that moment of release we're closer to gods than we know. I told Reich no, but hardly a part of me didn't want to charge those words. It'll have to keep for morning, Makin said. I didn't like to admit it, but he was right. I would have left it there, save for Gorgoth coming along the alley beside the barn. A strange mix of clever and stupid, that one. He made a nice target with the moon bright behind him, a big one, too. I heard the hiss of an arrow, and then his deep grunt. Here, idiot! I called out to him, and he lumbered to my side, Gog scampering around his legs. Makin lifted the lantern, but I kept him from opening the hood. He's not dead. He can wait. Take more than an arrow, Reich muttered. Even so, light blossomed, and we saw the shaft jutting from Gorgoth's shoulder. The head buried only an inch deep or so, as if the Lucrotus flesh were oak. Makin! I said no! But it wasn't Makin. The light bled from Gog's eyes, hot and yellow. I could have told Gog no, bundled him around a corner, and left the woodsman till morning. But the fire that burned in Gog at seeing Gorgoth harmed echoed a colder fire that lit in me when Sim hobbled through that door. I'd grown tired of saying no. Instead, I took Gog's hand, though the ghosts of flame whispered across his skin. He looked up at me, eyes white like stars. Let it burn, I told him. Something hot ran through me, up my arm, along the marrow of my bones, hot like a promise, anger made liquid and set running. What's cooking? The taunt rang out from the tree line, somewhere out past an old cowshed sagging in its beams. Gog and I walked toward the sound, slow footsteps, the ground sizzling where his bare feet touched wet grass. The hell? Voices raised in concern in the dark of the woods, an arrow zipped through the night, wide of its mark, the glowing child a disconcerting target, fooling the eye. We heard the hissing before we'd gone ten yards. A thousand snakes hissing in the darkness, or perhaps just steam escaping the trees as their sap started to boil. A laugh bubbled from me in the same way, escaping my heat. The anger I brought with me ignited, becoming too large for my body, detaching from the men who hurt Sim, and becoming an end in and of itself, all consuming, a glorious laughing ecstasy of rage. A skin of flame lifted from Gog, washing over me in a warm wave. Back in the forest, the first of the trees exploded its fragments bursting into incandescent flame as they found air. Fire lifted around the intact trunks, rising through the spring foliage, making each leaf a momentary shadow. More trees exploded, then more, until the blast became a continuous rumble of brilliant detonation. The cattle shed ignited, though it stood twenty yards back from the closest flame, one side of it just snapping into liquid orange fire. I saw a lone archer running from the edge of the forest, clothes alight. Farther back, human torches staggered and fell. That power, brothers, is a drug, a fiercer joy than poppy spice, and more sure to hollow you out. If Gorgoth hadn't knocked me aside and snatched up Gog, we neither of us would have stopped until no tree remained, no board or beam of endless. Maybe not even then. 
Dawn found us still in the wet grass behind that barn, a smoking hole in the forest before us, acres wide. Gog went hunting amid the embers and returned with a twitching tangle. Sim's harp strings fused together and twisted by the heat. He took them with a curious smile, lopsided from his beating. My thanks, Gog. He held them up and shook them so they rattled one against the next. A simpler song, but still sweet. And that was endless. We saw the smoke daze from our goal, still skirting the borders of the Teuton kingdoms. A grey column reached miles into the sky, mountain high and higher still, as if Satan were trying to smoke the angels out of heaven. The sight prompted Red Kent to curiosity. What is a volcano, Jorg? Where the earth bleeds, I told him. Sim and Grumlow rode in closer to here. Where its blood bubbles up. Molten rock, like lead melted for the siege, poured red and runny from the depths. It was a serious question. Kent turned his horse away, looking offended. Days later we could smell the sulphur in the air. In places a fine black dust lay on the new leaves, even as they unfurled, and stands of trees stood dead, acre after acre, bare and brown, waiting for a summer fire. You know you're entering the Dane law by the troll stones. You start to see them at crossroads, then by streams, then in circles atop hills, great blocks of stone set with the old runes, the Norse runes that remember dead gods, the thunder hammer, and old one eye who saw all and told little. They say the Danes choose one rock above another for troll stones, because they see the lines of a troll in some, but not the next. All I can say is that trolls must look remarkably like chunks of rock in that case. We hadn't seen so many troll stones before a rider joined us on the road. He came from the south, setting a fast pace and slowing as he caught our band. Well met, he called, standing in his stirrups. A local man, hair braided in two plates, each ending in a bronze cap worked with serpents, a round iron helm tight on his head and a fine moustache flowing into a short beard. Well met, I said as he drew level at the head of our column. He had a short bow on his back, a single-bladed axe strapped to his saddlebags, a knife at his hip with a polished bone handle. He gave Gorgoth a wide berth. You should follow me, he said. Why? My lord Maladon wishes to see you, he said. And it would be easier this way, no? He grinned. I'm Sindri, by the way. Lead on, I said. A band of warriors probably watched us from the woods, and if not, Sindri deserved to be rewarded for his balls. We followed him a couple of miles along a trail increasingly crowded with traffic, wheeled and on foot or hoof. Occasionally we heard a distant rumble, not unlike a giant version of the lion taproot had caged, and the ground would tremble. Sindri led us past two grey villages and brought us along the side of a narrow lake. When the mountains grumbled, the water rippled from shore to shore. The stronghold at the far end looked to be made of timber and turf, with only the occasional block of stone showing above the foundations. The great hall of the Duke of Dane, Sindri said. Alaric Mulladon, twenty-seventh of his line, Reich snorted behind me. I didn't bother to silence him. A voice was speaking at the back of my mind, just beyond hearing, a low moan or a howl. A stone face swam across my vision, a gargoyle face. Men were gathered before the hall, some at work, others preparing for a patrol, each armed with axe and spear, carrying a large round shield of painted wood and hide. Stable hands came to take our horses. As usual, Gorgoth drew the stairs. When we passed, I heard men mutter, Grendelkin. Sindri ushered us up the steps to the Great Hall's entrance. The whole place had a sorry look to it. The black dust coated everything with a fine film. It tickled the throat like a feather. The patrol horses looked thin and unkempt. The Duke wants to see us still wearing the road, I asked, hoping for some hot water and a chair after so many miles in the saddle. A little time to prepare would be good, too. I wanted to remember where I knew the name from. Sindri grinned. Despite the beard, he hadn't too many years on me. The Duke isn't one for niceties. We're not fussy in the northern courts. The summer is too short. I shrugged and followed up the stairs. Two large warriors flanked the doorway, hands on the hafts of double-headed axes, their iron blades resting on the floor between their feet. Two of your party should be enough. Sindri said. It never hurts to trust someone, especially when you've absolutely no other option. Makin, I said. Makin and I followed Sindri into the gloom and smoke of the Great Hall. The place seemed empty at first, long trestle tables of dark and polished wood, bare save for an abandoned flagon and a hambone. 
Wood smoke and ale tempered the stink of dogs and sweat. At the far end of the hall, on a fur-strewn dais, in a high oak chair, a figure waited. Sindri led the way. I trailed my fingers along the table as we walked, feeling the slickness of the wood. "'Jorg and Meakin,' said Sindri to his lord. "'Found heading north on your highway, Duke Alaric.' "'Welcome to the Danelands,' the duke said. I just watched him, a big man, white blonde hair, and a beard down his chest. The silence stretched. "'They have a monster with them,' Sindri added, embarrassed. "'A troll or Grendelkin, big enough to strangle a horse?' In my mind a gargoyle howled. "'You brought a snow globe,' I said. The duke frowned. Do I know you, boy? You brought a snow globe, a toy of the ancients, and I broke it. It had been a rare gift. He would remember the globe, and perhaps the avarice with which a little boy had stared at it. Ancrath? The duke's frown deepened. Jorg? Ancrath? The same. I made a bow. It's been a long time, young Jorg. Alaric stamped his foot and several of his warriors entered the hall from a room at the end. I've heard stories about you, my thanks, for not killing my idiot son. He nodded towards Sindri. I'm sure the tales have been overtold, I said. I'm not a violent man. Makin had to cover his mouth at that. Sindri frowned, looking rapidly from me to Makin and back at the duke. So what brings you to the Danelands, then? Jorg of Ancrath. The duke asked. No time wasted here, no wine or ale offered, no gifts exchanged. I'd like some friends in the north, I said. It hadn't been part of my thinking, but once in a long while, I like a man on sight. I'd liked Alaric Maladin on sight eight years earlier, when he brought my mother a gift. I liked him now. This place looks to have missed a harvest or two. Perhaps you need a friend in the south. A plain speaker, eh? I could see the grin deep in his beard. Where's all your southern song and dance, eh? No privies, no beseeching after my health. I must have dropped all that somewhere on the way, I said. So what do you really want, Jorg of Ancrath? Alaric asked. You didn't ride five hundred miles to learn the axe dance. Perhaps I just wanted to meet the Vikings, I said. But prithee tell me, what ails this land? I beseech you. He laughed out loud at that. Real Vikings have salt in their beard and ice on their furs, he said. They call us fit firar, landmen, and have little love for us. My fathers came here a long, long time ago, Jorg. I would rather they stayed by the sea. I may not have salt in my beard, but it's in my blood. I've tasted it. He stamped again, and a thick-set woman with coiled hair brought out ale, a horn for him, and two flagons for us. When they bury me, my son will have to buy the longboat, and have it sailed and carted from Osheim. My neighbor had local men make his. Would have sunk before it got out of harbor, if it ever saw the ocean. We drank our ale, bitter stuff, salted, as if everything had to remind these folk of their lost seas. I set my flagon on the table, and the ground shook harder than any of the times before, as if I had made it happen. Dust sifted from the rafters, caught here and there by sunlight spearing through high windows. Unless you can tame volcanoes, Jorg, you'll not find much to be done for Maladin, Alaric said. Can't Farrakhine send them to sleep for you? I asked. I'd read that volcanoes slept, sometimes for a lifetime, sometimes longer. Alaric raised a hairy brow at that. Behind us, Sindri laughed. Ferrekind stirs them up, he said. God's rot him. And you let him live? I asked. The Duke of Maladin glanced at his fireplace, as if an enemy might be squatting there among the ashes. There's no killing a fire mage, not a true one. He's like summer burning in a dry forest. Stamp out the flames, and they spring back up from the hot ground. Why does he do it? I knocked back the last of my salt beer and grimaced almost as bad as the absinthe. It's his nature, Alaric shrugged. When men look too long into the fire, it looks back into them. It burns out what makes them men, 
I think he speaks with the Jotna behind the flames. He wants to bring a second Ragnarok. And you're going to let him? I asked. I cared little enough for Jotna or any other kind of spirit. Push far enough past anything, be it fire or sky or even death, and you'll find the creatures that have always dwelt there. Call them what you will. I heard tell there was no problem that a Dane couldn't cut through with an axe. It's a dangerous business questioning a man's courage in his own hall, especially a Viking's. But if ever a place needed shaking up, then this was it. Meet him before you judge us, Jorg, Alaric said. He sipped from his alehorn. I had expected a more heated response, perhaps a violent one. The Duke looked tired, as if something had burned out of him too. In truth, I came to meet him, I said. I'll take you, Sindri said, without hesitation. No, his father just as fast. How many sons do you have, Duke Maladin? I asked. You see him, Alaric nodded to Sindri. I had four born alive. The eldest three burned in the Heimrift. You should go home, Jorg Ankrath. There's nothing for you in the mountains. Chapter 18 Four years earlier. Sindri caught us up before we'd got five miles from his father's hall. I'd left Makin with Duke Alaric. Makin had a way with the finding of common ground and the building of friendships. I left Reich, too, because he would only moan about climbing mountains, and because if anyone could show the Danes true berserker spirit, it was Reich. I left Red Kent also, for his Norse blood on his father's side, and because he wanted a good axe made for him. Well met, I said, as Sindri rode up between the pines. It had never been in doubt that he would give chase. He found us as we left the lower slopes and thick forest behind. You need me, he said. I know these mountains. We do need you, I said. Sindri grinned. He took off his helm and wiped the sweat from his brow, blowing hard from the ride. They say you destroyed half of Geleth, he said. He looked doubtful. Closer to a fifth, I said. Legends grow in the telling. Sindri frowned. How old are you? I felt the brothers stiffen. It can be annoying to always have the people around you think you're going to murder everyone who looks at you wrong. I'm old enough to play with fire, I said. I pointed to the largest of the mountains ahead. That one's a volcano. The smoke gives it away. What about the rest? That's Logholt. Three others have spoken in my lifetime, Sindri said. Loki, Minrir, and Valas. He pointed them out in turn. Valas had the faintest wisps of smoke or steam rising from its western flanks. In the oldest Edas, the stories tell of Halradra being the father and these four his sons. Sindri pointed to the low bulk of Halradra. But he has slept for centuries. Let's go there then, I said. I'd like to watch a sleeping giant before I poke a woken up one. These aren't people, Jorg, Makin had told me before we left. They're not enemies. You can't fight them. He didn't know what I thought I could achieve, wandering the landscape. I didn't either, but it always pays to have a look around. If I think back on my successes, such as they are, they come as often as not from the simple exercise of putting two disparate facts together and making a weapon of them. I destroyed Geleth with two facts that when laid one atop the other made something dangerous. There's a thing like that at the heart of the builder's weapons. Two chunks of magic harmless enough on their own, but forming some critical mass when pushed together. The Halradra is not so tall as its sons, but it is tall. Its lower slopes are softened by the years, black grit in the main, crunching under hoof, the rocks rotten with bubbles, so that you can crumble them in your hands, the fire so long gone that no sniff of it remains. Through the ash and broken rock, fireweed grew in profusion. Rose Bay willow herb as they had it in Master Lundist's books. The first to spring up where the fire has been. Even after four hundred years, nothing much else wanted to push its way through the black dirt. Do you see them? Gorgoth rumbled at my shoulder. The depth of his voice took me by surprise as always. If by them you mean mountains, then yes. Otherwise, no. He pointed with one thick finger, almost the width of Gog's forearm. Caves! I still didn't see them, but in the end I did. Cave mouths at the base of a sharp fall. Not that dissimilar from Gorgoth's old home beneath Mount Honus. Yes, I said, they are. I thought that sometimes perhaps Gorgoth, 
should just keep holding on to those precious words. We pressed on. Higher up, and the going gets too steep and too treacherous for horses. We left our mounts with Sim and Grumlow, continuing on foot, trudging on through a thin layer of icy snow. The peaks of Halradra's sons look broken off, jagged, forged with violence. The old man could pass as a common mountain with no hint of a crater until you scramble up through snow-choked gullies and find the lake laid out before you, sudden and without announcement. Happy now? Sindri climbed up beside me and found a perch where the wind had taken the snow from a rock. He looked happy enough himself, despite his tone. It's a sight and a half, isn't it? I said. Gorgoth clambered up with Gog on his shoulder. I like this mountain, Gog said. It has a heart. The lake is a strange blue, I said. Is the water tainted? Ice, Sindri said. The water's just melt water. A yard deep, if that. Run down off the crater slope. The lake stays frozen all year underneath. Well now, there's a thing, I said. And I had two facts by the corners. We hunkered down in the lee of some rocks a little way below the crater rim and watched the strange blue of those waters as we ate a cold meal from Alaric's kitchens. What kind of heart does the mountain have, Gog? I threw chicken bones down the slope and licked the grease from my fingers. He paused, closing his eyes to think. Old, slow, warm. Does it beat? I asked. Four times, Gog said. Since we started climbing? Since we saw the smoke as we rode in from the bridge, Gog said. Eagle! Roe pointed into the hazy blue above us. He reached for his bow. Good eyes as always, Roe. I held his arm. Let the bird fly. So? said Sindri, huddled, braids flailing in the wind. What next? I'd like to see those caves, I said. Gorgoth's observation felt more important all of a sudden, precious even. We started to make our way down, strangely a more difficult proposition than the climb, as if Halradra wanted to keep hold of us. The rock seemed to crumble under every heavy downhill step, with the ice to help any faller on his way. I caught Sindri at one turn, grabbing his elbow as the ground broke away under his heel. Thanks, he said. Alaric wouldn't be pleased to lose another son up here, I said. Sindri laughed. I would have stopped at the bottom. Gorgoth followed, kicking footholds for himself at each step. Gog scampered free, rather than risk getting squashed if the giant fell. We found Sim and Grumlow sharing a pipe, sprawled on the rocks in the sunshine, all at ease. The caves were almost harder to see as we drew closer, black caves in a black cliff with black interiors. I spotted three entrances, one big enough to grow an oak in. Something lives here, Gorgoth said. I looked for signs, bones or scat around the cave mouth. There's nothing, I said. What makes you say there is? Expressions came hard to a face like Gorgoth's, but enough of the ridges and furrows moved to let a keen observer know that something puzzled him. I can hear them, he said. Keen ears and keen eyes. I can't hear anything, just the wind. I stopped and closed my eyes, as Tutor Lundis taught me, and let the wind blow. I let the mountain noises flow through me. I counted away the beat of my heart and the sigh of breath. Nothing. I hear them, Gorgoth said. Let's go careful, then, I said. Time for your bow, Brother O. Good thing you didn't waste an arrow on that bird. We tethered the horses and made ready. I took my sword in hand. Sindri unslung the axe from his back. A fine weapon with silver chased scroll work on the blade, behind the cutting edge. And we moved in closer. I led in from downwind. An old habit that cost us half an hour traversing the slopes. From fifty yards, the wind brought a hint of the inhabitants, an animal stink faint but rank. Our friends keep a clean front doorstep, I said. Not bears or mountain cats. Can you still hear them, Gorgoth? He nodded. They're talking about food and battle. Curiouser and curiouser, I said. I could hear nothing. We came by slow steps to the great cave mouth, flanked by two smaller mouths and several cracks a man might slip through. Standing before the cave, it seemed impossible that I had missed it from across the slopes. Apart from one shattered bone wedged between two rocks, there was no sign of habitation, except for the stink. Gorgoth stepped in first. He carried a crude flail in his belt, just three thick chains on a wooden haft, set with twists of sharp metal. A leather apron kept the chains from shredding his legs as he ran. I'd never seen him take the weapon in hand, 
and somehow he seemed more scary unarmed. Gog walked behind Gorgoth with Sindri and me to flank him, then Sim and Grumlo, Roe at the rear, eyeing everything with suspicion. We can't go far, Roe said. Too dark. He didn't sound upset. Gog lifted his hand and flames sprung from his fingertips. Roe stifled a curse. I looked back out across the mountain slopes. The fan of rocks and dirt spreading from the cave mouth reminded me of something. Random thoughts scratched each other at the back of my mind, fighting for form, for the words to say what they meant. We'll go on in, I said. A little way. I want to hear what Gorgoth hears. He'd been right about the caves, after all. Toward the back of the cavern, several tunnels led into the mountain. The larger passage led up a shallow gradient. That one. We moved in. Underfoot, the tunnel lay grit-floored, strewn with small rocks, but the walls were smooth, almost slick. The shadows moved and danced as Gog followed Gorgoth, his burning hand throwing a vast shadow. Gorgoth ahead of us. Fifty yards brought us to an almost spherical chamber, with the tunnel leading on behind it, now heading up almost as steeply as the slopes outside. The fire glow gave the place memories of the cathedral at Chartres, our shadows processing over smooth rock on every side. Plato came to such a cave, I said, and saw the whole world on its walls. Your pardon? Sindri said. I shook my head. See here? I pointed to a slick depression in the rock close by, as if a giant had sunk his thumb into soft mud and left his imprint. What is it? Gog asked. I don't know, I said, but it looked familiar, like a pothole in a riverbed. I ran across to the tunnel at the back and stood at the entrance. Men didn't make these passages, nor troll or grendelkin, goblin, pixie or ghost. The air sat almost still, but moved even so, crawling from the tunnel. Cold air, very cold. Jorg, Rose said. I'm thinking, I said, not looking back. Jorg, he said again, and I turned. In the mouth of the tunnel, through which we had come, stood two trolls. I called them trolls to myself, because they looked like the trolls of my imagination. Not the rocky lumps the Danes decorated the landscape with, but lean, dangerous creatures, dark stain hide, muscles like knots in rope, laid along long limbs that ended in black talons. Crouched as they were, their height was hard to judge, but I guessed eight feet, maybe nine. They moved with quick purpose, hugging the stone. Keep the arrow, I told Roe. I couldn't see one arrow slowing either of them down, unless it went in the neck or eye. I would have called them monsters, Nucrota, mistakes like Gorgoth, except that there were two of them. A pair speaks of design, rather than accident. Hello, I said. It sounded stupid. One thin voice in that great chamber. But I could think of nothing else to say, and fighting them just didn't appeal. The only comfort to be taken was that both these pairs of black eyes were fixed on Gorgoth, rather than me. Can't you hear them? Gorgoth asked. No, I said. The leftmost troll leapt forward without the preamble of feints or growling. He threw himself at Gorgoth, reaching for his face. Gorgoth caught the troll's wrists and stopped him dead. Both monsters stood, locked together, leaning in, muscles writhing and twitching. The troll's breath escaped in quick rasps. Gorgoth rumbled. I hadn't seen him struggle with anything since he held the gate up at the haunt. Every task since then, be it unloading barrels, shifting rocks, anything, hadn't so much as raised a sweat. Roe lifted his bow again. For the second time, I caught his arm. Wait! They held each other, straining, the occasional swift readjustment of feet, troll claws gouging the rock, Gorgoth's blunt toes anchoring his weight. Muscle heaped against muscle, bones creaking with the strain, spit flecking at their lips as harsh breaths escaped. Moments stretched until they felt like minutes. My own nails bit into my palm, white knuckles on sword hilt. Something had to give. Something. And without warning, the troll slammed into the floor, a beat of silence, and Gorgoth let out a deep roar that hurt my chest and set Rose nose bleeding. Gorgoth heaved in a breath. They will serve, he said. What? I said, then. Why? The troll on the floor rolled over and got to its feet, backing to its companion. They are soldiers, he said. They want to serve. They were made for it. Made? I asked, still watching the trolls, ready to try to defend myself. It's been written in their dinner, Gorgoth said. By Ferrakind? A long time ago, Gorgoth said. They are a race. I don't know when they were changed. The builders made them, I asked, wondering. Maybe then, maybe after, Gorgoth shrugged. 
They are Grendel's children, Sindri said. He looked as if he thought he was dreaming. Made for war in the ashes of Ragnarok. They're waiting here for the final battle. Do they know what made these tunnels? I asked. And where they lead? Gorgoth paused. They know how to fight, he said. That's good too, I grinned. You're talking to them in your head, aren't you? Gorgoth managed surprise again. Yes, he said. I suppose I am. What now? Sindri said, still looking from one troll to the other, testing the edge of his axe with his fingers. We go back, I said. I needed to muse, and musing is more comfortable under a duke's roof than on a windswept volcano or buried in fetid caves. Gorgoth, tell the trolls we'll be back and to keep our visit to themselves. I looked the pair over one more time. I wondered what kind of havoc they'd wreak on a battlefield. The best kind, I thought. Let's go back, I said, and see if our perspectives have changed any after our climb. Chapter 19 Four Years Earlier The forests in the Danelaw have a character all their own, dense pines that make a perpetual twilight of the day, and an ink-black soup of each night, moon or no. Old needles deaden every footfall and hoof, leaving the dry scratchings of dead branches the only sound. In such a place it takes no leap of imagination to believe every goblin tale of the long haul, and in breaking clear once more into open air you understand that it was with the wood-axe man claimed these lands, not the battle-axe. We came back to Duke Alaric's hall early, with the cocks crying and every shadow stretching itself out over the grass, as if to point the way. A ground mist still hung in shreds around the trees, swirling where the horses stepped. A few servants were on the move, to and fro between the great hall and the kitchens, stable boys getting horses ready to ride, a baker up from the nearby village with warm loaves heaped on his cart. Two lads from the stables took our horses. I gave Brath a slap on his haunch as they led him off. A light rain started to fall. I didn't mind. The rain made the stonework glisten, falling heavier by the moment. There's a word. Glisten. Silver chains on holy trees. The gloss on lips for kissing. Dew on spider webs. Sweat on breasts. Glisten, glisten, listen. Say it until the meaning bleeds away. Even without meaning it stays true. The rain made the grey stone glisten. Not quite a sparkle, not quite a gleam, but a glisten to the soaked cobbles. A gurgle from gutters where the dirt ran and leaves twirled in fleeting rapids, bound for dark and hungry throats, swallowed past stone teeth. A piece of straw ran by my feet, arrowing the straightest path. A kayak on white water, it bobbed, plunged, surged, reached the drain, spun twice, and was gone. Sometimes the world slows and you notice every small thing, as if you stood between two beats of eternity's heart. It seemed to me I had felt something similar before, with Corian, with Sages, even Jane. The air hung heavy with the metallic scent of rain. I wondered, if I stood out there in the flood, would the rain wrap a grey life and make it shine? Should I stand, arms spread, and raise my face? Let it wash me clean, or did my stains run too deep? I listened to the fall of it, to the drumming, the drip, the pitter, and the patter. The others moved around me, handing over reins, taking saddlebags, the business of living, as if they hadn't noticed me step outside such things, as if they couldn't censor. Reich stumbled from the great hall, rubbing sleep from his eyes. "'Christ, Reich,' I said. "'We've been gone a day. How did you grow a beard?' He shrugged, rubbing at stubble near deep enough to lose his fingers in. "'When in Roma!' I ignored his bad geography, and the fact that he even knew the phrase, and asked the more obvious question, Why are you up? On the road, Reich always came last from his bedroll, and would never rise without some kind of threat or enticement. He scratched his head at that. Sindri came back from the stables and clapped a hand on my shoulder. He'll look good with a beard. We'll make a Viking of him yet. Reich frowned. She said to meet her at the end of the lake. Who said? He frowned again shrugged, and went back into the hall. I looked out across the lake. At the far end, faint through the grey veils of rain, a tent stood, a yurt, yellowed with age, a thin line of smoke escaping through the smoke hole. The strangeness came from there. That was where she waited. Sindri looked too. That's a Katri, a vulva from the north. She doesn't come often, twice when I was young. Volva? 
I asked. She knows things. She can see the future, Sindri said. A witch. Is that what you call them? He frowned. Yes, a witch. You'd best go to her. Wouldn't do to keep her waiting. Maybe she'll read your future for you. I'll go now, I said. Sometimes you wait and watch. Sometimes you walk right on in. There's not much to learn from the outside of a tent. I'll see you inside. Sindri nodded to the hall, grinned, and wiped the rain from his beard. He'd be waking his father before I got to the end of the lake, telling him about the trolls and Gorgoth. What would the good duke make of all that? I wondered. Perhaps the witch would tell me. The ground trembled once as I walked along the lake, setting the water dancing. I could smell the smoke from the witch's tent now. It put an acrid taste in my mouth and reminded me of the volcanoes. The wind picked up, blowing rain into my face. Old Tutor Lundist once taught me about seers, soothsayers, and the star watchers who count out our lives by the slow predictions of planets rolling over the heavens. How many words would be needed to tell the tale of your life? He had asked. How many to reach this point, and how many more to reach the end? Lots, I grinned and glanced away, out the narrow window to the courtyard, the gates, the fields beyond city walls. I had the twitchies in my feet, eager to be off, chasing some or other thing while the sun still shone. This is our curse. Lundus stamped and rose from his chair with a groan. Man is doomed to repeat his mistakes time and again, because he learns only from experience. He smoothed out an old scroll across the desk, covered in the pictograms of his homeland. It had pictures, too, bright and interesting in the Eastern style. The Zodiac, he said. I put my finger on the dragon, caught in a few bold strokes of red and gold. This one, I said. Your life is laid out from the moment of your birth, Jorg, and you don't get to choose. All the words of your story can be replaced by one date and place. Where the planets hung in that instant, how they turned their faces, and which of them looked toward you. That configuration forms a key, and that key unlocks all that a man will be, he said. I couldn't tell if he was joking. Lundis was always a man for inquiry, for logic and judging, for patience and subtlety. All that felt rather pointless if we walked a fixed path from the cradle to whatever end was written in stars. I'd reached the yurt without noticing. I made an abrupt stop and managed not to walk into it. I circled for the entrance and ducked through without announcement. She was supposed to know the future, after all. Listen, she said as I pushed through the flap into her tent, a stinking place of hides and hanging dead things. Listen, she said again as I made to open my mouth. So I sat cross-legged beneath the dangling husks and listened and didn't speak. Good, she said. You're better than most. Better than those bald, noisy boys, wanting so much to be men, wanting only to hear the words from their own mouths. I listened to the dry wheeze of her as she spoke, to the flap and creak of the tent, the insistence of the rain, and the complaints of the wind. So you listen, but do you hear? she asked. I watched her. She wore her years badly, and the gloom couldn't hide it. She watched me back with one eye. The other sat sunken and closed in the grey folds of her flesh. It leaked something like snot onto her cheek. You should look better after ninety winters, she sneered. She needed just the one eye to read my expression. The first fifty hard ones in the lands of fire and ice, where the true Vikings live. I would have guessed two hundred just from looking at her, from the slide of her face, the crags, warts and wattles. Only her eyes seemed young. And that disappointed me, for I'd come to seek wisdom. I hear, I said. I held my questions, because folk only came to her with questions. If she truly knew the answers, then perhaps I didn't need to ask. She reached into the layered rags and furs around her waist. The stench increased immediately, and I struggled not to choke. When her hand emerged, more a bone claw than supple fingers, it clutched a glass jar, the contents sloshing. Build a glass. She said, wetting her lips with a quick pink tongue, somehow obscene in her withered mouth. She cradled the flasks in her hands. How did we lose the art? 
There's not a man you could reach with five weeks of riding that could make this now. And if I dropped it a finger's width onto stone, gone. A thousand worthless pieces. How old? I asked. The question escaped me despite my resolution. Ten centuries, maybe twelve, she said. Palaces have crumbled in that time. The statues of emperors lie ruined and buried. And this, she held it up, and I made slow rotations in the greenish swell. Still whole. Is it your eye? I asked. The very same. She watched me with her bright one and set the other on the rug in its builder flask. I sacrificed it for wisdom, she said, as Odin did at Nimi as well. And did you get wisdom? I asked, an impertinent question perhaps from a boy of fourteen. But she had asked to see me, not I her. And the longer I sat there, the smaller and older she looked. She grinned, displaying a single rotting tooth stump. I discovered it would have been wise to leave my eye next to the other one. The eye came to rest at the bottom of the jar, aimed slightly to my left. I see you have a baby with you, she said. I glanced to my side. The baby lay dead, brains oozing from his broken skull. Not much blood, but what there was lay shockingly red on his milk-white scalp. He seldom looked so clear, so real, but a catri's yurt held the kind of shadows that invited ghosts. I said nothing. Show me the box. She held out her hand. I took it from its place just inside my breastplate. Keeping a tight grip, I held it out toward her. She reached for it, quicker than an old woman has a right to be, and snatched her hand back with a gasp. Powerful, she said. Blood dripped from her fingers, welling from a dozen small puncture wounds. The fact that there was blood to spill in those bony old fingers surprised me. I put the box back. I should warn you that I'm not taken with horoscopes and such, I told her. She licked her lips again and said nothing. If you must know, I'm a goat, I said. That's right, a fecking goat. There's a whole nation of people behind the east wall who say I was born in the year of the goat. I've no time for any system that has me as a goat. I don't care how ancient their civilization is. She gave the flask a gentle swell. It sees into other worlds, she said, as if I hadn't spoken at all. That's good, then, I said. She tapped her living eye. This one sees into other worlds, too, she said, and it has a clearer view. She took a leather bag from within her rags and set it by the jar. Rune stones, she said. Maybe if you go east and climb over the Great Wall, you will be a goat. Here in the north, the runes will tell your story. I kept my lips tight shut, remembering my pledge at last. She would tell me about the future, or she wouldn't. What she told me without questions to answer might be true. She took a handful from the bag, grey stones clacking soft against each other. Honorous Chorg Ancrath. She breathed my name into the stones, then let them fall. It seemed that they took a lifetime to reach the rug, each making its slow turns, end to end, side to side. The runes scored across them, appearing and reappearing. They hit like anvils. I can feel the shake of it even now. It echoes in these bones of mine. The Perth rune. Initiation, she said. Thurisas. Urus. Strength. She poked them aside as if they were unimportant. She turned a stone over. Woonjo, joy, face down, and here, Kano, the rune of opening. I set a finger to Thurisaz, and the vulva sucked a sharp breath over grey gums. She scowled and batted at my hand to move it. The stone cold to touch, the witch's hand colder, thin skin like paper. She hadn't spoken the rune's name in the Empire tongue, but I knew the old speech of the North from Lundis books. The thorns, I said. She flapped at me again, and I withdrew my hand. Her fingers passed swiftly over the rest, counting. She swept them all away and poured them back onto the others still in the bag. There are arrows ahead of you, she said. I'm going to be shot? You will live happy 
if you don't break the arrow. She picked up the flask and stared one eye into the other. She shivered. Open your gates. In her other hand, the Wunjo runestone, as if she hadn't put it into the bag. Joy. She turned it over, blank side up. Or oh, don't. What about Farrakind? I asked. I wasn't interested in arrows. Him. She spat a dark mess into her furs. Don't go there. Even you should know that, Jog. With your dark heart and empty head, don't go anywhere near that man. He burns. How many stones do you have in that bag, old woman? I asked. Twenty? Twenty-five? Twenty-four, she said, and laid her claw on the bag, still bleeding. That's not so many words to tell the story of a man's life, I said. Men's lives are simple things, she said. I felt her hands on me, even though one lay on the bag. And the other held the flask. I felt them pinching, poking, reaching in to pick through my memories. Don't, I said. I let the necromancy rise in me, acid at the back of my throat. The dead things above us twisted. A dry paw twitched. The black twist of a man's entrails crackled as it flexed, snake-like. As you please. Again, that pink tongue flicking over her lips, and she stopped. Why did you come here, Ikatri? I asked. I surprised myself by finding her name. People's names escape me, probably because I don't care about them. Her eye found mine, as if seeing me for the first time. When I was young, young enough for you to want me, Jorg of Ancraf. Oh yes, when I was young, the runes were cast for me. Twenty-four words, and not enough to tell all of a woman's story, especially when one of them. Is wasted on a boy. She would have to grow old waiting for. I called you here because I was told too long ago, even before your grandmother's quickened. She spat again, finding the floor hides this time. I don't like you, boy, she said. You're too prickly. You use that charm of yours like a blade, but charming doesn't work on old witches. We see through to the core, and the core of you is rotten. If there's anything decent left in there, then it's buried deeper than I care to look, and probably doomed. But I came because the runes were cast for me, and they said I should do the same for you. Fine words from a hag that smells as though she died ten years back and just hasn't had the decency to stop whittering, I said. I didn't like the way she looked at me with either eye, and insulting her didn't make me feel better. It made me feel fourteen. I tried to remember that I called myself a king, and stopped my fingers wandering over the dagger at my hip. So why would your runes send you to annoy me if there's no chance for me then, old woman? If I'm a lost cause, she shrugged, a shifting of her rags. There's hope for everyone, a slim hope, a fool's hope. Even a gut-shot man has a fool's hope. I almost spat at that, but royal spit might actually have improved the place. Besides, witches can work all manner of mischief with a glob of your phlegm and a strand of your hair. Instead, I stood and offered the smallest of bows. Breakfast awaits me, if I can find my appetite again. Play with fire, and you'll get burned," she said, almost a whisper. "You make a living out of platitudes," I asked. Don't stand before the arrow," she said. "Capital advice." I backed toward the exit. "The Prince of Arrow will take the throne," she said through tight-pressed lips, as if it hurt to speak plainly. "The wise have known it since before your father's father was born. Skilfa told me as much when she cast my runes." I was never one for fortune telling. I reached the flap and pushed it aside. Why don't you stay? She patted the hides beside her, tongue flicking over dry lips. You might enjoy it. And for a heartbeat, Catherine sat there in the sapphire satin of the dress she wore in her chamber that night. When I hit her, I ran at that. I pelted through the rain, chased by Catri's laughter. My courage sprinting ahead of me, and my appetite did not return for breakfast. While others ate, I sat in the shadows by a cold hearth and rocked back upon my chair. 
Makin came across, his fist full of cold mutton on the bone, grey and greasy. "'Find anything interesting?' he asked. I didn't answer, but opened my hand. Thurisaz, the thorns. It's no great feat to steal from a one-eyed woman. The stone ate the shadow and gave back nothing. The single rune slashed black across it. The thorns. My past and future resting on my palm. Chapter 21 Four Years Earlier The Danes are settled Vikings in the main. The blood of reavers mixed with that of the farmers they conquered. Every Dane counts his ancestry back to the north, to some bloody-handed warrior jumping from his longship. But in truth, the wild men of the fjords scorn the Danes and call them fit for our, a mistake that has seen a lot of Vikings on the wrong end of an axe. "'You're more used to me here, Makin. "'You're mad to go in the first place,' Makin said. "'It's why we came,' I said. "'Every new thing I hear about this ferrer kind "'is a new good reason not to go anywhere near him,' Makin said. "'We're here because he's gone soft on the little monster,' "'Rose said from the doorway. "'He hadn't been invited to the conversation. "'None of them had. "'But on the road, any raised voice is an invitation for an audience. "'Although strictly we weren't on the road.' We were in chambers set aside for guests in a smaller hall paralleling the Duke of Maladin's great hall. Or oh, hard on him! Wright leaned in under the door lintel, a nasty leer on him. Since I took the copper box, he seemed to feel he had license to speak his mind. I turned to the doorway. Two things you should remember, my brothers. Grumlow, Sim, and Kent appeared as faces poking out behind Reich. First, if you answer me back on this... I swear by every priest in hell that you will not leave this building alive. Second, you may recall a time when you and our late lamented brothers were busy dying outside the haunt, and whilst the Count of Renard's foot soldiers were killing you, killing Alban and Lyre and Fat Burlo, Gog had the whole of the Count's personal guard, more than seventy picked men, either as burning pools of human fat or too damn scared to move. And he was seven. So right now, the kind of man he grows into, and whether he grows up at all, is a question of far greater interest to me than whether you, sorry lot, live to see tomorrow. In fact, there are a lot of questions more important to me than whether you get a day older or not, Reich. But that one is top of the list. You still need me there, Makin said. Too many years guarding me had turned a duty into a habit, an imperative. If things go well, I won't need you, I said. And if they go badly... I don't think an extra sword or two will help. He has a small army of trolls at his beck and call, and he can set men on fire by thinking about it. I don't believe a sword will help. I left Makin still arguing, and the others slinking around like whipped dogs. Well, not Red Kent. He had his new axe. Not a new one in truth, but a fine one, forged in the high north and traded from the longships off Carlswater. Kent raised the axe to me as I left, nodded, and said nothing. Gorgoth and Gog waited for me at the Duke's storerooms, a sack of provisions between them, and wax blankets in case we needed shelter on the slopes. We set off for the Heimrift, with a fine spring morning breaking out all around us. We all walked. I'd grown used to breath, and had no desire to leave him untended on the side of a volcano. For all I knew, trolls were partial to horsemeat. I quite like it myself. Sindri caught us half a mile down the road, his plates bouncing off his back as he cantered along. Not this time, Sindri. Just me and the pretty boys here, I said. You'll want me until you're clear of the forest. The forest? We had no problems before, I said. I watched you, Sindri grinned. If you had gone wrong, I would have guided you. But you were lucky. And what should I be scared of in the forest, I asked. Green trolls, goblins, Grendel himself. You Danes have more boogeymen than the rest of the Empire put together. Pine men, he said. How do they burn? I asked. He laughed at that, then let the smile fall from him. There's something in the forest that lets the blood from men and replaces it with pine sap. They don't die, these men, but they change. He pointed to his eyes. The whites turn green. They don't bleed. Axes don't bother them. I pursed my lips. You can guide us. I'm busy today. 
These pine men will have to come to the highlands and get in line if they want a part of me. And so we walked, with Sindri leading his horse, along the forest paths he judged safe, and we watched the trees with new suspicions. By noon the woods thinned and gave over to rising moorland. We marched through waist-deep bracken, thick with stands of gorse scratching as we passed, and everywhere heather trying to trip us, clouds of pollen blazing our trail. Sindri didn't have to be told to leave. I'll wait here, he said, and nestled back in the bracken on a slope that caught the sun. Good luck with Ferrakind. If you kill him, you'll have at least one friend in the north. Probably a thousand. I'm not here to kill him, I said. Probably for the best, Sindri said. I frowned at that. If I'd had three brothers die in the Heimrift, then I would have an account to settle with the man who ruled there. The Danes, though, seemed to think of Ferrakind in the same terms as the volcanoes themselves. To take issue with him would be the same as feuding against a cliff, because your friend fell off it. I took us back to Halradra, along the paths and slopes that we first followed. As we gained height, the wind picked up and took the sweat from us. The sun stayed bright, and it seemed a good day. If this was to be our last one, then at least it had been pretty so far. We trailed along a long valley of black ash and broken lava flows. Ancient current still visible in the frozen rock. Far above us, a lone herder's hut stood dwarfed by the vast heave of the mountains around it, built in days when grass must have found a way to grow here. Unseen in the blue heavens, a cloud passed before the sun, and its shadow rippled across the expanse of silent sunlit rock arrayed east to west. Gorgoth made a deep sound in his chest. I liked that about travelling with Gorgoth. He hoarded his words, so you wouldn't know his thoughts from one moment to the next. But he never missed anything, not even those rare occasions when the myriad parts of this dirty, worn-out world of ours come into some fleeting alignment that constructs a beauty so fierce it hurts to see. Where Gorgoth held his silence, Gog normally provided enough chatter for two. In the most part, I would let it flow over me. Children prattle. It is their nature and it is mine to let it slide. Climbing Halredra for the second time, though, Gog said nothing. After so many weeks of, Why do horses have four legs, Brother Jorg? What colour is green made from, Brother Jorg? Why is that tree taller than the other one, Brother Jorg? You would think I'd appreciate a rest from it. But in truth, it grated more when he said nothing. No questions today, Gog? I asked. No. He shot me a glance, then looked away. Nothing, I asked. We carried on up the slope without speaking. I knew it wasn't just fear that kept his tongue. As a child, there's a horror in discovering the limitations of the ones you love. The time you find that your mother cannot keep you safe, that your tutor makes a mistake, that the wrong path must be taken because the grown-ups lack the strength to take the right one. Each of those moments is the theft of your childhood. Each of them a blow that kills some part of the child you were, leaving another part of the man exposed. A new creature, tougher, but tempered with bitterness and disappointment. Gog didn't want to ask his questions, because he didn't want to hear me lie. We came to the caves that I had failed to see before, wrinkled our noses at the troll stink, and passed on into the darkness. Some light, if you will, Gog, I said. He opened his hand, and fire blossomed, as if he'd been holding it in his fist all along. I led the way, through the great hall of the entrance cave, along the smooth passage rising for fifty yards to the cathedral cave, almost spherical with its potholed floor and sculpted walls. The trolls came quickly this time, a half-dozen of them insinuating themselves into the shadowed circle around Gog's flame. Gorgoth stood ready to set his strength against any of the new ones who doubted him, but they crouched and watched us, watched Gorgoth, and made no attacks. "'Why are we here?' Gorgoth asked at last. I had wondered if he would ever crack. I've chosen my ground, I said. If you have to meet a lion, then it's better if it isn't in his den. You didn't look anywhere else, Gorgoth said. I found what I wanted here. And what's that? he asked. A faint hope. I grinned and squatted down to be level with Gog. We have to meet him sometime, Gog. This problem of yours, these fires, they're going to pull you down sooner or later, and there's nothing I can do. Not even Gorgoth can help you. And the next time will be worse, and the next worse still. I didn't lie to him. He didn't want to hear me lie. A tear rolled down his cheek, then sputtered into steam. I took his hand, 
very small in mine, and pressed the stolen runestone into his palm, closing his fingers about it. You and I, Gog, we're the same. Fighters. Brothers. We'll go in there together, and come out together. And we were the same, all lying aside. Underneath it, brushing away the goodness in him, the evil in me, we had a bond. I needed to see him win through. Nothing selfless about it. If Gog could outlast what ate him from the inside out, then maybe I could too. Hell, I didn't come halfway across the Empire to save a scrawny child. I came to save me. We're going to call Farrakhine to us, I said. I glanced at the trolls. They watched me with wet black eyes. No reaction to Farrakhine's name. Do they even understand what I'm saying? No, said Gorgoth. They're wondering if you'd be good to eat. Ask them if there are other ways out of here. Ones that lead out higher up the mountain. A pause. I strained to hear what passed between them, and heard nothing but the flutter of Gog's flame. They can take us to one, Gorgoth said. Tell them Farrakind is going to come. Tell them to hide close by, but be ready to lead us out by one of these other paths. I could tell when Gorgoth's thoughts hit them. They were on their feet in a moment, black mouths stretched in silent snarls and roars, black tongues lashing over their jagged teeth. Quicker than they appeared, they were gone, lost in the darkness. Right, we're going to call Farrakind. I'm going to try to get him to help us. I steered Gog's face away from the entrance and back to mine. If things go badly, I want you to do the trick we saw in the Duke's Hall. If Farrakind tries to burn us, I want you to take the fire and put it where I show you. I'll try, Gog said. Try hard. I'd been scared of burning all my life, since the poker. Maybe before that, even. I thought of Justice howling as he burned in chains. Sour vomit bubbled at the back of my throat. I could walk away from this. I could just walk. How will we make him come here, Brother Jorg? Gog's first question of the day. The vision of me walking down the slope still filled my eyes. I would whistle in the spring sunshine and smile. Sweat trickled from beneath my arms, cool across my ribs. If Makin were here, he would say he had a bad feeling about this. He'd be right, too. I could just leave. I could just leave. If Codin were here, he would call this too great a risk, with no certain reward. He would say that, but he would mean, get the hell out of there, Jorg, because he wouldn't want me to burn. And if my father were here, if he saw me stepping toward the sunlight, taking the easy path, he would say in a voice so soft that you might almost miss it, One more, Jorg, one more. And at each crossroad thereafter, I would choose the easy path one more time. And in the end, what I loved would still burn. Make a fire, Gog, I said. Make the biggest fucking fire in the world. Gog looked at Gorgoth, who nodded and stepped back. For a long moment, measured by half a dozen slow-drawn breaths, nothing happened. Faint at first, as if it were imagination, the flame patterns on Gog's back started to flicker and move. The color deepened. Flushes of crimson ran through him, and the ash gray paled. The heat reached me, and I stepped back, then back again. The shadows had run from the cavern, but I had no time to see what they revealed. Gog pulsed with heat, like an ember in the smith's fire pulses with each breath of the bellows. Gorgoth and I retreated into the tunnel that led up from behind the cathedral cave. We stood with the heat of Gog's fire burning on our faces, and the air rolling down from behind us, icy on our necks. The flames came without sound, and the whole of the cathedral cave filled with swirling orange fire. We staggered back, losing sight of the cavern, but still blistered by the inferno. My breath came in gasps, as if the fire had burned out what I needed from the air. "'How will this help?' Gorgoth asked. "'There's only one fire.' I drew in a lungful of hot and useless air. Black dots swam across my vision. "'And Farrakind watches through it, as if it were a window to all the world.' Gorgoth caught my shoulder and stopped me falling. It seemed to take no effort and I managed a small pang of resentment at that, even as I began to slip into a darker place where his hand could not support me. I could hear nothing but my own gasps and the sound of my heels dragging as he pulled me farther back, farther up. Most of me felt hot enough to ignite spontaneously, but strangely my feet were freezing. The fire that had made no sound as it came gave a distinct woomph as it went out. It ended before I passed out entirely, and a shock of cold brought me round with a hoarse curse. What the hell? I lay in a small stream of icy water. 
The tunnel had been dry before, yet now a stream ran along it, rattling pebbles in its flow. I rolled in the freezing trickle for good measure, then used the wall to get myself vertical. Gorgoth led the way back. He'd spent a lifetime in the dark beneath Mount Honus, and his cat's eyes found him good footing whilst I stumbled behind. The little stream followed us back into the cathedral chamber, where it bubbled and steamed on the hot rocks. Gog waited where we had left him, still glowing. And Farrakind stood at the mouth of the tunnel that led to the entrance chamber. I had thought to find a man with fire in him. Farrakind was more of a fire, with a touch of man remaining. He stood in the form of a man, but as if fashioned from molten iron, such as runs from the vats of Barrow and of Guangyang. Every part of him burned, and his whole shape flickered from one posture to another. When his eyes, like hot white stars, glanced my way, his gaze seared my skin. To me, Gog! It hurt to shout, but the steam from the meltwater around my feet helped a little. The child is mine! Farrakhine spoke in the crackle of his flames. Gog scrambled toward us. Farrakhine made a slow advance. And why would you want him? I called. I couldn't get any closer without the skin melting off me. The big fire consumes the small. We will join and our strength will multiply, Farrakhine said. It seemed to me as if he spoke from memory, using what parts of the man had yet to burn away. We came to save him from that, I said. Can't you take the fire from him and leave the boy behind? Those hot eyes found me again and stared as if truly seeing me for the first time. I know you. I didn't know what to say to that. My lips felt too dry for the foolish words I might have found in other circumstances. You woke a fire of an old kind that hasn't burned for a thousand years, Farrakhine said. Ah, yes, I said. That you brought the sun to earth. Farrakhine's crackle softened, as if awed by the memory of the builder's weapon. Shadows ran across him. Gog reached us, the heat gone from him, leaving new markings. Bright flames caught in orange, across his back, chest, arms. So can you change him? Can you take the fire out of him, or enough, so he can live with it? I asked. It still hurt to breathe, and the steam from the meltwater made it hard to see. Somewhere above and behind us, the heat from Gog and Farrakhind was meeting the ancient ice at Halradra's core. Farrakhine's fire guttered and spurted, flowing over the cavern floor. I realized he was laughing. The builders tried to break the barriers between thought and matter, he said. They made it easier to change the world with a desire. They thinned the walls between life and death, between fire and not fire whittled away at the difference between this and that, even here and there. It occurred to me that Farrakhine's sanity had been one of the first things to be consumed in his own personal inferno. Can you help the boy? I asked, coughing. It's written in him. His thoughts touch fire. Fire touches his mind. He is fire-sworn. We can't change how we're written. Farrakhine stepped toward us, flames rising around him like wings readying for flight. Give me the boy, and you may leave. I've come too far for no, I said. Fire isn't patient. Fire does not negotiate. I should have known these things. Farrakhine reached toward us, and a column of white flame erupted from his hands. I had considered myself quick, but Gog moved quicker than I could think, and caught the conflagration in his arms his body shading from orange toward white heat, but none of it reaching Gorgoth or me. Behind us! I shouted. Send it back! And Gog obeyed. The tunnel behind us filled with Farrakhine's white fire, as Gog caught it on one hand and threw it away from the other. I could see nothing of the fire mage, just the white inferno boiling off him, and nothing of the tunnel, just a fierce tornado of white fire swirling away through it, up. We stood in a cocoon with furnace heat on every side, and one small boy keeping our flesh from charring to the bone. For an age we saw nothing but blinding heat, heard nothing but the roar of fire, and each moment that I thought it could last no longer, the fury built. Gog blazed, first the bright orange of iron ready for the hammer, then the white of the furnace fire, then a pure white 
like starshine. I could see the shadows of his bones, clearer by the heartbeat, as if fire were burning through him, taking substance from muscle, skin, and fat, leaving him brittle and ashen. And in an instant the fire and fury fell away, revealing Therakind, white-hot and molten, with Gog crouched, pale as silvery ash, unmoving. A torrent of meltwater rushed around us now, hip-deep, white and roaring, pouring into the main chamber through a tunnel mouth that lay dry and gritty when we first scrambled through it to escape the fire. The waters divided around Gog, and again around Farrakind, as if unable to touch the essence of fire. Gorgoth and I kept close to Gog, and the water hardly reached us. Farrakind laughed again, new pulses of flame rising from him. You thought to quench me, Jorg of Ancrath. I shrugged. It's the traditional way. Fighting fire with fire doesn't seem to have worked. Already the flow around us had started to slacken. It would take an ocean, Farrakind said. He gathered fire into his hands and let it blaze white. The child is done. Time to die, Jorg of Ancrath. If it were time... Then so be it. I had a faint hope. But it had only ever been that. At least it wouldn't be a slow fire. I drew my sword. I always thought I would have a blade in hand when the time came. I heard a roar, but not the roar of flame, somehow deeper and more distant. It would take an ocean. How about a lake? I asked, and sighted along my sword at the burning mage. A lake? Farrakind paused. The waters hit then, a black wall rushing down on the heels of the trickle around our feet. I dived at Gog, carrying him with me into the cathedral cavern, rolling to the side of the tunnel mouth. He broke, as though he were made of glass. He shattered like a toy, into a thousand sharp and brilliant pieces. I felt the sudden flash of heat. Needles of fire pierced my cheek where I hit him, my jaw, my temple. I lay amongst the scintillating shards. Gog's remains, paralyzed by a whole world of pain, curled on the gritty cavern floor, with a flood of biblical proportions blasting its way out of the tunnel, just yards behind me. In Halradra's crater, a thousand times a thousand tons of ice have lain for hundreds of years. But before that, in the distant long ago, waters flowed. How else would these tunnels be smooth, be strewn with grit and ancient mud, be scoured and potholed like the stone where rivers flow? With glacial slowness, the ice has crept where underground streams carved hidden cathedrals and long galleries, and Halradra has slept, ice-choked and silent. I couldn't expect any fire to melt enough ice to drown a fire mage, least of all for the fire mage's own fire to do the melting whilst he stood there patiently awaiting his own deluge. But I had a hope, a faint hope, that his fire and Gog's together might at least melt a passage through the ice a passage where the tunnels led, and where heat rises, a passage up. In spring and summer, Halredra's crater is a remarkable blue, the blue of a yard of meltwater lying on top of fathoms of ice, a twenty-acre lake, just a yard deep, sitting on all that ice. When a hole wide enough to swallow a wagon is melted through that ice, you discover that a yard times twenty acres is a lot. The icy water hit Farrakind in a thick column, faster than the swiftest of horses, and swept him away without pause. With the mage gone and the sparkles dying from Gog's fragments, darkness returned. I knew only pain and the roar of the waters. The knowledge that I would drown rather than burn held no interest. I only wanted it to be quick. Somehow, in the darkness and the deluge, hands found me. Troll stink! mixed with the stench of my roasted flesh, and I moved in their grasp. I cursed them, thinking only that the agony would last longer this way. I considered for a moment if they were still wondering whether I tasted good. Perhaps they liked their food part cooked. I bit one at some point, and I can say that trolls taste worse than they smell. I remember no more of it. I think they banged my head on a wall as they scrambled to escape the flood. From the Journal of Catherine Apscorin December 16th, year 98, Interregnum, Ancrath, the tall castle. My bedchamber, Mary Codden sewing in the corner chair. Rain rattling on the shutters. Madam, you send the winter running. We bask in the warmth of your smile.
That's what the Prince of Arrows said when I came down the stairway into the East Hall. Madam, not Princess, because that's how they have it in the Land of Arrow. Madam, pompous maybe, but it made me smile, for I'd been serious before, thinking of sages and the writing on his face. And even though a dead poet probably wrote Orin's lines, it felt as though Orin meant them, and had spoken them just for me. Catherine, you look good. Egan said that, while his brother bowed. Night and day, those two, or maybe morning and twilight. Orin, as blond as a jarl and handsome as the princes painted in those books, to delight little princesses before they learn that it isn't kissing that turns frogs into princes, just the ownership of a castle and some acres. Egan, with his hair short and blacker than soot, his skin still holding a stain from the summer sun, and his face that would be brutal, that would fit on a butcher or executioner. But for the fire behind it, the energy that sets the short hairs on your arms and neck on end, and what were Jorg Ancras's last words to me? Perhaps, Aunt, you have a better hand. As he invited me to finish his father's work, as he stood there, more pale than Orin, darker than Egan, his hair across his shoulders. Like a black river, he watched me and my knife. His face sharp and complicated, as if you could see there not the man he will become, but the men he might become. And why am I writing of that boy here when there are men to speak of? That boy who hit me. I don't think he tore my dress. I think he considered it though. They both asked for my hand, Orin with sweet words that I can't capture. He made me feel perfect, clean. I know he would keep me safe. Would turn his mind toward making me happy. I paint him too, Prissy. There's fire and strength in Orin of Arrow. At his core, he's iron, and every part of him is wholly alive. Egan asked with short words and long, dark looks. I think his passions would terrify Sarath, despite her dirty mouth. I think a weak woman would die in his bed, and a strong one might find it the only place she's been alive. We walked in the rose garden that Queen Rowan had planted the year before she died. Out between the keep and the curtain wall, I strolled first with Orin, since he's the elder brother by a year, and then with Egan, with Mary Codden a yard behind to chaperone us. The garden's overgrown now, not neglected, but tended without care. The roses left withered on the stems, thorns and dead flowers all bearded with frost. Orin walked without speaking to start, with only the crunch of feet in gravel to break the cold silence. His first words plumed before him. It wouldn't be easy to be my wife. Honesty is always refreshing. I told him. Why should it be so difficult? And he told me there among the roses, without bluster or pride, that he would be emperor some day, but the path to Vienne would not be easy. God had not told him to do it, nor had he laid a promise to a dying father. He didn't paint it as destiny, only duty. Orin of Arrow is, I think, that rarest of things. A truly good man with all the strengths to do what his goodness demands of him, he was right, of course. To love such a man might be easy, to marry him, much more difficult. Where Orin first thought and then spoke about the future, Egan spoke without hesitation and about the now. All they shared was honesty. Egan told me he wanted me, and I believed him. He told me he would make me happy, and how. I'm sure if I'd turned around, Mary's face would have been as red as mine. Egan spoke of his horses, the battles he'd fought in, and the lands he would take me to. Some of it was boasting, sure enough, but in the end he spoke of his passions: killing, riding, travelling, and now me. It may be shallow of me, but to be counted among the simple, primal pleasures of a man like Egan of Arrow is a compliment. And yes, he may see me as a prize to be won, but I think I would be equal to his fire, and that he could find himself well matched. I told them I would have to consider. Sarah thinks I'm mad not to choose one and jump at the chance to leave Ancrath. Mary Codden said I should choose Orin. He has more land, more prospects, and enough fire to melt her, but not so much as to scorch her. But I chose to wait. February eighth, year ninety nine, Interregnum, Tall Castle, Library, cold and empty. Sarah has squeezed out her Ancrath brat. She howled about it, loud enough for half the castle to know more than they ever wanted. About the business of pushing a big slimy head through a hole where even fingers feel tight, she sent me away after only a few hours, for my sulking. She said, "Truly, I was glad to go. I should be happy for her. I should be thankful they both lived. I do love her, and I suppose I will come to love the boy. It's not his fault. He's an Ancrath. 
but I'm scared. It wasn't sulking. It was fear. She howled the rest of the day and into the night before she got it out of her. I knew she had a dirty mouth, but the things she shouted near the end. I wonder how the servants will look on her now, how the table knights will watch their queen behind their visors. I'm scared, and this quill puts the fear wavering into each letter. I'm trembling, and I have to write slow and firm, just be able to read what I've set down. I missed my time last month, and again this month. I think before the year is out, it'll be me screaming, and not caring what I say or who hears. And there won't be flags out and prayers in chapel for my bastard, not like there were for the little Prince Degrin at midnight, not even if my baby has the same black hair slime plastered to its head and the same dark eyes watching out of a squashed-up face. I hate him. How could he? How could he spoil everything? I dreamed of Jorg last night, coming to me, and my belly all fat, taut and hot and stretched, stretching like the bastard wanted out of me, little hands sliding beneath my skin. I dreamed Jorg brought a knife with him. Or it was my knife, the long, narrow one, and he cut me open, like drained guts fish in the kitchen, and he pulled the baby out, scarlet and screaming. I should tell somebody. I should go to Friar Glen with the story. How Jorg raped me. And seek forgiveness. Though Christ knows why I should be the one to ask. I should go. They would send me to the Holy Sisters at Frau Rock. But I hate that man. That stocky friar with his blank eyes and thick fingers. I don't know why, but I hate him even more than Jorg Ankrath. He makes my skin want to drop off and crawl away. Or I could ask someone to help me lose it. They had old mothers in the slum quarter in Scorin who could grind up a bitter paste and the babies would fall out of the women who went to them, tiny and dead. But that was in Scorin. I don't know who to ask here. Mary Codden, maybe, but she's too good, too clean. She would tell Sarath, and Sarath would tell King Oliden, and who knows what he would do to me for spoiling his plans, for not playing his game of statehood like a good pawn, for falling off the board. Better I should marry Prince Orin or Egan, quickly before it shows. Egan wouldn't wait for the wedding. He would be on me in a moment. He would never know it wasn't his. Orin would wait. Chapter 22 Wedding Day Where's Codin, damn it? Back down there, Watchmaster Hobbs pointed down the valley. The grey rear guard of the watch sketched a ragged line ahead of the foremost of Arrow's troops. Should have left them in their castle, Jorg, Makin said heaving a breath between every other word. He's too old for running. I spat. Keppin's a hundred if he's a day, and he'd be up and down this mountain before you'd broke fast, Sir Makin. He might be sixty, Makin said. A whack older than Codden in any case, I'll grant you. Watch Master Hobbs joined us on the ridge, with Captain Stodd beside him, his short beard white against a red face. Well? Hobbs said. I watched him. Sire? He added. It's easy to lose faith on the mountain, but also to find it. Somehow being a few thousand feet closer to God makes all the difference. Hobbs had good reason for his doubts in any case. Above us, the valley narrowed to a steep-sided pass, a choke point that would slow three hundred men to the point where the men of Arrow might finally get to blood their swords after their long chase. Above that, the snow line and the long climb to Blue Moon Pass, blocked at this time of year despite the promise of its name. Below us, ten times our number, and more, filled the valley, a carpet of men in constant motion, the sun glittering off helms, shields, the points of sword and spear. Let's wait for Codin, I said. Even Codin needed his faith restored. Sire! Hobbs bowed his head. He took his bow in hand and waited, his breath heavy in his chest. A good man, or if not good, solid. Father picked him from the royal guard for the forest watch, not as punishment, but to reward the watch. I looked away from the seething mass of men to the peaks, snow-clad, serene. The snow line waited for us not far above the choke point. The wind carried fresh snow, icy crystals in a thin swirl. None of us felt the cold. Ten thousand mountain steps burned in my legs, leaving them to tremble and warming my blood close to boiling point. To the west I could see God's finger. The tiredness in me was nothing compared to what I felt the day I hauled myself onto the tip of that finger, and lay as dead beneath the bluest sky. I lay there for hours, and in the end I stood, leaning into the teeth of the wind, and drew my sword. When you climb, 
Take nothing that is non-essential. I took a sword, strapped across my back. There's a song behind the swinging of a sword. On God's finger, it can be heard more clearly. I had climbed chasing the memory of my mother's music, but the spire had sung me a different song. Perhaps it's that heaven is closer. Perhaps the wind brings it. Either way, I heard the sword song that day, and I made my blade cutter, slicing the gale, spinning, turning, striking high, then low. I danced to the sword song in that high place for an hour, maybe more, wild play with an endless drop on every side. And then, before the sun fell too low, I left the blade on the rocks, an offering to the elements, and started down. Standing on God's finger, I had first understood why men might fight for a place, for rocks and streams, no matter who calls themselves king there. The power of place. I felt it again at the head of the valley, with the hordes of arrows swarming toward me. What ho, Codin? I said, as my chancellor staggered to us. You look half dead. He hadn't the breath for a reply. Do you have what I gave you? I asked. At the time, I hadn't known why I gave it to him, only that I should. Still gasping, Codin shrugged off his pack and dug into it. Be glad I didn't drop it just to keep ahead of the enemy, he said. I took the whistle from him. A highland whistle, such as the goat herds use, a foot long, with a leather-washed piston. I always trust you to deliver, Codin, I said, though I had Macon carry a second, and had a third with Keppen. Trust is a fine thing, but try not to build plans upon it. We're none of us local men, I said to my captains, voice raised for the watchmen starting to gather round. Well, you are. I pointed to a fellow in the second rank, but most of us were born and raised in Ancraft. The last of the watch were drawing in now, the men of Arrow a couple of hundred yards farther back, toiling over broken rock. You're here with me, men of Ancreth, because you're my best warriors, because you learn to fight in lands that are hard to defend and that others want to take. These highlands of ours, however, are easier to protect and hold bugger all save stones and goats. That got a laugh or two. Some of the watch still had go in them. Today, I said, we all become highlanders. I took the whistle, held it high, and drove the piston home. Not too hard, because that spoils the tone. It's a steady pressure, gives the best results. A goat whistle will carry for miles across the mountains. It's pitched to let the wind take it, and to bounce from rock to rock. One long blast would reach almost back to the haunt, certainly far enough to reach each and every highlander I had hidden on the high slopes overlooking our path up the mountain. And not just any highlanders, these but the men who had held these particular slopes from generation to generation. The men who, like their fathers and grandfathers, would take a rock for a walk. They kept their secrets well, the men of Renar. But from the tip of God's finger, that day years before, it had all been revealed to me. It took the blast of seven trumpets to bring down the walls of Jericho, but they weren't stacked to fall. One blast of a herder's whistle set the mountainsides moving in the Renar highlands. On both sides of the valley, along the full length, a dozen individual rock slides. The Highlanders know their slopes with an intimacy that puts lovers knowing of each other's curves to shame. Big stones poised to fall, boulders on edge with levers set and ready, toppled with a shove and a grunt, rolling, colliding, cascading one into several, into many, into too many. We felt the ground tremble beneath our feet, the noise, like a millstone grinding, rattled teeth in loose sockets. In moments, the whole valley had been set in motion, and arrows thousands vanished as the dust rose and stone churned flesh into bloody paste. Well, thank you, Codin. Much appreciated. I handed him back the whistle. Hobbs, I said, when the dust clears enough for a good shot, if you could have the men knock down anyone still standing. Christ bleeding, Makin said, staring into the valley below us. How... Topology, I said. It's a kind of magic. And what now, King Jorg? Codin asked, faith restored, but still focused on the numbers. Knowing our chances against seventeen or sixteen thousand were scarcely better than our chances against twenty thousand. Back down, of course, I said. We can't attack from up here now, can we? Chapter 23 Wedding Day The journey back to the haunt took us over fresh territory, a new and broken surface, littered with dead men turned into ground meat, and here and there, along the way, the cries of live ones trapped beneath us. We moved on, 
the grey of the watch's tatter robes renewed with rock dust, the men pale with powdered stone and with horror. The prince's army encircled the haunt now, archers on the heights, siege machinery being hauled into place, all my troops at the castle crowded within the walls, space or not. There was no standing against the foe on open ground. I could see units of bowmen descending in long files, presumably ordered east to meet our advance in light of the recent massacre. The prince looked to be a fast learner. He anticipated my renewed attack. It didn't seem likely that he would consider my three hundred men a mere nuisance this time. He shouldn't be in a hurry, Macon said beside me. He'll reduce the walls and thin the ranks first, said Codin. He doesn't need to get inside until the snows come, the big snows, said Hobbs. Inside by the big snows, winter by the fire, over the passes when the spring clears them. He wants in today, I told them. Tomorrow by the latest. He'll go through the front gate. Why? Codin asked. He didn't argue, but he wanted to understand. Why waste a good castle? I said. A big push, a surrender, a dose of mercy, and he has a new stronghold, a new garrison, and a small repair to make on the entrance. He doesn't do half measures any more than I do. Go in hard, fast, get the job done. A dose of mercy? Macon asked. You think that famous Arrow Mercy has survived recent events? Maybe not, I said, my smile grim. But I don't intend to offer any either. Mark me, old friend. Nobody gets out alive. Not this time. Red Jorg! Macon clapped his hands to his chest, as he had at Remagen Fort years before. A red day, I said. I dipped two fingers into something that lived and laughed just hours ago, and drew a crimson line down my left cheek then the right. As we made our way back down the valley, I fiddled with the copper box in its leather sack on my hip. All day I had felt sages trespassing through the edge of my imaginations, the half-dreams and daydreams to which he could find paths. My own sources, a spy network far less sophisticated than most of the hundred maintained, told me the Prince of Arrow had a second army, far smaller than the one at my gates, headed for Ancreth and the tall castle presumably to ensure my father kept his troops indoors. There seemed no reason for sages to be haunting my dreams, unless he had joined Arrow, when the balance of power became clear, and now served as the prince's adviser, seeking, of course, to own his mind, rather than merely guide it. Then again, the dream which might be keeping himself at the tall castle. It might be that sages sought to know my plans, in order to sell them to Arrow, and buy Ancrath's independence for my father. Either way, I wasn't going to show them to him. I snagged the thread of memory that I'd been fishing for, and pulled at it. The pre-laid plans that I stored in the box always emerged as sudden inspiration, moments of epiphany where disparate facts connected. I drew on the thread of my schemes, but this time, something went wrong. This time, despite my care, the box cracked open, a hair's breadth, and I saw in my mind's eye a dark light bleeding from beneath the lid. I hammered it down in an instant, and it closed with a schnick. For the longest moment, I thought that nothing had escaped. Then, the memory lifted me. Hello, Jorg, she says, and my clever words desert me. Hello, Catherine, and we stand among the graves, with the stone girl and the stone dog between us. And blossom swells like pink snow as the wind picks up. And I think of a snow globe broken long ago, and wonder how all this will settle. You shouldn't be out here alone, I say. I'm told there are bandits in these woods. You broke my vase, she says, and I'm pleased that her tongue has turned traitor too. Her fingers return to the spot where I hit her, where the vase shattered and she fell. I've put her loved ones in the ground, but she talks about a vase. Sometimes her hurt is too big, and we skirt around the edge of it, looking for our way in. To be fair, you were about to kill me, I say. She frowns at that. I buried my dog here, I tell her. She has me saying foolish things already, telling her secrets she has no right to know. She's like that knock on the head I took from Orin of Arrow. She steals the sense from me. Hannah is buried there. She points. Her hand is very white and steady. Hannah? I ask. Thunder on her brow, green eyes flash. The old woman who tried to throttle me? I ask. An image of a purple face floats before me, framed with grey wisps my hands locked beneath her chin. She did not, Catherine says, 
but each word is more quiet than the one before, and the conviction runs from her. She wouldn't. But she knows she did. You killed Galen, she says, still glaring. It's true, I say, but he was a heartbeat away from stabbing his sword through my back. She can't deny it. Damn you, she says. You've missed me then, I say, and I grin because I'm just pleased to see her, to breathe the same air. No, but her lips twitch, and I know she's thought of me. I know it, and I'm ridiculously glad. She tosses her head and turns, stepping slowly as if hunting her thoughts. I watch the line of her neck. She wears a riding dress of leather and suede, browns and muted greens. The sun finds a hundred reds in her coiled hair. I hate you, she says, better than indifference. I step after her, moving close. Lord, but you stink, she says. You said that the first time we met, I say. At least it's an honest stink from the road, horse and sweat. Smells better than the court intrigue, at least to me. She smells of spring. I'm close now, and she's stopped walking from me. I'm close, and there's a force between us, tingling on my skin, under my cheekbones, trembling in my fingers. It's hard to breathe. I want her. You don't want me, Jorg, she says, as if I had spoken it. And I don't want you. You're just a boy, and a vicious one at that. The line of her mouth is firm, her lips pressed to a line, but still full. I can see the angles of her body, and I want her more than I have wanted anything. And I am built of wants. I can't speak. I find my hands moving toward her, and force them still. Why would you be interested in the sister of a scorn whore, in any case? She asks, her frown returning. That makes me smile, and I can speak again. What? I have to be reasonable now? Is that the price for growing up? It's too high. If I can't take against the woman who replaced my own mother, can't make childish insults, it's too high a price, I tell you. Again the twitch of her lips, the quick hint of a smile. Is my sister a whore? In truth, I have no evidence either way, I say. She smiles a tight smile and wipes her hands on her skirts, glancing at the trees as if looking for friends or for foes. You wouldn't want me reasonable, I say. I don't want you at all, she says. The world isn't shaped by reasonable men, I say. The world is a thief, a cheat, a murderer. Set a thief to catch a thief, they say. I should hate you for Hannah, she says. She was trying to kill me. I walk to the grave, Catherine pointed out. Should I apologize to her? I can speak to the dead, you know. I stoop to pick a bluebell, a flower for Hannah's grave. But the stem wilts in my hand, the blue darkening toward black. You should be dead, she says. I saw the wound. I pull up my shirt and show her. The dark line where father's knife drove in, the black root spreading from it, threading my flesh, diving in toward the heart. She crosses her own chest, a protection quickly sketched. There's evil in you, Jorg, she says. Perhaps, I say. There's evil in a lot of men. Women, too. Maybe I just wear it more plainly. I wonder, though. First Corian, then the necromancer's heart. I could blame them for my excesses, but something tells me that my failings are my own. She bites her lip, steps away, then straightens. In any case, I have my heart set on a good man. For all my cleverness, I hadn't thought of this. I hadn't thought of Catherine's eyes on other men. Who? is all I can find to say. Prince Orin, she says. The Prince of Arrow. And I'm falling. I hit the rocks with a curse and skinned a palm, saving my face. Makin pulled me to my feet sharp enough. Kings fall in battle, he said, not tripping up on the way. It took me a moment to shake the memory off. Still, there's little better than a hard reunion with the ground and blood on your hands to haul a man back into the here and now. The mountains, impending snow, and an enemy many thousands strong. Real problems, not rogue memories best forgotten. I'm fine. I patted the sack on my hip. The box was still there. Let's break this arrow. Chapter 24 Wedding Day From the heights, even Arrow's many thousands looked small, arrayed across the slopes before the haunt and along the ridges to the east. The sight might have given me heart had not my castle looked smaller still, swamped on three sides by men and more men, the winter sun picking glimmers from spear and helm. Whether the Prince of Arrow's plans were in line with my prediction of an overwhelming assault, or with Makin and Codin's siege, 
wasn't yet clear. What was clear was that our second attack would cost us. On our line of approach, the prince's troops spread out before the main body of his army in a scattered buffer zone, foot soldiers under the best cover the slopes could offer, with additional defences hastily cobbled from overturned carts and heaped supplies. They kept under cover whilst the watch picked whatever targets they could. Our arrows were killing or wounding men in their scores, but all the time the archer columns ordered down from the eastern ridges drew closer. Perhaps a thousand of the prince's four thousand archers would be returning fire within five minutes. They're not happy, Macon said. He didn't look too happy himself. No, I said. The roar from the prince's army waxed and waned as the wind rose and fell. No true warrior holds any love for archers or archery. Death wings in unseen from a distance, and there's little that skill or training can do to save you. I remembered four years back, Michael sliding from the grey, as if he'd just forgotten how to ride. I didn't relish the arrival of the prince's archers myself. My little tale of wickedness and gambles could be cut short easily enough by the sudden arrival of the right arrow in the wrong place. We should leave now, Codin said. They won't follow us until the archers join them, I said. And why do we want them to follow us? The rock slides. Well, that was impressive. I won't deny that. But it can't happen again, Codin said. Can it? Hobbs at my right hopeful. No, I said. But we need to draw as many men from the fight as we can. The castle can work for us, but not with these odds. And remember, gentlemen, the beautiful queen. Me something. Miana, Codin said. Yes, her. Queen Miana, remind the men who we're fighting for, Hobbs. And that was Codin for you. He watched and he remembered. The man had a mixture of decency and reserve in him that struck a chord with me, qualities I would never own but could appreciate nonetheless. He'd been the first man of Ancrath I met on my return four years back. I'd thought him tall back then, though now I overtopped him. I'd thought him old, though now he had grey amid the black, and I thought him in his prime, I'd elevated him from a guard captain to watchmaster of the forest watch, because something in him told me he wouldn't let me down. That same quality put the chamberlain's robe around his shoulders a year later. Across the slope, old Keppen had his archers lofting their flights high into the air, passing over the scattered foot soldiers to rain down, unaimed, in the midst of the prince's forces. I could see the first of the archers emerging from the ranks, men of Belpan with their tall bows and the prince's own levies with the dragons of arrow painted red on their leather tabards. Time to go. I slipped the purple ribbon over the end of my shortbow and held it high for the watch to see. In retrospect, it would have been better to have somebody else do it, somebody unimportant. Fortunately, the prince's archers were still finding clear ground to shoot from, and the shafts aimed at me went wide, at least wide enough to miss me. A man ten yards ahead of us jerked back with an arrow jutting from under his collarbone. Damn! said Codin. I turned sharp enough toward him. Something down the slope held his gaze, but I couldn't tell what. Problem? I asked. Codin held up scarlet fingers. It didn't make sense at first. I tried to see where he was cut. Easy! Makin moved to support him as he staggered. At last I saw the arrow, just the flights showing, black against the dark leather over his guts. Ah, oh, hell! A gut-shot man doesn't live. Everyone knows that. Even with silks under the leathers to twist and wrap the arrow, so it pulls out easy and clean, you don't live past a gut shot. Carry him, I said. The others just looked at me. For a moment, I saw the Norse witch, felt the intensity of her single eye and the mockery in her withered smile. Even a gut shot man has a fool's hope, she'd said. Had she been looking past me at this day? Damn prophecy and damn prediction! I spat, and the wind carried it away. Sorry? Makin looked at me, even Cod instead. Get some men here, pick him up and carry him, I said. Jorg! Makin started. I'll stay here, Codin said. It's a good view. I liked Codin from the start. Four years with him at the haunt just scored the feeling deeper. I liked him for his quick mind, for his curious honesty, and for his courage in the face of hard choices. Mostly, though, I liked him because he liked me. It's a better view from up there, I gestured up the slope. This will kill me, Jorg. He looked me in the eyes. I didn't like that. It put a strange kind of hurt on me. Arrows in the guts don't kill quick. But the wound sours. You bloat and sweat and scream. 
then die. Two days, maybe four. Had a brother once that lasted a week, and then some. I never once met a man who could show me a scar on his belly and tell how it hurt like a bastard when they pulled the arrow out. You owe me, Codin, I said. Your duty to your king is the least of it. That arrow probably will kill you, but not today. And if you think I have a sentimental side that will give you a quick death here and lose several days of useful advice when I need it most, you're wrong. I've never met a man who lived after that kind of hurt. But I heard of one. It did happen. We carry him up to the rockfall. We send men ahead to make a hidey hole in the loose stone. We put him there and cover him up. If he's lucky, we come back for him later. If not, he's already buried, I said. Already men of the watch were crowding around, linking arms to lift Codin. No complaints. They liked him too. Chapter 25 Wedding Day None of the men who carried Codin up the mountain breathed the word of complaint. They had no breath for it, but if they had, still they would have held their peace. Codin led men by example. Somehow he made you want to do it right. I love you, Jorg, as my king, but also as a father loves his son, or should. There are some things two men can only say to each other when arrows are raining down, and one of them lies mortally wounded, walled away in a rough void amid a mass of fallen rock, and thousands of enemy troops are closing in. Even then, it's uncomfortable. We carried Codin, Captain Law Codin, formerly of Ancrath, High Chancellor of the Renar Highlands. We carried him ahead of the fresh and surging army of Arrow, fueled as they were by the desire to avenge the thousands crushed beneath our rock slides. The archers of the watch held every ridge until the last moment, loosing flight after flight into the oncoming soldiers, making them climb their dead as well as the mountain. And tired as they were, the men of my watch still opened a lead on the enemy, even bearing Codden in their arms. The troops sent ahead to the loose rubble of the morning's rock slides found a suitable cavity between two large boulders freed amongst the general fall. They enlarged the void and set aside rocks suitable for sealing and hiding the space. By the time we reached the cave, the men carrying Codin were scarlet with his blood, and he groaned at each jolt of their advance. Captains Keppen and Harold massed their commands at separate points across the slope and shot the last of their arrows to hold our enemy's attention and to kill them, with the narrow neck of the valley ahead of us, and the snow line glistening high above that, and the wind picking up, filching warmth with quick sharp fingers, and the men of Arrow panting and gasping as they closed the last few hundred yards. I lay on the rock, and spoke through gaps to the dying man below. You shut your mouth, old man, I said. You'd need to dig me out to stop me, he gasped, or run away. And I've a mind you're not running. Not just yet. He coughed and tried to hide a groan. You need to hear such words, Jorg. You need to know that you're loved. Not just feared. You need to know it. To ease what poisons you. Don't. You need to hear. Again the cough. I'm coming back for you when this is done, Codin. So don't say anything you'll regret. Because I will hold it against you. I love you for no good reason, Jorg. I've no sons, but if I did, I wouldn't want them to be like you. You're a vicious bastard at the best of times. Careful, old man. I can still stick a sword through this crack and put you out of my misery. A watchman screamed and fell to my left, an arrow through his neck. Just like Michael, but louder. Another shaft hit the rock behind me and shattered. I love thee for no good reason. Codin said, falling back into some accent from wherever he was born, his voice weak now. I could hear the thud of boots, steel on steel, shouts. But I do love thee well. I looked up, blinking. Down the slope, Makin cut into the first of the enemy to reach us, an expert sword against exhausted common swords. No contest. At least until the odds mounted. Do something about that girl. Codin's voice with new strength. Miana? I asked. She should be safe in the castle, for now at least. Catherine! Of Scorin! Another cough. These things seem terribly important when you're young. Matters of the heart and groin. 
They fill your world at eighteen. But believe me, when you're the wrong side of forty-five, and the past is a bright haze, they're more important still. Do something. You're haunted by many ghosts. I know that, though you hide it well. The men of the watch massed before our position now, in full melee against the first few dozen of the enemy, with more pressing in moment by moment. They knew the bow like lovers know each other, but they could fight hand to hand too. Fighting on a steep slope of broken rock is not a skill you want to learn for the first time when somebody is trying to kill you, and the watch had had years to learn the art. So for now, they held. Miss an opportunity like Catherine, and it will haunt you longer and more deeply than any ghost you keep now," Codin said. Another arrow hit closer than any before. Run! I shouted. Whatever other wisdom Codin had been hoarding, would have to keep. There's a time for sentimental chatter, and none of it is on a mountain whilst being shot at. Run! I shouted, but I didn't raise the purple ribbon on a short bow, because I had a plan to carry out, and no part of it involved being hit by arrows. Chapter Twenty Six: Wedding Day. I'd buried brothers before, even friends, but never alive. We left Codin in his tomb, not dead, but with his passage booked. We made a messy retreat, fighting across the ground where we'd buried him. I joined the fray and cut a path through the men of Arrow, as if I was planning to make my way right back to the haunt. There's something about a fight that makes you forget your troubles. Mainly, it's that all your troubles are suddenly very small in the face of the new problems swinging your way with sharp edges on them. Perhaps there's something wrong with me. Perhaps it's part of those three steps I took away from the world of reasonable men, of good men. But there's little that is more satisfying to me than a well-blocked sword blow, followed by a swift repast, and the scream of an enemy. God, but the noise and feel of a blade shearing through flesh is as sweet as any flute speaking out its melody, provided it's not my flesh, of course. It can't be right, but there it is. I fought well, but the enemy just kept coming. As if dying were the only thing on their list today, we fell back and left them slipping in blood, tripping on corpses. Most of us managed to find the space to turn and run. Many of us didn't. About two thirds of the watch made it through the neck of the valley, and scrambled up the steeper slopes onto the broad shoulder of the mountain above. The rest, even if it were only a light wound that slowed them, was swallowed by the advancing army. Wind is the cruelest cold. Exposed on the mountainside, we felt those sharp fingers stealing our warmth. All the running and climbing didn't matter. The wind put a chill in you, even so, taking your strength one pinch at a time. We struggled on through the wind, a ragged bunch without ranks or squads. The snow blinding now, small flakes too cold to stick to the rocks. Not far above us, the snow line glittered, the whiteness hiding the folds and hollows, making it all of a likeness. Whiteness stretching up to Blue Moon Pass, snow-choked and useless for escape, stretching beyond to the peak of Mount Butrang, and past that, the sky. I caught Makin up, grey-faced and staggering. He looked at me, just a glance, as if he were too tired to do anything but hang his head. He hadn't the breath for words, but his look, quick as it was, told me we were going to die on these slopes. Maybe on the next ridge, maybe farther up, on the snow, with our blood making pretty crimson patterns against the white. Stick with me," I said. I had a little go left in me, not much, but some. I have a plan. I hoped I had a plan. The wind numbed my face. On the right, where Gog had left me scarred, it felt good. That twisted flesh had never stopped burning, as if shards of him found the bones in my jaw and cheek and lodged there with fire trapped inside. The wind made my face feel solid, like one block that would crack if I spoke again. I enjoyed the relief. I've become good at finding crumbs of comfort. Sometimes they're all you have to eat. Screams behind us as the slowest men of the watch met the fastest men of Arrow. I had my head down, concentrating on one foot, then the next, hauling in one breath and throwing it out to make room for the one after. Beside me, Makin looked to have retreated into that closed and lonely place that we all reach if we keep digging. Dig a little deeper than that, and you're in hell all of a sudden. The snow took me by surprise. One moment, thump, thump, thump over rocks, and the next, a silent wade through deep white powder. It took maybe four strides to go from bare rock 
to snow past my knees. Another hundred strides, and my feet were as numb as my face. I wondered if I was dying piece by piece, a slow introduction rather than the traditional unexpected embrace. The snowfield started to get us killed. Pushing a path through snow is hard work. Following in the beaten trail of two hundred men is easier. More men were caught. Natural selection had set the toughest of Arrow's men at our heels, with the weaker troops still struggling through the neck of the valley below the snow line. Up there, I pointed to a place with nothing to distinguish it from any other acre of white. I could feel the box hot against my hip. I picked up the pace and left Macon plodding. Up there, I didn't know why, but I knew. I took the box in my hand and ran on, lungs filling with blood. Well, that's how it felt. The thing that tripped me wasn't a rock. The snow had all the rocks covered deep under our feet. What tripped me was something long and hard and near the surface. Broomstick came to mind as I fell. Then the box went schnick, and my mind filled with entirely new things, old things. Chapter Twenty Seven, Wedding Day, Schnick, and the box opens. Memory drags me back to Renat Forest to stand amongst gravestones and wildflowers. In the spring sunshine, in any case, I have my heart set on a good man. Catherine says, "Who?" I ask. Prince Orin, she says, the Prince of Arrow. No, I say, I don't want to say anything, but I speak. I don't want to admit any kind of interest, any form of weakness, but none of this is going as I planned, and plans are what I'm good at. No, she asks. You object? You'd like to offer a proposal? Your father is my guardian. You should go and discuss the matter with him. It wasn't supposed to happen like this. None of the others made me this way. Not Sarah leading me astray as a child almost. Not Sally bought and paid for. Not Renard's serving maids, ladies at court, bored wives of nobles, comely peasant girls. Not the ones on the road that the brothers took and shared. None of them. I want you. I say, the words are hard. They have awkward shapes. They leave my mouth clumsy and ill-formed. How romantic, she says. Her scorn withers me. You like me because I'm pleasing to your eye. You please more than my eye, lady. I say. Would you kill Sarath? She asks. For a moment, I think she's asking me to do it. Then I remember she's not like me. Maybe. Does she please my father? I don't say does he love her. He has never loved, and I don't lie. If it would hurt my father to lose her, then yes, maybe. No, I don't think anything pleases Oliden. I can't even imagine what would, though he did laugh that day when you killed Galen. She says, "I might kill Sarath in case you're wrong or trying to protect her." I say, "I don't know why I can't lie to her, but you're probably telling the truth. My father has found little in this world that doesn't disappoint him." She steps toward me, and although she's coming closer, her eyes get more distant. I can smell her scent, lilacs and white musk. You hit me, Jorg, she says. You were going to stab me. You hit me with my mother's vase. Her voice is dreamy, and broke it. I'm sorry, I say, and the strange truth is that I am. I wasn't made to be this way. She's reaching for something hidden in the folds of her riding dress, and a fawn swayed. I wasn't meant to be the prize princes compete for. Or the container to grow their babies in, damn that! Would you want to be a token, or made just to grow babies and raise children? I'm not a woman, I say. It's just my lips filling the pores while the questions, or rather the new images they paint of her, bounce around my mind. I see her pull the knife from her skirts, a long blade like those for slotting through chinks in armor, when you have your foe pinned. Only not so sturdy. This one would break if the man twisted and might not reach the heart. I'm not supposed to see it. I'm supposed to be watching her eyes, her mouth, the heave of her breasts, and I am. But often I see more than I'm supposed to. Can't I want something more? She asks. Wanting is free. I can't stop watching her. My glance touches the knife only now and then. Her eyes don't see me. I don't think she knows what her hands are doing. The right gripping a hilt, the left on her belly, clawed like she wants to tear her way in. Do I have to be a monster? Do I have to be a new queen of red to? I catch her wrist as she drives the knife at me. She's stronger than I imagined. We both look down at my hand, dark on her white wrist, and the thin blade quivering 
with its point an inch from my groin. A low blow. I twist her arm, but she drops the knife before I make her. What? She stares at her hand and mine, mouth open. You're making a habit of trying to stab me, I say. The bitterness rises in me. I taste it. I killed our child, Jorg. Her laugh is too high, too wild. I killed it. I swallowed a sour pill from Saramwick. She lives here. Catherine whips her head around, unfocused, as if expecting to see the crone among the trees. I know of Saramwick. I've seen her gather her herbs and fungi. I crept to her hut once, almost close enough to look in. But I didn't want to go closer. It smelled of burned dog. What are you talking about? I ask. She looks beautiful. She curses being a woman. But here I am, forgetting even the knife on the ground. The knife she almost buried in me. Forgetting it because of the curve of her neck, the tremble of her lips. Want makes fools of men. You hit me, and then you took me. You put your seed in me. She spits. It misses my face, but drips in my hair and wets my ear. And I drove it out, with a sour pill and a paste that burned. She grins, and I can see the hatred now. She sees me clear for once, head down, hair framing her, eyes dark. She shows her teeth. She dares me. I remember her lying there in the sapphire pool of her dress, senseless. The voice from the briar, maybe mine, maybe Corian's, or something of both, told me to kill her. My father would give that advice. The hardest line, want makes fools of men. But I didn't kill her. The voice told me to rape her, too. To just take her. But I only touched her hair. What I wanted couldn't be taken. Nothing to say, Jorg? She spits again. This time it's in my face. I blink. Warm spittle cools on my cheek. She wants me angry. She doesn't care what I might do. I bled your baby out before he was even big enough to see. And I don't know what to say. What words would serve? I wouldn't believe me. I have to believe my memory. Things have been taken from it in the past, but never added. But who else would give Jorg of Ancrath the benefit of the doubt? Not me. I fold Catherine's arm up behind her and walk her through the graveyard, back the way I came. There are white marks where my fingers touched her skin. Did I grip her that hard? Imagination has put my hands on her many times, but this feels as though I've broken something precious and I'm carrying the pieces, knowing they can't be reassembled. You're going to do it again! The anger is leaked from her. She sounds confused. No! I say. We walk on. Brambles catch at her dress. Her riding boots leave heel marks a blind man could follow. I've left my horse tied, she says. This isn't the Catherine I left on the floor that day. That Catherine was sharp, clever. This one is dazed, as though just waking. I'm going to marry the Prince of Arrow, she says, twisting to look at me over her shoulder. I thought you didn't want to be a prize, I say. She looks away. We can't always have what we want. I need her. I wonder if I can have what I need. We walk in silence until Red Kent steps out of the undergrowth before us. My sword is strapped over his shoulder. King Jorg? He nods. My lady? Take her to Sir Macon, I say. I let her arm go. Kent gestures for Catherine to lead the way along the trail he's been guarding. No kind of harm is to come to her, Kent. Watch Roe and Reich particularly. Tell them you've my permission to cut from them any part that touches her. And move camp. We've left a trail from there to here. I walk away. Where are you going? She asks. I stop and turn, wiping her spit from my cheek. Who found you? What? Who found you after I hit you? I ask. A man was with you when you recovered your senses. She frowns. Her fingers touch the place where the vase shattered. Friar Glen. For the first time, she sees me with her old eyes, clear and green and sharp. Oh. I walk away. Schnick. And a heartbeat later, the box closes again snapped shut by numb fingers. Back on the mountain, knee-deep in snow, my shin hurts. I tripped over a spade. There are men to walk to the mountain with, and then there are men that are the mountain. Gorgoth, though I may not call him brother, was forged from the qualities I lack. Chapter 28, Four Years Earlier There are books in my father's library that say no mountain ever spat lava within a thousand miles of Halradra, before the thousand suns. They tell it that the builders drilled into the molten blood of the earth and drank its power. 
When the sun scorched away all that the builders had wrought, the wounds remained. The earth bled, and Halradra and his sons were born in fire. Gorgoth carried me to where Sindri waited. The sun still shone outside, though I felt it should be dark. I came to my senses halfway down the mountain, bouncing on Gorgoth's broad back. They came one by one, my senses. First the pain, and only the pain. Then after an age, the smell of my own burned flesh the taste of vomit, the sound of my moaning, and finally a blurred vision of Halradra's black slopes. God, just kill me, I whimpered. The tears dripped off my nose and lips, hanging as I was like a sack over Gorgoth's shoulder. It wasn't Gog I was sorry for. It was me. In my defense, having a hand-sized part of your face burn crisp is ridiculously painful. It hurt worse hanging there, bumping with the monster's strides, than when it happened, and I had wanted to die back there in the cave. Kill me, I moaned. Gorgoth stopped. Yes? I thought about it. Christ, jeez you. I needed someone to hate, something to take my mind off the fire still eating into me. Gorgoth waited. He would take me at my word. I thought of my father with his young wife and new son, snug in the tall castle. Maybe later, I said. I remember only snippets until Gorgoth laid me down in the bracken, and Sindri leaned over me. Uskitter! He fell back into the old tongue of the north. That's bad? At least I'm still half pretty. I retched and turned my face to spit sour liquid into the ferns. Let's get him back, Sindri said. He looked around for a moment, opening his mouth, then closed it. Gog's gone, I said. Sindri shook his head and looked down. He drew a breath. Come, we need to get you back. Gorgoth? The monster made no move. Gorgoth's not coming, I said. Gorgoth bowed his head. You can't stay here, Sindri said, alarmed. Ferrakind, Ferrakind is gone too, I said. Each word hurt, almost enough to make them into one scream. No, Sindri's mouth stayed open. We are not friends, Jorg of Ancrath, Gorgoth said, deeper than he'd ever spoken. But we both loved the boy. You loved him first. You named him. That means something. I would have told him what rubbish he was speaking, but my face hurt too much for more words. I will stay in the Heimrift, in the caves. I would have said, I hope the troll stink chokes you, but the price for opening my mouth was too high. I just raised my hand, and Gorgoth raised his, and we parted. Sindri closed his mouth, then opened it again. Ferrakind's gone? I nodded. Can you walk? he asked. I shrugged and lay back in the bracken. Maybe I could, maybe I couldn't. I wasn't going to, and that was the main thing. I'll get help. Horses, he said. Wait here. He held out both hands as if to stop me standing then turned on a heel and sprinted away. I thought the news drove him more than any of my needs. He wanted to be the one to tell it, which was fair enough. I watched the blue sky and prayed for rain. Flies buzzed about me, drawn by the raw pink, the skinless muscle and fat on offer. They wanted to lay their eggs. After a while, I stopped trying to wave them away. I lay a moaning, twisting one way and another, as if there might be a way that helped. From time to time, I fainted, and in the afternoon, a light rain did come, and I prayed it would stop. Each drop burned like acid. In the evening, clouds of mosquitoes rose from wherever it is that mosquitoes hide. The Danelands were thick with the things, probably why the folk are so pale, the blood's been sucked from them. I lay there, letting them eat me, and eventually I heard voices. Makin came, and I wanted to beg for death, but my face hurt too much. It would crack apart if I opened my mouth, all the wounds oozing. Then Reich stepped up, black against the deep blue of the sky, and a little strength flowed into me. It doesn't pay to be weak in front of Reich, and there's something about Reich that makes me forget all about dying, and want to do a bit of killing instead. I knew I brought you along for a reason, Reich. Each word an agony, edged with murder. We stayed five days in Alaric Maladin's hall, not in the guest hall, but in his great hall. They put a chair for me on the dais nearly as grand as the Duke's own, 
and I sat there, wrapped in furs when I shivered, and stripped to the waist when I sweated. Makin and the brothers celebrated with Maladin's people. Women appeared for the first time in any number, carrying the ale in flagons and horns from the storehouse, knives at their hips, eating at the long tables like the men, drinking and laughing almost as loud. One, near as tall as me, blonde as milk, and handsome in a raw-boned way, came up to my chair as I huddled in my furs. "'My thanks, King Jorg," she said. "'I could be making it all up,' I said. Feeling rotten and ugly made me want to sour the day. She grinned. "'The ground hasn't shaken since they brought you back. The sky is clear. What's that?' I asked. She had a clay pot in one hand, filled with black and glistening paste, a twist of hide next to it. A catri gave it to me. A salve for the burns, and a powder to swallow in water, to fight the poison in your blood. I managed half a laugh before the pain stopped me. The old witch, who keeps predicting my failures. There'll be poison in me if I take anything she sends, all right. It's probably how the future turns out, the way she says it will. The woman, girl maybe, laughed. That's not how vulvas are. Besides... My father would take it in poor humour if you died here. It would reflect badly upon him, and Ikatri depends upon his favour. Your father? I asked. Duke Maladin, silly, she said, and walked away, leaving the pot and wrap in my lap. I watched her backside as she went. I thought perhaps I wouldn't die if I could still find time to watch a well-crafted bottom. She looked over her shoulder and caught me watching. I'm Ellen, and she walked on, lost in the crowd and the smoke. I took Ikatri's powder and bit on a leather strap as Makin dabbed the ointment on my burns. He may have a light touch with a sword, but as a healer, he seemed to have ten thumbs. I nearly chewed through the strap, but when he finished, the pain had died to a dull roar. The girl, Ellen, said the Volva depended on her father's favour. I hoped that was so, rather than he on hers. Makin had been digging around, asking my questions in the right corners, doing that thing he does, the one that gets him answers. No one had said it, but if you stacked those answers up and looked at the pile from the right angle, it seemed the ice witch, Skilfar, had a cold finger in every northern pie. I didn't doubt that many a Jarl and Norse lord danced to her tune without ever knowing it. Ikatri, though, Makin said she was a smaller fish. I wondered on that one, sitting alone with my pain in the quiet of night. Alaric of Maladin should mind himself, I thought. Even the smallest fish can choke you. I sat for five days, feeding on oat mush, whilst the brothers gorged on roasted pig, ox heads, fat trout from the lake, sugar apples, and anything else that would be agony for me to chew. Each night, more of the duke's kith and kin arrived to swell the throng. Neighbours, too, men of the Hagenfast. Beards plated with locks from those who died under their axes. True Vikings, tall and fair and cruel, out of Iron Fort and Ports North and a lone fat warrior from the marshes of Sniar Songa, sour with seal grease and not parting with any of the furs that bundled him, despite the hall's heat. I watched Reich win the wrestling contest after ten drunken heats, finally throwing down a Viking with slab-muscled arms and a permanently florid face. I watched Red Kent come first in the throwing of the hand-axe at a wooden target board, and third in the log-splitting. A tall local with pale eyes beat Grumlow into second in the business of knife-throwing. But Grumlow was ever a stabber, and better motivated to hit a target if it breathed. They told me Roe acquitted himself well in the archery. But that took place outside, and I didn't let them move me. Makin lost at everything. But then again, Makin knows that winners may be admired, but they're not liked. The Duke and Sindri sat beside me often enough, asking for the tale of Farrakhine's end but I shook my head and told it with a single word. Wet. The ale flowed, but I drank only water and watched the torch flames more often than I watched the Danes at their feasting and sport. Flames held new colours for me. I thought of Gog, destroyed by fire, and of his little brother, who bore the name I gave him, Magog, for only a few hours. I thought of Gorgoth among the silence of the trolls in the black caverns. I held the copper box in my hand, and wondered if its contents would distract me from my pain. Most of all, though, as boys do when they're hurt, and at fourteen I discovered I was still a boy if the hurt came fierce enough, I thought of my mother, 
I remembered how I twisted and moaned on the slopes after Sindri left me, the agony that held me, and the thirst I had, nearly as large as the pain. I would have fitted well amongst the dying at Maberton, amongst the wounded that I had watched with a smile, coiled about their hurts, calling for water. And when pain bites, men bargain. Boys, too. We twist and turn, we plead and beg, we offer our tormentor what he wants, so that the hurting will stop. And when there is no torturer to placate, no hooded man with hot irons and tongs, just a burn you can't escape, we bargain with God, or ourselves, depending on the size of our egos. I made mock of the dying at Maberton, and now their ghosts watched me burn. Take the pain, I said, and I will be a good man. Or if not that, a better man. We all become weasels with enough hurt on us. But I think a small part of it was more than that. A small part was that terrible two-edged sword called experience, cutting away at the cruel child I was, carving out whatever man might be yet to come. I promised a better one, though I have been known to lie. We were bound for Wenith on the horse coast that day, when Maberton burned. Wenith, where my grandfather sits upon his throne, in a high castle overlooking the sea. Or so my mother told me, for I had never seen it. Corian came from the horse coast. Perhaps he had aimed me there, a weapon to settle some old score for him. In any event, in Duke Maladon's hall, in the quiet hours before dawn, when the torches failed and the lamps gutted out, amid snoring Norsemen slumped over their tables, my thoughts turned once more to Wenith. I had friends in the north now, but to win this hundred war of ours, of mine, I might need some family support. Age set its hand on Brother Roe, and left him forever fifty, not wanting to touch him a second time. Grey, grizzled, lean, grisly, mean. That pale-eyed old man will bend and twist, but never break. He'll hold where the better man would fail beneath his load. The shortest of our number, rank and filthy, seemed with forgotten scars, often overlooked by men who had scant time to reflect on their mistake. Chapter 29 Four Years Earlier On the long journey south, I questioned the motivation for my diversion more than once. More than a hundred times, truth be told. The fact of the matter was that I hadn't found what I needed yet. I didn't know what I needed, but I knew it wasn't in the haunt. My old tutor Lundist once said that if you don't know where to look for something, just start looking where you are. For a clever man, he could be very stupid. I planned to look everywhere. We rode out on the sixth day. I sat in Brath's saddle, stiff in every muscle, my face aching and weeping. You're still sick, Makin said beside me. I'm sicker of sitting in that chair, watching you gorge yourself, as if your only ambition were to be spherical, I said. The duke came to the doors of his hall, with a hundred and more of his warriors to see us off. Sindri stood at his right hand, Ellen at his left. Alaric led them in a chair. Three times they roared and shook their axes overhead. They were a scary enough bunch saying farewell to friends. I didn't fancy the chances of any they deemed to be enemies. The duke left his men to come to my side. You worked a magic here, Jorg. It will not be forgotten. I nodded. Leave the Heimrift in peace, Duke, I said. Halradra and his sons are sleeping. No need to go poking them. And you have a friend up there. He smiled. He's no friend of mine, I said. Part of me wished he was, though. I liked Gorgoth. Unfortunately, he was a good judge of men. Good travels? Sindri came to stand beside his father, grinning as ever. Come back to us in the winter, King Jorg. Ellen joined them. You wouldn't want to see this ugly face again. I watched her pale eyes. A man's scars tell his story. Yours is a story I like to read, she said. I had to grin at that, though it hurt me. Ha! And I wheeled breath to lead my brothers south. Back on the road, and with regular applications of Ikatri's black ointment, my face began to heal, the raw flesh congealing to an ugly mass of scar tissue. From the right, you got handsome Jorgi Ankrath. From the left, something monstrous. My true nature showing through, some might say. The pain eased, replaced by an unpleasant tightness and a deeper burning around the bones. At last I could bear to eat. Now all the fine servings from the Duke's table were trailing farther and farther behind us. I discovered that I had an awful hunger about me. And that's the thing about the road. 
out on a horse, trotting the ways of empire day after day, with nothing to eat but what you can carry or steal. You discover that everything tastes good when your stomach is empty. If you look at a moldy piece of cheese and your mouth doesn't water, you're just not proper hungry. In the haunt, the cooks would honey glaze venison and garnish it with baked rosemary sprinkled dormice, just to tempt my palate. After days in the saddle, I find that in order for food to tempt me, it must be either hot or cold, and preferably, though not essentially, if it is animal, that it should not be moving and should once have possessed a backbone. Around the fire at camp on that first evening, we made a subdued huddle, somehow more reduced by the absence of our smallest companion than by that of our largest. I stared at the flames and imagined a sympathetic tingling in the bones of my jaw, even under the deadening effect of the ointment. I miss the little fella, Grumlow surprised me. Oi, Sim spat. Red Kent looked up from the polishing of his axe. Did he give a good account of himself, Jorg? He saved me and Gorgoth both, I said, and he finished the fire mage before he died. Sounds about right, Rose said. He were a godless bastard, that one. But he had a fire in him. God did he. Makin, I said. He looked up, the flames reflected in his eyes. Since Codin is at home, I paused then, realizing that I'd called the haunt home for the first time. Since Codin is at home, and the Nuban isn't with us. Yes, he said. I'm saying, if I set on a path that's maybe a little too harsh, just let me know, all right? He pursed those two fleshy lips of his, then sucked air in through his teeth. I'll try, he said. He'd been trying all these years. I knew that. But now I gave him permission. For a week we skirted villages, circled towns, and picked our way through the soft edges of the kingdoms we'd passed on our journey north. We came to the settlement of Rye, too big to be a village, too recent and too random to be a town. On our trip out, we'd purchased provisions there, and with our saddlebags flapping empty, we rode in to resupply. Paying for goods still feels odd to me, but it's a good habit to get into when you've got the coin to spare. Of course, you should steal every now and then, take something by force just for the wickedness of it, or how else will you keep your hand in the game? But aside from that, paying is recommended, especially if you're a king with a pocket full of gold. The main square in Rye isn't square, and it's only just about main, as there are other markets and clearings in Rye almost as large. Reich had loaded the last sack of oats onto that great cart horse of his, and Makin was trying to strap his saddlebag over four gutted hairs in their fur when the crowd flowing around us seemed to part like the Red Sea for an old man. I had been leaning against Brath, feeling rather faint. Summer had decided to give us a preview, and the sun came beating down out of a faded sky. My face ached like a bastard, and a fever had got its claws into me. Prince of Thorns! the old fellow cried as he homed in on me, loud enough to turn heads. That'd be king, if it's anything, I muttered. And if there's a Thorns on the map, then I must have missed it. He stopped about a yard in front of me and drew himself up tall. A skinny fellow, dried like a prune, with white hair fluffing at the sides of a bald head. His eyes were milky, though not like cataracts, but somehow pearly with a hint of rainbows. Prince of Thorns! Louder this time. People started to close in. Go away! I used my quiet voice, the one that recommends you listen. The Gilden Gate will open for the Prince of Arrow! Something electric crackled in the air around us. The white fluff stood out from the sides of his head. You can only... There's an art to the quick drawing of a sword, providing the scabbard strap is undone. And I always keep mine so, so you can propel the whole blade several feet into the air just by hooking a hand loosely under one side of the crossguard and literally throwing it upward. With good timing and a quick turn of the body, you can snatch the hilt at the apex of the throw, and as the sword falls, you can turn that momentum into a sudden thrust into whatever is beside you. I looked back over my shoulder. The man's eyes still had their milky sheen, but he'd stopped prophesying on me. By stepping away, I drew the blade from his chest. He looked down at the scarlet wound, but, oddly, did not fall. I waited a moment, then another. The crowd kept their silence, and the old man kept standing, making a close study of the blood pumping down his stomach. Hey, I said. He looked up at that, which helped. His chin had been in the way. 
I took his head with one clean blow. I'm not one to boast, but it's not easy to decapitate a man in one swing. I've seen expert axemen take three blows to do it at an execution when their victim's neck is laid out for them on a block. The seer had enough grace to let his body topple after his head landed by his feet. He kept looking at me, though, with those pearly eyes. There's no magic in it. A severed head can watch you for close on a minute, if you let it. But they say it's bad luck to be the last thing it sees. I picked the head up by its tufts of hair and held it facing me at eye level. Seriously? You can tell me what I am and am not going to sit on in years to come? And you didn't see that one coming? I kept my voice loud for the crowd. This fake has been living off your misery and the misery of folk like you for years. And in a quiet voice, just for the seer and any who watched me through his eyes, for all those who watched this moment across the span of years before I was born, I will make my own future. Being dead doesn't make you right. Everybody dies. The lips smiled. They writhed. Dead king, they said, without sound. And where I touched him, my skin crawled, as if a spider unfolded itself in my palm. I dropped the head and kicked it into the crowd. I say kicked, but in truth it's a bad idea to kick a head. I learned that years ago, a lesson that cost me two broken toes. What you want to do is shove the head with the side of your foot, like you're throwing it. It's going to roll anyhow, so you don't need that much force. See, the thing about severed heads is the owner no longer has any interest in minimizing the force of the blow or any ability to do so for that matter. When you kick somebody in the head, as you do from time to time, they tend to be actively trying to move themselves out of the way, and the contact is lessened. A severed head is a dead weight, even if it's watching you, and that exhausts my insights into the kicking of severed heads. Admittedly, it's more than most people have to offer on the subject, but there were Mayans who knew a lot more than I do. That, of course, is a whole different ball game. Macon finished with his straps and stepped beside me. That was probably too harsh, he said. You did ask me to point things out. Fuck off, I said. I waved to the brothers. Let's ride. For close on a hundred miles, we retraced our path along the North Way, down through the duchies of Parquot and Bavar, where most travellers are welcome, so long as they don't plan to stay, and even our sort are tolerated, so long as we don't get off our horses. The town of Hanver greeted us with bunting, among those peaceful huddles of thatched cottages that I had remarked upon whilst travelling north, Hanver lay equally untouched and unspoiled, a place not visited by war, and cradled amidst idyllic farmland divided into tiny fertile fields. Looks like a holy day, Kent stood in his stirrups to see. For all that he was a dark and deadly bastard, Kent had himself a pious nature, the good kind of pious, or at least the better kind. Gah! Wright liked his celebrations louder, more wild, and more likely to end in a riot. There'll be corals, Sim said, ever the music lover. And so without much more than a nod toward the fact I was king of Renar, and that none of them were much more than scabby peasants at the end of it all, the brothers led me into Hanver. We rode in down the main street, through the crowd, the locals with scrubbed faces sporting their best rags, the children waving ribbon sticks, some clutching sugar apples, kept sweet over winter. The brothers set off on separate ways, Sim to the church, Grumlow to the smithy, Reich handing his reins to a boy outside the first tavern. Roe, more particular, chose the second tavern, and Kent veered off to a stables to get an expert eye on Hellex's front right foreleg. Looks like there'll be more than corals. Makin nodded ahead to the main square. A wooden platform had been erected, fresh timbers still weeping. A wide stage, a gallows frame, and three strangling cords dangling in the breeze. We tied up at the public tether, and Makin flicked the watchboy a copper double. Church execution, Makin said. A white flag fluttered at the far corner of the platform. The holy cross and cup inked onto the linen. Hmm. I had little enough enthusiasm for matters ecumenical in the tall castle. On the road, the church spread Roma's poisons without moderation. And that perhaps is the only time I've considered my father to be a moderating influence. We stood with the others in the sunshine, snagging skewers of roast mutton from a passing cellar. An ale boy sold us arak in pewter cups, a dark and bitter local brew, stronger than wine. He waited for us to throw it back, then went on his way with his cups returned. I may not have any time for the church, but why miss a good execution? 
Once, years back, we'd watched them hang Brother Merrin, and Roe had said, "'A good execution don't need a good reason,' which is true enough. We heard the singing first, four choir boys, probably none of them cut, not in a wattle and daub town like Hanver. Nothing to see to start with, save a silver cross up high on a staff. Then the crowd parting, and the boys in white frocks, voices soaring. I saw Sim way back, mouthing the words, though he didn't know the Latin, just the sounds of it. The priests then, two black crows, with the holy purple showing at their breast, swinging censers. Blunt-faced, alike as brothers, no older than Macon. Following, drawn on a cart and bound at hand and foot, a mother and two daughters. Ten, twelve, hard to say, white with terror. The senior priest brought up the rear, purple silks showing in diamonds through the black of his cassock. A stern man, handsome enough, silver hair in a widow's peak, lending him gravitas. I need a decent ale, Makin spat. That Arrax left a sour taste. It might be that a good execution doesn't need a good reason, but it seemed to me that no execution the church conducted could be called good. I'd held Father Gomst in contempt most of my life, as much for the lies he told as for his weakness. That night of thorns and rain had shown his lies, clear as if lightning found them in a dark room. But they would have surfaced in time either way. In fairness, though, Gomp's brand of feeble optimism and talk of love had little of the Roma doctrine in it. Father wouldn't let the Pope's hand inside his castle. There were jeers among the crowd as the woman and her girls were manhandled onto the platform, though plenty kept silent, faces held tight and joyless. Do you know what the Church of Roma has in common with the church that came before it? The faith the popes held in the time of the builders, in the centuries before the builders, I said. Makin shook his head. No. Nobody else does either, I said. Pope Anticus took in every Bible that survived the thousand suns in deep vaults, all the books of doctrine, all the Vatican records, all of it. Could have burned the lot, could be following every letter and footnote. The scholars can tell you nothing except that you're not allowed to know. The priest up on the platform had found his stride, patrolling the edge before the crowd and bellowing about wickedness and witchcraft. White flecks of spit caught the sunlight as they arced over the heads of the peasants closest in. "'I never took you for a theologian, Jorg,' Makin turned away. "'Come in for that ale?' I watched the executioners wrestle the first girl to the post. Not to be a straight hanging then, a little cutting first, perhaps. She put up a struggle for a small thing. You could see the strain in the man's arms. Too early in the day for blood, Sir Macon. I goaded him, but the jibe was aimed inward at whatever was putting that same sour taste in my own mouth. Macon growled. Call me soft, but I've no stomach for it. Not for children. I don't think he'd ever a stomach for it. Macon. Not for children, not for men. Though he'd let himself be carried along in the darkness of the Brotherhood, back in those early years, when he counted himself all that stood to defend me. But they're witches, another taunt meant for myself. They probably were witches. I'd met witches of many flavours, and more magic seemed to leak into the world with each passing year, finding its way through this person or that, as if they were cracks in the fabric of our days. I'm sure the priest would have had me up on his platform too, if he knew I could talk to dead men, if he saw the black veins running corrupt across my chest, if he had had the balls to take me. They might be witches, but just as likely the woman had dared to disagree or invent. Rumor hated nothing like it hated invention. A priest might order you burned for making free with some enchantment, but find the trick of a better steel, or rediscover some alchemy of the builders, and they would have an expert spend all week killing you. Makin spat again, shook his head, walked away. A judgment on me, on his damn king. I threw off the anger. It was an escape. I could hide in it, but it wasn't Makin that had made me angry. Let people pray to God, it's nothing to me. Some good may even come of it, if goodness is something that matters to you. Trap him in churches, if you must, and lament him there. But Roma, Roma is a weapon used against us, a poison flavoured sweet and given to hungry men. Up on the platform, the girl screamed as they stripped her. A man approached, holding a cane, all set with metal teeth, glittering and pretty. It's the bishop, isn't it? I found Kent beside me, his hand on mine as somehow it worked to draw steel without asking my permission. With Kent's help, I kept my sword in its scabbard. Murillo, I agreed. There were few men who would dare mention Bishop Murillo to me. 
I regret the nails still. I had hammered them slow enough into his head. But even so, it was too quick an escape for him. A black day, Kent said, though I couldn't tell if he meant then or now. Pious or not, he had never once chided me for the Pope's nephew. I nodded. I had better reasons to hate the Church of Roma than for Murillo. But the bishop had put the edge on it. How's Hellux? I asked. She'll be fine. They put a poultice on her leg, Kent said. The girl howled like the damned, though all they'd done was show her the cane. Fit to ride, is she? I asked. Kent gave me a look. Jorg! We're built of contradictions, all of us. It's those opposing forces that give us strength. Like an arch, each block pressing the next. Give me a man whose parts are all aligned in agreement, and I'll show you madness. We walk a narrow path, insanity to each side. A man without contradictions to balance him will soon veer off. Let's get a better view. I moved through the crowd. Most got out of my way. Some I had to hurt. Kent stayed close behind. Makin walked away because his contradictions allowed him a compromise. Mine are not so gentle. I'll say it was hate that put me on that platform. Hate for Roma, for its doctrine of ignorance, for the corruption of its highest officials. Perhaps for the fact it wasn't my idea. My brothers would tell you the decision owed as much to contrariness to my taking offence at the idea that the only things holding those prisoners, save the binding cords, were fear of the priest and the baying of the mob. Certainly my actions owed nothing to three months on the throne of Renar. When they set that crown on my head, technically, I accepted responsibility for the people of my kingdom. But the crown weighed more than the responsibility ever did, and I even took the crown off before too long. Nobody tried to stop me clambering on stage. I swear there were even a few helping shoves. I took the cane from the executioner's hand as he drew back for his first swing. Sharp little twists of iron studded its length. The girl, naked against the post, watched that cane as if it were the only thing in the world. She looked too clean for a peasant. Perhaps the priests had washed her so the marks of her torture wouldn't be lost in the dirt. Red Slaughter was an option.